Sections 91 through 110 of The Bondage of the Will by Martin Luther. Translated by Henry Cole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Discussion. Second part continued. Section 91. But let us also look into Paul, who takes up this passage of Moses, Romans 9. How miserably is the diatribe tortured with that part of the Scripture! Lest it should lose its hold of free will, it puts on every shape. At one time it says that there is a necessity of the consequence, but not a necessity of the thing consequent. At another, that there is an ordinary will, or will of the sign, which may be resisted, and a will of decree, which cannot be resisted. At another, that those passages adduced from Paul do not contend for, do not speak about, the salvation of man. In one place it says that the prescience of God does impose necessity, in another that it does not impose necessity. Again, in another place it asserts that grace prevents the will that it might will, and then attends it as it proceeds, and brings it to a happy issue. Here it states that the first cause does all things itself, and directly afterwards that it acts by second causes, remaining itself inactive. By these and the like sportings with words, it does nothing but fill up its time, and at the same time obscure the subject point from our sight, drawing us aside to something else. So stupid and doltish does it imagine us to be, that it thinks we feel no more interested in the cause than it feels itself. Or, as little children, when fearing the rod or at play, cover their eyes with their hands, and think that as they see nobody themselves, nobody sees them. So the diatribe, not being able to endure the brightness, nay, the lightning of the most clear scriptures, pretending by every kind of maneuver that it does not see, which is in truth the case, wishes to persuade us that our eyes are also so covered that we cannot see. But all these maneuvers are but evidences of a convicted mind rashly struggling against invincible truth. That figment about the necessity of the consequence, but not the necessity of the thing consequent, has been before refuted. Let, then, Erasmus invent and invent again, cavil and cavil again, as much as he will. If God foreknew that Judas would be a traitor, Judas became a traitor of necessity. Nor was it in the power of Judas, nor of any other creature, to alter it, or to change that will, though he did what he did willingly, not by compulsion. For that willing of his was his own work, which God, by the motion of his omnipotence, moved on into action, as he does everything else. God does not lie, nor is he deceived. This is a truth evident and invincible. There are no obscure or ambiguous words here, even though all the most learned men of all ages should be so blinded as to think and say to the contrary. How much soever, therefore, you may turn your back upon it, yet the convicted conscience of yourself and all men is compelled to confess that if God be not deceived in that which he foreknows, that which he foreknows must of necessity take place. If it were not so, who could believe his promises? Who would fear his threatenings? If what he promised or threatened did not of necessity take place? Or how could he promise or threaten if his prescience could be deceived or hindered by our mutability? This all-clear light of certain truth manifestly stops the mouths of all, puts an end to all questions, and forever settles the victory over all evasive subtleties. We know, indeed, that the prescience of man is fallible. We know that an eclipse does not therefore take place because it is foreknown, but that it is therefore foreknown because it is to take place. But what have we to do with this prescience? We are disputing about the prescience of God. And if you do not ascribe to this the necessity of the consequent foreknown, you take away faith and the fear of God. You destroy the force of all the divine promises and threatenings, and thus deny divinity itself. But, however, the diatribe itself, after having held out for a long time and tried all things, and being pressed hard by the force of the truth, at last confesses my sentiment, saying, Section 92. The question concerning the will and predestination of God is somewhat difficult. For God wills those same things which he foreknows, and this is the substance of what Paul subjoins, Who hath resisted his will, if he have mercy on whom he will, and harden whom he will? For if there were a king, who could effect whatever he chose, and no one could resist him, he would be said to do whatsoever he willed. So the will of God, as it is the principal cause of all things which take place, seems to impose a necessity on our will. 
thus the diatribe. At last, then, I give thanks to God for a sound sentence in the diatribe. Where, now, then, is free will? But again this slippery eel is twisted aside in a moment, saying, But Paul does not explain this point, he only rebukes the disputer. Who art thou, O man, that repliest against God? Romans 9.20 O notable evasion! Is this the way to handle the Holy Scriptures? thus to make a declaration upon one's own authority, and out of one's own brain, without a scripture, without a miracle, nay, to corrupt the most clear words of God? What, does not Paul explain that point? What does he then? He only rebukes the disputer, says the diatribe. And is not that rebuke the most complete explanation? For what was inquired into by that question concerning the will of God? Was it not this, whether or not it imposed a necessity on our will? Paul, then, answers that it is thus. He will have mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. It is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Romans 9, 15-16 and 18. Moreover, not content with this explanation, he introduces those who murmur against this explanation in their defense of free will, and prate that there is no merit allowed, that we are damned when the fault is not our own, and the like, and stops their murmuring and indignation, saying, Thou wilt say then, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Romans 9, 19. Do you not see that this is addressed to those who, hearing that the will of God imposes necessity on us, say, Why doth he yet find fault? That is, why does God thus insist, thus urge, thus exact, thus find fault? Why does he accuse? Why does he reprove, as though we men could do what he requires if we would? He has no just cause for thus finding fault. Let him rather accuse his own will. Let him find fault with that. Let him press his requirement upon that. For who hath resisted his will? Who can obtain mercy if he wills not? Who can become softened if he wills to harden? It is not in our power to change his will, much less resist it where he wills us to be hardened. By that will, therefore, we are compelled to be hardened, whether we will or no. If Paul had not explained this question, and had not stated to a certainty that necessity is imposed on us by the prescience of God, what need was there for his introducing the murmurs and complainers, saying that his will cannot be resisted? For who would have murmured or been indignant, if he had not found necessity to be stated. Paul's words are not ambiguous where he speaks of resisting the will of God. Is there anything ambiguous in what resisting is, or what his will is? Is it at all ambiguous concerning what he is speaking when he speaks concerning the will of God? Let the myriads of the most approved doctors be blind. Let them pretend, if they will, that the scriptures are not quite clear, and that they tremble at a difficult question. We have words the most clear which plainly speak thus, He will have mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. And also, Thou wilt say to me then, Why doth he yet complain? For who hath resisted his will? The question, therefore, is not difficult. Nay, nothing can be more plain to common sense than that this conclusion is certain, stable, and true. If it be pre-established from the Scriptures that God neither errs nor is deceived, then whatever God foreknows must of necessity take place. It would be a difficult question indeed, nay, an impossibility, I confess, if you should attempt to establish both the prescience of God and the free will of man. For what could be more difficult, nay, a greater impossibility, than to attempt to prove that contradictions do not clash, or that a number may at the same time be both nine and ten? There is no difficulty on our side of the question, but it is sought for and introduced just as ambiguity and obscurity are sought for and violently introduced into the Scriptures. The Apostle, therefore, restrains the impious who are offended at these most clear words by letting them know that the divine will is accomplished by necessity in us, and by letting them know also that it is defined to a certainty that they have nothing of liberty or free will left but that all things depend upon the will of God alone. But he restrains them in this way, by commanding them to be silent, and to revere the majesty of the divine power and will, over which we have no control, 
but which has over us a full control to do whatever it will. And yet it does us no injury, seeing that it is not indebted to us, it never received anything from us, it never promised us anything but what itself pleased and willed. Section 93. This, therefore, is not the place, this is not the time for adoring those Corican caverns, but for admiring the true majesty in its to-be-feared, wonderful, and incomprehensible judgments, and saying, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Matthew 6.10. Whereas, we are nowhere more irreverent and rash than in trespassing and arguing upon these very inscrutable mysteries and judgments. And while we are pretending to a great reverence in searching the holy scriptures, those which God has commanded to be searched we search not, but those which he has forbidden us to search into, those we search into, and none other, and that with an unceasing temerity, not to say blasphemy. For is it not searching with temerity, when we attempt to make the all-free prescience of God to harmonize with our freedom, prepare to derogate prescience from God rather than lose our own liberty? Is it not temerity, when he imposes necessity upon us, to say with murmurings and blasphemies, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Romans 9.19 Where is the God by nature most merciful? Where is he who willeth not the death of a sinner? Has he then created us for this very purpose only, that he might delight himself in the torments of men? And many things of the same kind, which will be howled forth by the damned in hell to all eternity. But, however, natural reason herself is compelled to confess that the living and true God must be such an one as, by his own liberty, to impose necessity on us. For he must be a ridiculous God, or idol, rather, who did not to a certainty foreknow the future or was liable to be deceived in events, when even the Gentiles ascribed to their gods fate inevitable. And he would be equally ridiculous if he could not do and did not all things, or if anything could be done without him. If then the prescience and omnipotence of God be granted, it naturally follows, as an irrefragable consequence, that we neither were made by ourselves, nor live by ourselves, nor do anything by ourselves, but by his omnipotence. And since he at the first foreknew that we should be such, and since he has made us such, and moves and rules over us as such, how, I ask, can it be pretended that there is any liberty in us to do in any respect otherwise than he at first foreknew, and now proceeds in action? Wherefore the prescience and omnipotence of God are diametrically opposite to our free will, and it must be that either God is deceived in his prescience and errs in his action, which is impossible, or we act and are acted upon according to his prescience and action. But by the omnipotence of God I mean not that power by which he does not many things that he could do, but that actual power by which he powerfully works all in all, in which sense the scripture calls him omnipotent. This omnipotence and prescience of God, I say, utterly abolishes the doctrine of free will. No pretext can here be framed about the obscurity of the scripture, or the difficulty of the subject point. The words are most clear, and known to every schoolboy, and the point is plain and easy, and stands proved by judgment of common sense, so that the series of ages, of times, or of persons, either writing or teaching to the contrary, be it as great as it may, amounts to nothing at all. Section 94. But it is this that seems to give greatest offense to common sense or natural reason that the God who is set forth as being so full of mercy and goodness, should of his mere will leave men, harden them, and damn them, as though he delighted in the sins and in the great and eternal torments of the miserable. To think thus of God seems iniquitous, cruel, intolerable. And it is this that has given offence to so many and great men of so many ages. And who would not be offended? I myself have been offended more than once, even unto the deepest abyss of desperation nay, so far as even to wish that I had never been born a man, that is, before I was brought to know how healthful that desperation was, and how near it was unto grace. Here it is, that there has been so much toiling and labouring to excuse the goodness of God, and to accuse the will of man. Here it is, that distinctions have been invented between the ordinary will of God and the absolute will of God, between the necessity of the consequence and the necessity of the thing consequent and many other inventions of the same kind. 
by which nothing has ever been effected but an imposition upon the unlearned, by vanities of words, and by oppositions of science falsely so called. For after all, a conscious conviction has been left deeply rooted in the heart, both of the learned and the unlearned, if ever they have come to an experience of these things. And the knowledge that our necessity is a consequence that must follow upon the belief of the prescience and omnipotence of God. And even natural reason herself, who is so offended at this necessity, and who invents so many contrivances to take it out of the way, is compelled to grant it upon her own conviction from her own judgment, even though there were no scriptures at all. For all men find these sentiments written in their hearts, and they acknowledge and approve them, though against their will, whenever they hear them treated on. First, that God is omnipotent, not only in power, but in action, as I said before, and that, if it were not so, he would be a ridiculous God. And next, that he knows and foreknows all things, and neither can err nor be deceived. These two points, then, being granted by the hearts and minds of all, they are at once compelled from an inevitable consequence to admit that we are not made from our own will, but from necessity, and moreover, that we do not what we will according to the law of free will, but as God foreknew and proceeds in action, according to His infallible and immutable counsel and power. Wherefore it is found written alike in the hearts of all men, that there is no such thing as free will, though that writing be obscured by so many contending disputations, and by the great authority of so many men who have, through so many ages, taught otherwise. Even as every other law also, which, according to the testimony of Paul, is written in our hearts, is then acknowledged when it is rightly set forth, and then obscured when it is confused by wicked teachers, and drawn aside by other opinions. Section 95. I now return to Paul. If he does not, Romans 9, explain this point, nor clearly state our necessity from the prescience and will of God, what need was there for him to introduce the similitude of the potter, who of the same lump of clay makes one vessel unto honor, and another unto dishonor? Romans 9.21. What need was there for him to observe that the thing formed does not say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? 20. He is there speaking of men, and he compares them to clay, and God to a potter. This similitude, therefore, stands coldly useless, nay, is introduced ridiculously, and in vain, if it be not his sentiment, that we have no liberty whatever. Nay, the whole of the argument of Paul wherein he defends grace is in vain. For the design of the whole epistle is to show that we can do nothing, even when we seem to do well. And he in the same epistle testifies, where he says, that Israel, which followed after righteousness, did not attain unto righteousness, but that the Gentiles, which followed not after it, did attain unto it. Romans 9, 30-31 Concerning which I shall speak more at large hereafter, when I produce my forces. The fact is, the diatribe designedly keeps back the body of Paul's argument and its scope, and comfortably satisfies itself with prating upon a few detached and corrupted terms nor does the exhortation which Paul afterwards gives, Romans 11, at all help the diatribe, where he saith, Thou standest by faith, be not high-minded. 20. Again, and they also, if they shall believe, shall be grafted in, and so forth. 23. For he says nothing there about the ability of man, but brings forth imperative and conditional expressions, and what effect they are intended to produce has been fully shown already. Moreover, Paul there, anticipating the boasters of free will, does not say they can believe, but he saith, God is able to graft them in again. 23. To be brief, the diatribe moves along with so much hesitation, and so lingeringly, in handling these passages of Paul, that its conscience seems to give the lie to all that it writes. For just at the point where it ought to have gone on to the proof, it for the most part stops short with a but of this enough. But I shall not now proceed with this. But this is not my present purpose. But here they would have said so and so, and many evasions of the same kind, and it leaves off the subject just in the middle, so that you are left in uncertainty whether it wished to be understood as speaking on free will, or whether it was only evading the sense of Paul by means of vanities of words. 
and all this is being just in its character, as not having a serious thought upon the cause in which it is engaged. But as for me, I dare not be thus cold, thus always on the tiptoe of policy, or thus move to and fro as a reed shaken by the wind. I must assert with certainty, with constancy, and with ardor, and prove what I assert solidly, appropriately, and fully. Section 96. And now, how excellently does the diatribe preserve liberty in harmony with necessity, where it says, Nor does all necessity exclude free will. For instance, God the Father begets a son of necessity, but yet he begets him willingly and freely, seeing that he is not forced. Am I here, I pray you, disputing about compulsion and force? Have I not said in all my books again and again that my dispute on this subject is about the necessity of immutability? I know that the Father begets willingly, and that Judas willingly betrayed Christ. But I say this willing, in the person of Judas, was decreed to take place from immutability and certainty, if God foreknew it. Or, if men do not yet understand what I mean, I make two necessities, the one a necessity of force, in reference to the act, the other a necessity of immutability, in reference to the time. Let him, therefore, who wishes to hear what I have to say, understand that I here speak of the latter, not of the former. That is, I do not dispute whether Judas became a traitor willingly or unwillingly, but whether or not it was decreed to come to pass that Judas should will to betray Christ at a certain time infallibly predetermined of God. But only listen to what the diatribe says upon this point. With reference to the immutable prescience of God, Judas was of necessity to become a traitor. Nevertheless, Judas had it in his power to change his own will. Dost thou understand, friend diatribe, what thou sayest? To say nothing of that which has been already proved, that the will cannot will anything but evil. How could Judas change his own will if the immutable prescience of God stand granted? Could he change the prescience of God and render it fallible? Here the diatribe gives it up, and, leaving its standard and throwing down its arms, runs from its post and hands over the discussion to the subtleties of the schools concerning the necessity of the consequence and of the thing consequent, pretending that it does not wish to engage in the discussion of points so nice. A step of policy truly, friend diatribe, when you have brought the subject point into the midst of the field, and just when the champion disputant was required, then you show your back, and leave to others the business of answering and defining. But you should have taken this step at the first, and abstain from writing altogether. He who ne'er proved the training field of arms, let him ne'er in the battle's brunt appear. For it never was expected of Erasmus that he should remove that difficulty which lies in God's foreknowing all things, and our nevertheless doing all things by contingency. This difficulty existed in the world long before ever the diatribe saw the light. But yet it was expected that he should make some kind of answer, and give some kind of definition. Whereas he, by using a rhetorical transition, drags away us, knowing nothing of rhetoric, along with himself, as though we were here contending for a thing of thought, and were engaged in quibbling about insignificant niceties, and thus nobly betakes himself out of the midst of the field, bearing the crowns both of the scholar and of the conqueror. But not so, brother. There is no rhetoric of sufficient force to cheat an honest conscience. The voice of conscience is proof against all powers and figures of eloquence. I cannot here suffer a rhetorician to pass on under the cloak of dissimulation. This is not a time for such maneuvering. This is that part of the discussion where matters come to the turning point. Here is the hinge upon which the whole turns. Here, therefore, free will must be completely vanquished or completely triumph. But here you, seeing your danger, nay, the certainty of the victory over free will, pretend that you see nothing but argumentative niceties. Is this to act the part of a faithful theologian? Can you feel a serious interest in your cause, who thus leave your auditors in suspense, and your arguments in a state that confuses and exasperates them, while you, nevertheless, wish to appear to have given honest satisfaction and open explanation? 
This craft and cunning might perhaps be born with in profane subjects, but in a theological subject, where simple and open truth is the object required for the salvation of souls, it is utterly hateful and intolerable. Section 97. The sophists also felt the invincible and insupportable force of this argument, and therefore they invented the necessity of the consequence and of the thing consequent. But to what little purpose this figment is I have shown already. For they do not all the while observe what they are saying, and what conclusions they are admitting against themselves. For if you grant the necessity of the consequence, free will lies vanquished and prostrate, nor does either the necessity or the contingency of the thing consequent profit in anything. What is it to me if free will be not compelled, but do what it does willingly? It is enough for me that you grant that it is of necessity that it does willingly what it does, and that it cannot do otherwise if God foreknew it would be so. If God foreknew either that Judas would be a traitor, or that he would change his willing to be a traitor, whichsoever of the two God foreknew must of necessity take place, or God will be deceived in his prescience and prediction, which is impossible. This is the effect of the necessity of the consequence. That is, if God foreknows a thing, that thing must of necessity take place. That is, there is no such thing as free will. This necessity of the consequence, therefore, is not obscure or ambiguous, so that even if the doctors of all ages were blinded, yet they must admit it, because it is so manifest and plain as to be actually palpable. And as to the necessity of the thing consequent, with which they comfort themselves, that is a mere phantom, and is in diametrical opposition to the necessity of the consequence. For example, the necessity of the consequence is, so to set it forth, God foreknows that Judas will be a traitor. Therefore it will certainly and infallibly come to pass that Judas shall be a traitor. Against this necessity of the consequence you comfort yourself thus. But since Judas can change his willing to betray, Therefore, there is no necessity of the thing consequent. How, I ask you, will these two positions harmonize? Judas is able to will not to betray, and Judas must of necessity will to betray. Do not these two directly contradict and militate against each other? But he will not be compelled, you say, to betray against his will. What is that to the purpose? You were speaking of the necessity of the thing consequent and saying that that need not of necessity follow from the necessity of the consequence. You were not speaking of the compulsive necessity of the thing consequent. The question was concerning the necessity of the thing consequent, and you produce an example concerning the compulsive necessity of the thing consequent. I ask you one thing, and you answer another. But this arises from that yawning sleepiness, under which you do not observe what nothingness that figment amounts to concerning the necessity of the thing consequent. Suffice it to have spoken thus to the former part of this second part, which has been concerning the hardening of Pharaoh, and which involves indeed all the scriptures, and all our forces, and those invincible. Now let us proceed to the remaining part concerning Jacob and Esau, who are spoken of as being not yet born. Romans 9.11 Section 98 This place the diatribe evades by saying that it does not properly pertain to the salvation of man. For God, it says, may will that a man shall be a servant or a poor man, and yet not reject him from eternal salvation. Only observe, I pray you, how many evasions and ways of escape a slippery mind will invent, which would flee from the truth, and yet cannot get away from it after all. Be it so that this passage does not pertain to the salvation of man, to which point I shall speak hereafter. Are we to suppose, then, that Paul, who adduces it, does so for no purpose whatever? Shall we make Paul to be ridiculous, or a vain trifler, in a discussion so serious? But all this breathes nothing but Jerome, who dares to say, in more places than one, with his supercilious brow and a sacrilegious mouth, that those things are made to be a force in Paul, which in their own places are of no force. This is no less than saying that Paul, where he lays the foundation of the Christian doctrine, 
does nothing but corrupt the holy scriptures, and delude believing souls with sentiments hatched out of his own brain, and violently thrust into the scriptures. Is this honoring the Holy Spirit in Paul, that sanctified and elect instrument of God? Thus, when Jerome ought to be read with judgment, and this saying of his to be numbered among those many things which that man impiously wrote, such was his yawning inconsiderateness and his stupidity in understanding the scriptures, the diatribe drags him in without any judgment, and, not thinking it right that his authority should be lessened by any mitigating gloss whatever, takes him as a most certain oracle whereby to judge of and attemper the scriptures. And thus it is, we take the impious sayings of men as rules and guides in the holy scripture, and then wonder that it should become obscure and ambiguous, and that so many fathers should be blind in it, whereas the whole proceeds from this impious and sacrilegious reason. Section 99. Let him then be anathema who shall say that those things which are of no force in their own place are made to be of force in Paul. This, however, is only said, it is not proved and it is said by those who understand neither Paul nor the passages adduced by him, but are deceived by terms, that is, by their own impious interpretations of them. And if it be allowed that this passage, Genesis 25, 21-23, is to be understood in a temporal sense, which is not the true sense, yet it is rightly and effectually adduced by Paul when he proves from it that it was not of the merits of Jacob and Esau, but of him that calleth, that it was said unto Rebekah, The elder shall serve the younger. Romans 9, 11-16 Paul is argumentatively considering whether or not they attained unto that which was said of them by the power or merits of free will, and he proves that they did not, but that Jacob attained unto that unto which Esau attained not solely by the grace of him that calleth and he proves that by the incontrovertible words of the scripture, that is, that they were not yet born, and also that they had done neither good nor evil. This proof contains the weighty sum of his whole subject point, and by this same proof our subject point is settled also. The diatribe, however, having dissemblingly passed over all these particulars with an excellent rhetorical fetch, does not here argue at all upon merit, which nevertheless it undertook to do, and which this subject point of Paul requires, but cavils about temporal bondage, as though that were at all to the purpose. But it is merely that it might not seem to be overthrown by the all-forcible words of Paul. For what had it which it could yelp against Paul in support of free will? What did free will do for Jacob? Or what did it do against Esau, when it was already determined by the prescience and predestination of God, before either of them was born, what should be the portion of each, that is, that the one should serve and the other rule. Thus the rewards were decreed before the workmen wrought or were born. It is to this that the diatribe ought to have answered. Paul contends for this, that neither had done either good or evil, and yet, that by the divine sentence the one was decreed to be servant, the other Lord. The question here is not whether that servitude pertained unto salvation, but from what merit it was imposed on him who had not deserved it. But it is wearisome to contend with these depraved attempts to pervert and evade the Scripture. Section 100 But, however, that Moses does not intend their servitude only, and that Paul is perfectly right in understanding it concerning eternal salvation is manifest from the text itself. And although this is somewhat wide of our present purpose, yet I will not suffer Paul to be contaminated with the calumnies of the sacrilegious. The oracle in Moses is thus, Two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Genesis 25:23. Here, manifestly, are two people distinctly mentioned. The one, though the younger, is received into the grace of God, to the intent that he might overcome the other, not by his own strength indeed, but by a favoring God. For how could the younger overcome the elder unless God were with him? Since, therefore, 
the younger was to be the people of God. It is not only the external rule or servitude which is there spoken of, but all that pertains to the Spirit of God, that is, the blessing, the word, the Spirit, the promise of Christ, and the everlasting kingdom. And this the Scripture more fully confirms afterwards, where it describes Jacob as being blessed, and receiving the promises and the kingdom. All this Paul briefly intimates when he saith, The elder shall serve the younger. And he sends us to Moses, who treats upon the particulars more fully. So that you may say in reply to the sacrilegious sentiment of Jerome and the diatribe, that these passages which Paul adduces have more force in their own place than they have in his epistle. And this is true also not of Paul only, but of all the apostles, who adduce scriptures as testimonies and assertions of their own sentiments. But it would be ridiculous to adduce that as a testimony which testifies nothing, and does not make at all to the purpose. And even if there were some among the philosophers so ridiculous as to prove that which was unknown by that which was less known still, or by that which was totally irrelevant to the subject, with what face can we attribute such kind of proceeding to the greatest champions and authors of the Christian doctrines, especially since they teach those things which are the essential articles of faith, and on which the salvation of souls depends? But such a face becomes those who, in the Holy Scriptures, feel no serious interest whatever. Section 101 And with respect to that of Malachi, which Paul annexes, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated, Malachi 1, 2 through 3, that the diatribe perverts by a threefold contrivance. The first is, if, it says, you stick to the letter, God does not love as we love, nor does he hate any one because passions of this kind do not pertain unto God. What do I hear? Are we now inquiring whether or not God loves and hates, and not, rather, why he loves and hates? Our inquiry is from what merit it is in us that he loves or hates. We know well enough that God does not love or hate as we do, because we love and hate mutably, but he loves and hates from an eternal and immutable nature and hence it is that accidents and passions do not pertain unto him. And it is this very state of the truth that of necessity proves free will to be nothing at all, seeing that the love and hatred of God towards men is immutable and eternal, existing not only before there was any merit or work of free will, but before the worlds were made, and that all things take place in us from necessity, accordingly as he loved or loved not from all eternity so that not the love of God only, but even the manner of his love, imposes on us necessity. Here, then, it may be seen how much its invented ways of escape profit the diatribe, for the more it attempts to get away from the truth, the more it runs upon it, with so little success does it fight against it. But be it so that your trope stands good, that the love of God is the effect of love, and the hatred of God is the effect of hatred, does then that effect take place without and independent of the will of God? Will you here say also that God does not will as we do, and that the passion of willing does not pertain to him? If then those effects take place, they do not take place but according to the will of God. Hence, therefore, what God wills, that he loves and hates. Now then, Tell me, for what merit did God love Jacob and hate Esau before they wrought or were born? Wherefore it stands manifest that Paul most rightly adduces Malachi in support of the passage from Moses. That is, that God therefore called Jacob before he was born, because he loved him. But that he was not first loved by Jacob, nor moved to love him from any merit in him. So that, in the cases of Jacob and Esau, it is shown what ability there is in our free will. Section 102. The second contrivance is this, that Malachi does not seem to speak of that hatred by which we are damned to all eternity, but of temporal affliction, seeing that those are reproved who wished to destroy Edom. This again is advanced in contempt of Paul, as though he had done violence to the Scriptures. Thus, we hold in no reverence whatever the majesty of the Holy Spirit, 
and only aim at establishing our own sentiments. But let us bear with this contempt for a moment, and see what it affects. Malachi, then, speaks of temporal affliction. And what if he do? What is that to your purpose? Paul proves out of Malachi that the affliction was laid on Esau without any desert, by the hatred of God only. And this he does, that he might thence conclude, that there is no such thing as free will. This is the point that makes against you, and it is to this you ought to have answered. I am arguing about merit, and you are all the while talking about reward, and yet you so talk about it as not to evade that which you wish to evade. Nay, in your very talking about reward you acknowledge merit, and yet pretend you do not see it. Tell me, then, what moved God to love Jacob and to hate Esau even before they were born? But, however, the assertion that Malachi is speaking of temporal affliction only is false. Nor is he speaking of the destroying of Edom. You entirely pervert the sense of the prophet by this contrivance. The prophet shows what he means in words the most clear. He upbraids the Israelites with ingratitude, because, after God had loved them, they did not in return either love him as their father or fear him as their Lord. Malachi 1, six. That God had loved them he proves both by the scriptures and by facts, namely in this, that although Jacob and Esau were brothers, as Moses records, Genesis 25, 21-28, yet he loved Jacob and chose him before he was born, as we have heard from Paul already. But that he so hated Esau that he removed away his dwelling into the desert. That, moreover, he so continued and pursued that hatred, that when he brought back Jacob from captivity and restored him, he will not suffer the Edomites to be restored. And that, even if they at any time said they wished to build, he threatened them with destruction. If this be not the plain meaning of the prophet's text, let the whole world prove me a liar. Therefore, the temerity of the Edomites is not here reproved, but, as I said before, the ingratitude of the sons of Jacob, who do not see what God has done for them and against their brethren the Edomites, and for no other reason than because he hated the one and loved the other. How then will your assertion stand good, that the prophet is here speaking of temporal affliction, when he testifies in the plainest words that he is speaking of the two people as proceeding from the two patriarchs, the one received to be a people, and saved, and the other left, and at last destroyed. To be received as a people, and not to be received as a people, does not pertain to temporal good and evil only, but unto all things. For our God is not the God of temporal things only, but of all things. Nor does God will to be thy God, so as to be worshipped with one shoulder, or with a lame foot, but with all thy might, and with all thy heart that he may be thy God as well here as hereafter, in all things, times, and works. Section 103. The third contrivance is that, according to the trope interpretation of the passage, God neither loves all the Gentiles nor hates all the Jews, but out of each people some, and that, by this use of the trope, the scripture testimony in question does not at all go to prove necessity, but to beat down the arrogance of the Jews. The diatribe, having opened this way of escape, then comes to this, that God is said to hate men before they are born, because he foreknows that they will do that which will merit hatred, and that thus the hatred and love of God do not at all militate against free will. And at last it draws this conclusion, that the Jews were cut off from the olive tree on account of the merit of unbelief, and the Gentiles grafted in on account of the merit of faith according to the authority of Paul. And that a trope is held out to those who are cut off of being grafted in again, and a warning given to those who are grafted in that they fall not off. May I perish if the diatribe itself knows what it is talking about. But perhaps this is also a rhetorical fetch, which teaches you, when any danger seems to be at hand, always to render your sense obscure, lest you should be taken in your own words. I, for my part, can see no place whatever in this passage for those trope interpretations, of which the diatribe dreams, but which it cannot establish by proof. 
Therefore, it is no wonder that this testimony does not make against it in the trope interpreted sense, because it has no such sense. Moreover, we are not disputing about cutting off and grafting in, of which Paul here speaks in his exhortations. I know that men are grafted in by faith and cut off by unbelief, and that they are to be exhorted to believe that they be not cut off. But it does not follow, nor is it proved from this, that they can believe or fall away by the power of free will, which is now the point in question. We are not disputing about who are the believing and who are not, who are Jews and who are Gentiles, and what is the consequence of believing and falling away. That pertains to exhortation. Our point in dispute is by what merit or work they attain unto that faith by which they are grafted in, or unto that unbelief by which they are cut off. This is the point that belongs to you as the teacher of free will. And pray, describe to me this merit. Paul teaches us that this comes to them by no work of theirs, but only according to the love or the hatred of God. And when it is come to them, he exhorts them to persevere, that they be not cut off. But this exhortation does not prove what we can do, but what we ought to do. I am compelled thus to hedge in my adversary with many words, lest he should slip away and leave the subject point, and take up anything but that. And in fact, to hold him thus to the point is to vanquish him. For all that he aims at is to slide away from the point, withdraw himself out of sight, and take up anything but that which he first laid down as his subject design. Section 104. The next passage which the diatribe takes up is that of Isaiah 45, 9. Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth it, What makest thou? And that of Jeremiah 18.6. Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand. Here the diatribe says again, These passages are made to have more force in Paul than they have in the place of the prophets from which they are taken. Because in the prophets they speak of temporal affliction, but Paul uses them with reference to eternal election and reprobation. So that here again, temerity or ignorance in Paul is insinuated. But before we see how the diatribe proves that neither of these passages excludes free will, I will make this remark, that Paul does not appear to have taken this passage out of the Scriptures, nor does the diatribe prove that he has. For Paul usually mentions the name of his author, or declares that he has taken a certain part from the Scriptures, whereas here he does neither. It is most probable, therefore, that Paul uses this general similitude according to his spirit in support of his own cause, as others have used it in support of theirs. It is in the same way that he uses this similitude, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, which, 1 Corinthians 5, 6, he uses to represent corrupt morals, and applies it in another place, Galatians 5, 9, to those who corrupt the word of God. So Christ also speaks of the leaven of Herod and of the Pharisees. Mark 8.15, Matthew 16.6 6. Supposing, therefore, that the prophets use this similitude when speaking more particularly of temporal punishment, upon which I shall not now dwell, lest I should be too much occupied about irrelevant questions and kept away from the subject point, yet Paul uses it in his spirit against free will, and as to saying that the liberty of the will is not destroyed by our being as clay in the hand of an afflicting God, I know not what it means, nor why the diatribe contends for such a point. For without doubt afflictions come upon us from God against our will, and impose upon us the necessity of bearing them whether we will or no. Nor is it in our power to avert them, though we are exhorted to bear them with a willing mind. Section 105. But it is worth while to hear the diatribe make out how it is that the argument of Paul does not exclude free will by that similitude. For it brings forward two absurd objections, the one taken from the Scriptures, the other from reason. From the Scriptures it collects this objection. When Paul, 2 Timothy 2.20, had said that in a great house there are vessels of gold and silver, wood and earth, some to honor and some to dishonor, he immediately adds, 
If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, and so forth. 21. Then the diatribe goes on to argue thus. What could be more ridiculous than for any one to say to an earthen chamber convenience, If thou shalt purify thyself, thou shalt be a vessel unto honor. But this would be rightly said to a rational earthen vessel, which can, when admonished, form itself according to the will of the Lord. By these observations it means to say that the similitude is not in all respects applicable, and is so mistaken that it affects nothing at all. I answer, not to cavil upon this point, that Paul does not say, If any one shall purify himself from his own filth, but from these, that is, from the vessels unto dishonor, so that the sense is, If any one shall remain separate, and shall not mingle himself with wicked teachers, he shall be a vessel unto honor. Let us grant also that this passage of Paul makes for the diatribe just as it wishes, that is, that the similitude is not effective. But how will it prove that Paul is here speaking on the same subject as he is in Romans 9, 11-23, which is the passage in dispute? Is it enough to cite a different passage without at all regarding whether it have the same or a different tendency? There is not, as I have often shown, a more easy or more frequent fall in the scriptures than the bringing together different scripture passages as being of the same meaning. Hence, the similitude in those passages, of which the diatribe boasts, makes less to its purpose than our similitude which it would refute. But, not to be contentious, let us grant that each passage of Paul is of the same tendency and that a similitude does not always apply in all respects, which is without controversy true, for otherwise it would not be a similitude nor a translation, but the thing itself. According to the proverb, a similitude halts, and does not always go upon four feet. Yet the diatribe errs and transgresses in this, neglecting the scope of the similitude which is to be most particularly observed, it contentiously catches at certain words of it, whereas the knowledge of what is said, as Hilary observes, is to be gained from the scope of what is said, not from certain detached words only. Thus the efficacy of the similitude depends upon the cause of the similitude. Why then does the diatribe disregard that for which the purpose of Paul uses this similitude, and catch at that which he says is unconnected with the purport of the similitude? That is to say, it is an exhortation where he saith, If a man purge himself from these, but a point of doctrine where he saith, In a great house there are vessels of gold, and so forth. So that from all the circumstances of the words and mind of Paul, you may understand that he is establishing the doctrine concerning the diversity and use of vessels. The sense, therefore, is this. Seeing that so many depart from the faith, there is no comfort for us but the being certain that the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that calleth upon the name of the Lord depart from evil. Second Timothy 2.19 This, then, is the cause and efficacy of the similitude, that God knows his own. Then follows the similitude, that there are different vessels, some to honor and some to dishonor. By this it is proved at once that the vessels do not prepare themselves, but that the master prepares them. And this is what Paul means, where he saith, Hath not the potter power over the clay? And so forth. Romans 9.21 Thus the similitude of Paul stands most effective, and that to prove that there is no such thing as free will in the sight of God. After this follows the exhortation, if a man purify himself from these, and so forth. And for what purpose this is may be clearly collected from what we have said already. It does not follow from this that the man can purify himself. Nay, if anything be proved thereby, it is this, that free will can purify itself without grace. For he does not say, if grace purify a man, but if a man purify himself. But concerning imperative and conditional passages, we have said enough. Moreover, the similitude is not set forth in conditional, but in indicative verbs. 
that the elect and the reprobate are as vessels of honor and of dishonor. In a word, if this fetch stand good, the whole argument of Paul comes to nothing. For in vain does he introduce vessels murmuring against God as the potter, if the fault plainly appear to be in the vessel and not in the potter. For who would murmur at hearing him damned who merited damnation? Section 106. The other absurd objection the diatribe gathers from Madame Reason, who is called Human Reason, that the fault is not to be laid on the vessel, but on the potter. Especially since he is such a potter who creates the clay as well as attempers it. Whereas, says the diatribe, here the vessel is cast into eternal fire, which merited nothing, except that it had no power of its own. In no one place does the diatribe more openly betray itself than in this. For it is here heard to say, in other words indeed, but in the same meaning, that which Paul makes the impious to say. Why doth he yet complain? For who hath resisted his will? Romans 9.19 this is that which reason cannot receive, and cannot bear. This is that which has offended so many men renowned for talent, who have been received through so many ages. Here they require that God should act according to human laws, and do what seems right unto men, or cease to be God. His secrets of majesty, say they, do not better his character in our estimation. Let him render a reason why he is God, or why he wills and does that which has no appearance of justice in it. It is as if one should ask a cobbler or a collar-maker to take the seat of judgment. Thus flesh does not think God worthy of so great glory, that it should believe him to be just and good, while he says and does those things which are above that which the volume of Justin and the fifth book of Aristotle's Ethics have defined to be justice. That majesty which is the creating cause of all things must bow to one of the dregs of his creation, and that Corician cavern must vice versa fear its spectators. It is absurd that he should condemn him who cannot avoid the merit of damnation, and on account of this absurdity it must be false that God has mercy on whom he will have mercy, and hardens whom he will. Romans 9.18 He must be brought to order. He must have certain laws prescribed to him, that he damn not any one but him who, according to our judgment, deserves to be damned. And thus an effectual answer is given to Paul and his similitude. He must recall it, and allow it to be utterly ineffective, and must so attemper it that this potter, according to the diatribe's interpretation, make the vessel to dishonor from merit preceding in the same manner in which he rejected some Jews on account of unbelief, and received Gentiles on account of faith. But if God work thus, and have respect unto merit, why do these impious ones murmur and expostulate? Why do they say, Why doth he find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Romans 9.19 And what need was there for Paul to restrain them? For who wonders even, much less, is indignant and expostulates, when any one is damned who merited damnation. Moreover, where remains the power of the potter to make that vessel he will, if, being subject to merit and laws, he is not permitted to make what he will, but is required to make what he ought? The respect of merit militates against the power and liberty of making what he will, as is proved by that good man of the house, who, when the workmen murmured and expostulated concerning their right, objected in answer, Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? These are the arguments which will not permit the gloss of the diatribe to be of any avail. Section 107 But let us, I pray you, suppose that God ought to be such an one who should have respect unto merit in those who are to be damned. Must we not in like manner also require and grant that he ought to have respect unto merit in those who are to be saved? For if we are to follow reason, it is equally unjust that the undeserving should be crowned, as that the undeserving should be damned. We will conclude, therefore, that God ought to justify from merit preceding, or we will declare him to be unjust, 
as being one who delights in evil and wicked men, and who invites and crowns their impiety by rewards. And then, woe unto you, sensibly miserable sinners, under that God, for who among you can be saved? Behold, therefore, the iniquity of the human heart. When God saves the undeserving without merit, nay, justifies the impious with all their demerit, it does not accuse him of iniquity, it does not expostulate with him why he does it, although it is in its own judgment most iniquitous. But because it is to its own profit and plausible, it considers it just and good. But when he damns the undeserving, this, because it is not to its own profit, is iniquitous. This is intolerable. Here it expostulates, here it murmurs, here it blasphemes. You see, therefore, that the diatribe, together with its friends, do not in this cause judge according to equity, but according to the feeling sense of their own profit. For if they regarded equity, they would expostulate with God when he crowned the undeserving, as they expostulate with him when he damns the undeserving. And also they would equally praise and proclaim God when he damns the undeserving, as they do when he saves the undeserving. For the iniquity in either instance is the same, if our own opinion be regarded. Unless they mean to say that the iniquity is not equal, whether you laud Cain for his fratricide and make him a king, or cast the innocent Abel into prison and murder him. Since, therefore, reason praises God when he saves the undeserving, but accuses him when he damns the undeserving, it stands convicted of not praising God as God, but as a certain one who serves its own profit, that is, it seeks in God itself and the things of itself, but seeks not God and the things of God. But if it be pleased with a God who crowns the undeserving, it ought not to be displeased with a God who damns the undeserving. For if he be just in the one instance, how shall he not be just in the other? seeing that, in the one instance, he pours forth grace and mercy upon the undeserving, and in the other pours forth wrath and severity upon the undeserving. He is, however, in both instances, monstrous and iniquitous in the sight of men, yet just and true in himself. But how it is just that he should crown the undeserving is incomprehensible now, but we shall see, when we come there, where it will be no longer believed, but seen in revelation face to face. So also, how it is just that he should damn the undeserving is incomprehensible now, yet we believe it, until the Son of Man shall be revealed. Section 108 The diatribe, however, being itself bitterly offended at this similitude of the potter and the clay, is not a little indignant in that it should be so pestered with it, and at last it comes to this. Having collected together different passages of Scripture, some of which seem to attribute all to man, and others all to grace, it angrily contends that the Scriptures on both sides should be understood according to a sound interpretation, and not received simply as they stand. And that otherwise, if we still so press upon it that similitude, it is prepared to press upon us in retaliation those subjunctive and conditional passages, and especially that of Paul, if a man purify himself from these. This passage, it says, makes Paul to contradict himself, and to attribute all to man, unless a sound interpretation be brought in to make it clear. And if an interpretation be admitted here in order to clear up the cause of grace, why should not an interpretation be admitted in the similitude of the potter also to clear up the cause of free will? I answer, it matters not with me whether you receive the passages in a simple sense, a twofold sense, or a hundredfold sense. What I say is this, that by this sound interpretation of yours, nothing that you desire is either affected or proved. For that which is required to be proved according to your design is, that free will cannot will good, whereas by this passage, if a man purify himself from these, as it is a conditional sentence, neither anything nor nothing is proved, for it is only an exhortation of Paul. 
or if you add the conclusion of the diatribe and say the exhortation is in vain if a man cannot purify himself then it proves that free will can do all things without grace and thus the diatribe explodes itself we are waiting therefore for some passage of the scripture to show us that this interpretation is right we give no credit to those who hatch it out of their own brain for we deny that any passage can be found which attributes all to man we deny that paul contradicts himself where he says if a man shall purify himself from these and we aver that both the contradiction and the interpretation which exhorts it are fictions that they are both thought of but neither of them proved this indeed we confess that if we were permitted to augment the scriptures by the conclusions and additions of the diatribe and to say if we are not able to perform the things which are commanded the precepts are given in vain then in truth paul would militate against himself as would the whole scripture also for then the scripture would be different from what it was before and would prove that free will can do all things what wonder however if he should then contradict himself again where he saith in another place that god worketh all in all first corinthians twelve six but however the scripture in question thus augmented makes not only against us but against the diatribe itself which defined free will to be that which cannot will anything good let therefore the diatribe clear itself first and say how these two assertions agree with paul free will cannot will anything good and also if a man purify himself from these therefore man can purify himself or it is said in vain you see therefore that the diatribe being entangled and overcome by that similitude of the potter only aims at evading it not at all considering in the meantime how its interpretation militates against its subject point and how it is refuting and laughing at itself section one hundred and nine but as to myself as i said before i never aimed at any kind of invented interpretation nor did i ever speak thus stretch forth thine hand that is grace shall stretch it forth all these things are the diatribe's own inventions concerning me to the furtherance of its own cause what i said was this that there is no contradiction in the words of the scripture nor any need of an invented interpretation to clear up a difficulty but that the assertors of free will willfully stumbled upon plain ground and dream of contradictions where there are none for example there is no contradiction in these scriptures if a man purify himself and god worketh all in all nor is it necessary to say in order to explain this difficulty god does something and man does something because the former scripture is conditional which neither affirms or denies any work or power in man but simply shows what work or power there ought to be in man there is nothing figurative here nothing that requires an invented interpretation the words are plain the sense is plain that is if you do not add conclusions and corruptions after the manner of the diatribe for then the sense would not be plain not however by its own fault but by the fault of the corrupter but the latter scripture god worketh all in all first corinthians twelve six is an indicative passage declaring that all works and all power are of god how then do these two passages the one of which says nothing of the power of man and the other of which attributes all to god contradict each other and not rather sweetly harmonize but the diatribe is so drowned suffocated in and corrupted with that sense of the carnal interpretation that impossibilities are commanded in vain that it has no power over itself but as soon as it hears an interpretive or conditional word it immediately tacks to it its indicative conclusions a certain thing is commanded therefore we are able to do it and do do it or the command is ridiculous on this side it bursts forth and boasts of its own complete victory as though it held it as a settled point that these conclusions as soon as hatched in thought were established as firmly as the divine authority and hence it pronounces with all confidence that in some places of the scripture all is attributed to man and that therefore there is a contradiction that requires interpretation 
but it does not see that all this is the figment of its own brain, nowhere confirmed by one iota of Scripture. And not only so, but that it is of such a nature that if it were admitted it would confute no one more directly than itself, because if it proved anything, it would prove that free will can do all things, whereas it undertook to prove the directly contrary. Section 110. In the same way also, it so continually repeats this, If man do nothing, there is no place for merit, and where there is no place for merit, there can be no place either for punishment or for reward. Here again, it does not see that by these carnal arguments it refutes itself more directly than it refutes us. For what do these conclusions prove but that all merit is in the power of free will? And then, where is any room for grace? Moreover, supposing free will to merit a certain little, and grace the rest, why does free will receive the whole reward? Or shall we suppose it to receive but a certain small portion of the reward? Then, if there be a place for merit, in order that there might be a place for reward, the merit must be as great as the reward. But why do I thus lose both words and time upon a thing of naught? For even supposing the whole were established at which the diatribe is aiming, and that merit is partly the work of man and partly the work of God, yet it cannot define that work itself, what it is, of what kind it is, or how far it is to extend. Therefore its disputation is about nothing at all. Since, therefore, it cannot prove any one thing which it asserts, nor establish its interpretation nor contradiction, nor bring forward a passage that attributes all to man. And since all are the phantoms of its own cognition, Paul's similitude of the potter and the clay stands unshaken and invincible, that it is not according to our free will what kind of vessels we are made. And as to the exhortations of Paul, if a man purify himself from these and the like, they are certain models according to which we ought to be formed but they are not proofs of our working power, or of our desire. Suffice it to have spoken thus upon these points, the hardening of Pharaoh, the case of Esau, and the similitude of the potter. End of section 110《》Sections 111 through 125 of The Bondage of the Will by Martin Luther, translated by Henry Cole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Discussion, second part, continued. Section 111. The diatribe at length comes to the passages cited by Luther against free will with the intent to refute them. The first passage is that of Genesis 6.3. My spirit shall not always remain in man, seeing that he is flesh. This passage it confutes variously. First, it says that flesh here does not signify vile affection, but infirmity. Then it augments the text of Moses, that this saying of his refers to the men of that age, and not to the whole race of men, as if he said, In these men. And, moreover, that it does not refer to all the men, even of that age, because Noah was accepted. And at last it says that this word has in the Hebrew another signification, that it signifies the mercy and not the severity of God, according to the authority of Jerome. By this it would perhaps persuade us that since that saying did not apply to Noah but to the wicked, it was not the mercy but the severity of God that was shown to Noah, and the mercy not the severity of God that was shown to the wicked. But let us away with these ridiculing vanities of the diatribe, for there is nothing which it advances which does not evince that it looks upon the scriptures as mere fables. What Jerome here triflingly talks about is nothing at all to me, for it is certain that he cannot prove anything that he says. Nor is our dispute concerning the sense of Jerome, but concerning the sense of the scripture. Let that perverter of the scriptures attempt to make it appear that the Spirit of God signifies indignation. I say that he is deficient in both parts of the necessary twofold proof. First, 
he cannot produce one passage of the Scripture in which the Spirit of God is understood as signifying indignation. For, on the contrary, kindness and sweetness are everywhere ascribed to the Spirit. And next, if he should prove that it is understood in any place as signifying indignation, yet he cannot easily prove that it follows of necessity that it is so to be received in this place. So also let him attempt to make it appear that flesh is here to be understood as signifying infirmity. Yet he is as deficient as ever in proof. For where Paul calls the Corinthians carnal, he does not signify infirmity, but corrupt affection, because he charges them with strife and divisions, which is not infirmity or incapacity to receive stronger doctrine, but malice, and that old leaven which he commands them to purge out, 1 Corinthians 3, 3, and 7. But let us examine the Hebrew. Section 112. My spirit shall not always judge in man, for he is flesh. These are verbatim the words of Moses. And if we would away with our own dreams, the words as they there stand are, I think, sufficiently plain and clear. And that they are the words of an angry God is fully manifest, both from what precedes and from what follows, together with the effect, the flood. The cause of their being spoken was the sons of men taking unto them wives from the mere lust of the flesh, and then so filling the earth with violence as to cause God to hasten the flood, and scarcely to delay that for an hundred and twenty years, Genesis 6, 1 through 3, which, but for them, he would never have brought upon the earth at all. Read and study Moses, and you will plainly see that this is his meaning. But it is no wonder that the scriptures should be obscure, or that you should be enabled to establish from them not only a free, but a divine will, where you are allowed so to trifle with them, as to seek to make out of them a Virgilian patchwork. And this is what you call clearing up difficulties, and putting an end to all dispute by means of an interpretation. But it is with these trifling vanities that Jerome and Origen have filled the world, and have been the original cause of that pestilent practice, the not attending to the simplicity of the Scriptures. It is enough for me to prove that in this passage the divine authority calls man flesh, and flesh in that sense that the Spirit of God could not continue among them, but was at a decreed time to be taken from them. And what God meant when he declared that his Spirit should not always judge among men is explained immediately afterwards where he determines an hundred and twenty years as the time that he would still continue to judge. Here he contrasts spirit with flesh, showing that men, being flesh, receive not the spirit, and he, as being a spirit, cannot approve of flesh. Wherefore it is that the spirit, after an hundred and twenty years, is to be withdrawn. Hence you may understand the passage of Moses thus. My spirit, which is in Noah and in the other holy men, rebukes those impious ones by the word of their preaching and by their holy lives. For to judge among men is to act among them in the office of the word, to reprove, to rebuke, to beseech them opportunely and importunely, but in vain. For they, being blinded and hardened by the flesh, only become the worse the more they are judged. And so it ever is that wherever the word of God comes forth in the world, these men become the worse the more they hear of it. And this is the reason why wrath is hastened, even as the flood was hastened at that time, because they now not only sin, but even despise grace. As Christ saith, Light is come into the world, and men hate the light. John 3.19 Since, therefore, men, according to the testimony of God himself, are flesh, they can savor of nothing but flesh. So far is it from possibility that free will should do anything but sin. And if, even while the Spirit of God is among them calling and teaching, they only become worse, what will they do when left to themselves without the Spirit of God? Section 113. Nor is it at all to the purpose, you are saying, that Moses is speaking with reference to the men of that age. For the same applies unto all men because all are flesh, as Christ saith, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. John 3, 6. 
and how deep a corruption that is he himself shows in the same chapter, where he saith, Except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Let therefore the Christian know that Origen and Jerome, together with all their train, perniciously err when they say that flesh ought not in these passages to be understood as meaning corrupt affection. Because that of 1 Corinthians 3.3, 3, For ye are yet carnal, signifies ungodliness. For Paul means that there are some among them still ungodly, and moreover, that even the saints, in as far as they savor of carnal things, are carnal, though justified by the Spirit. In a word, you may take this as a general observation upon the Scriptures. Wherever mention is made of flesh, in contradistinction to spirit, you may there, by flesh, understand everything that is contrary to spirit, as in this passage, the flesh profiteth nothing, John 6.63. 6, but where it is used abstractly, there you may understand the corporal state and nature, as they twain shall be one flesh, Matthew 19.5. My flesh is meat indeed, John 6.55. The word was made flesh, John 1.14. In such passages you may make a figurative alteration in the Hebrew, and for flesh say body. For in the Hebrew tongue the one term flesh embraces in signification our two terms, flesh and body. And I could wish that these two terms had been distinctively used throughout the canon of the Scripture. Thus then, I presume, my passage, Genesis 6, still stands directly against free will, since flesh is proved to be that which Paul declares, Romans 8, 5 through 8, cannot be subject to God, as we may there see, and since the diatribe itself asserts that it cannot will anything good. Section 114. Another passage is that of Genesis 8:21. The thought and imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. And that also, Genesis 6.5, Every imagination of man's heart is only evil continually. These passages it evades thus. The proneness to evil, which is in most men, does not wholly take away the freedom of the will. Does God, I pray you, here speak of most men, and not rather all men, when, after the flood, as it were, repenting, he promises to those who were then remaining, and to those who were to come, that he would no more bring a flood upon the earth, for man's sake, assigning this as the reason, because man is prone to evil. As though he had said, If I should act according to the wickedness of man, I should never cease from bringing a flood. Wherefore, henceforth, I will not act according to that which he deserves, and so forth. You see, therefore, that God, both before and after the flood, declares that man is evil, so that what the diatribe says about most men amounts to nothing at all. Moreover, a proneness or inclination to evil appears to the diatribe to be a matter of little moment, as though it were in our own power to keep ourselves upright, or to restrain it. Whereas the scripture, by that proneness, signifies the continual bent and impetus of the will to evil. Why does not the diatribe here appeal to the Hebrew? Moses says nothing there about proneness. But, that you may have no room for cavillation, the Hebrew, Genesis 6, 5, runs thus, Ko yetzer mashevot levo rakra ko hayom. That is, every imagination of the thought of the heart is only evil all days. He does not say that he is intent or prone to evil but that evil altogether, and nothing but evil, is thought or imagined by man throughout his whole life. The nature of his evil is described to be that which neither does nor can do anything but evil, as being evil itself. For according to the testimony of Christ, an evil tree can bring forth none other than evil fruit. Matthew seven seventeen through 18 And as to the diatribes pertly objecting, why was time given for repentance, then, if no part of repentance depend on free will, and all things be conducted according to the law of necessity? I answer, you may make the same objection to all the precepts of God, and say, why does he command at all, if all things take place of necessity? 
He commands, in order to instruct and admonish, that men, being humbled under the knowledge of their evil, might come to grace, as I have fully shown already. This passage, therefore, still remains invincible against the freedom of the will. Section 115. The third passage is that of Isaiah 42. She hath received at the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Jerome, says the diatribe, interprets this concerning the divine vengeance, not concerning his grace, given in return for evil deeds. I hear you. Jerome says so, therefore it is true. I am disputing about Isaiah, who here speaks in the clearest words, and Jerome is cast in my teeth. A man, to say no worse of him, of neither judgment nor application. Where now is that promise of ours, by which we agreed at the outset, that we would go according to the Scriptures, and not according to the commentaries of men? The whole of this chapter of Isaiah, according to the testimony of the evangelists, where they mention it, is referring to John the Baptist. The voice of one crying speaks of the remission of sins proclaimed by the gospel. But we will allow Jerome, after his manner, to thrust in the blindness of the Jews for an historical sense, and his own trifling vanities for an allegory. And, turning all grammar upside down, we will understand this passage as speaking of vengeance, which speaks of the remission of sins. But, I pray you, what vengeance is fulfilled in the preaching of Christ? Let us, however, see how the words run in the Hebrew. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, in the vocative, or my people, in the objective, saith your God. He, I presume, who commands to comfort is not executing vengeance. It then follows, Speak ye to the heart of Jerusalem, and cry unto her. Isaiah 40, 1-2 Speak ye to the heart is a Hebraism, and signifies to speak good things, sweet things, and alluring things. Thus Shechem, Genesis 34, 3, speaks to the heart of Dinah, whom he defiled. That is, when she was heavy-hearted, he comforted her with tender words, as our translator has rendered it. And what those good and sweet things are, which are commanded to be proclaimed to their comfort, the prophet explains directly afterwards, saying, That her warfare is accomplished, her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Her warfare, militia, which our translators have rendered her evil, malitia, is considered by the Jews, those audacious grammarians, to signify an appointed time. For thus they understand that passage, Job 7.1, is there not an appointed time to man upon earth? That is, his time is determinately appointed. But I receive it simply and according to the grammatical propriety as signifying warfare. Wherefore you may understand Isaiah as speaking with reference to the race and labor of the people under the law, who are, as it were, fighting on a platform. Hence Paul compares both the preachers and the hearers of the word to soldiers, as in the case of Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, 3, whom he commands to be a good soldier, and to fight the good fight. And, 1 Corinthians 9, 24, he represents them as running in a race, and observes also that no one is crowned except he strive lawfully. He equips the Ephesians and Thessalonians with arms, Ephesians 6, 10-18 and he glories himself that he had fought the good fight, 2 Timothy 4, 7, with many like instances in other places. So also at 1 Samuel 2, 22, it is in the Hebrew, And the sons of Eli slept with the women who fought, militantibus, at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, of whose fighting Moses makes mention in Exodus. And hence it is that the God of the people is called the Lord of Sabaoth, that is, the Lord of warfare and of armies. Isaiah, therefore, is proclaiming that the warfare of the people under the law, who are pressed down under the law as a burden intolerable, as Peter saith, Acts 15, 7-10, is to be at an end, and that they being freed from the law are to be translated into the new warfare of the Spirit. Moreover, this end of their most hard warfare, and this translation to the new and all free warfare, is not given unto them on account of their merit, seeing that they could not endure it. 
Nay, it is rather given unto them on account of their demerit, for their warfare is ended by their iniquities being freely forgiven them. The words are not obscure or ambiguous here. He saith that their warfare was ended by their iniquities being forgiven them, manifestly signifying that the soldiers under the law did not fulfill the law and could not fulfill it, and that they only carried on a warfare of sin and were soldier sinners, as though God had said, I am compelled to forgive them their sins if I would have my law fulfilled by them. Nay, I must take away my law entirely when I forgive them, for I see they cannot but sin, and the more so the more they fight, that is, the more they strive to fulfill the law by their own powers. For in the Hebrew her iniquity is pardoned, signifies its being done in gratuitous good will. And it is thus that the iniquity is pardoned without any merit, nay, under all demerit, as is shown in what follows. For she hath received at the Lord's hand double for all her sins. That is, as I said before, not only the remission of sins, but an end of the warfare, which is nothing more or less than this, the law being taken out of the way, which is the strength of sin, and their sin being pardoned, which is the sting of death, they reign in a twofold liberty by the victory of Jesus Christ, which is what Isaiah means when he says, From the hand of the Lord. For they do not obtain it by their own powers, or on account of their own merit, but they receive it from the conqueror and giver, Jesus Christ. And that which is, according to the Hebrew, in all her sins, is, according to the Latin, for all her sins, or on account of all her sins as in Hosea 12.12, 12, Israel served in a wife, that is, for a wife. And so also in Psalm 59.3, They lay in wait in my soul, that is, for my soul. Isaiah, therefore, is here pointing out to us those merits of ours by which we imagine we are to obtain the twofold liberty, that of the end of the law warfare and that of the pardon of sin, making it appear to us that they were nothing but sins, nay, all sins. Could I therefore suffer this most beautiful passage, which stands invincible against free will, to be thus bedaubed with Jewish filth cast upon it by Jerome and the diatribe? God forbid, no! My Isaiah stands victor over free will, and clearly shows that grace is given not to merits or to the endeavors of free will, but to sins and demerits, and that free will with all its powers can do nothing but carry on a warfare of sin, so that the very law which it imagines to be given as a help becomes intolerable to it, and makes it the greater sinner the longer it is under its warfare. Section 116. But as to the diatribe disputing thus, although sin abound by the law, and where sin has abounded grace much more abound, yet it does not therefore follow that man doing by God's help what is pleasing to him, cannot by works morally good prepare himself for the favor of God. Wonderful! Surely the diatribe does not speak this out of its own head, but has taken it out of some paper or other, sent or received from another quarter, and inserted it into its book. For it certainly can neither see nor hear the meaning of these words. If sin abound by the law, how is it possible that a man can prepare himself by moral works for the favor of God? How can works avail anything when the law avails nothing? Or what else is it for sin to abound by the law, but for all the works done according to the law to become sins? But of this elsewhere. But what does it mean when it says that man, assisted by the help of God, can prepare himself by moral works? Are we here disputing concerning the divine assistance, or concerning free will? For what is not possible through the divine assistance? But the fact is, as I said before, the diatribe cares nothing for the cause it has taken up, and therefore it snores, and yawns forth such words as these. But, however, it adduces Cornelius the centurion, Acts 10.31, as an example, observing that his prayers and alms pleased God before he was baptized, and before he was inspired by the Holy Spirit. I have read Luke upon the Acts, too, and yet I never perceived from one single syllable that the works of Cornelius were morally good without the Holy Spirit, as the diatribe dreams. But, on the contrary, I find that he was 
a just man, one who feared God, for thus Luke calls him. But to call a man without the Holy Spirit a just man and one that feared God is the same thing as calling Baal Christ. Moreover, the whole context shows that Cornelius was clean before God, even upon the testimony of the vision which was sent down from heaven to Peter, and which reproved him. Are then the righteousness and faith of Cornelius set forth by Luke in such words and attending circumstances, and do the diatribe and its sophists remain blind with open eyes, or see the contrary in a light of words and an evidence of circumstances so clear? Such is their want of diligence in reading and contemplating the Scriptures, and yet they must brand them with the assertion that they are obscure and ambiguous. But grant it that he was not as yet baptized, nor had as yet heard the word concerning Christ risen from the dead. Does it therefore follow that he was without the Holy Spirit? According to this you will say that John the Baptist and his parents, the mother of Christ and Simeon, were without the Holy Spirit. But let us take leave of such thick darkness. Section 117 the fourth passage is that of Isaiah in the same chapter. All flesh is grass, and all the glory of it as the flower of grass. The grass is withered, the flower of grass is fallen, because the Spirit of the Lord hath blown upon it. Isaiah 46-7 This scripture appears to my friend Diatribe to be treated with violence by being dragged in as applicable to the causes of grace and free will. Why so, I pray? because, it says, Jerome understands spirit to signify indignation, and flesh to signify the infirm condition of man which cannot stand against God. Here again the trifling vanities of Jerome are cast in my teeth instead of Isaiah, and I find I have more to do in fighting against that wearisomeness with which the diatribe with so much diligence, to use no harsher term, wears me out, than I have in fighting against the diatribe itself. But I have given my opinion upon the sentiment of Jerome already. Let me beg permission of the diatribe to compare this gentleman with himself. He says that flesh signifies the infirm condition of man, and spirit the divine indignation. Has, then, the divine indignation nothing else to wither but that miserable infirm condition of man? which it ought rather to raise up? This, however, is more excellent still. The flower of grass is the glory which arises from the prosperity of corporal things. The Jews gloried in their temple, their circumcision, and their sacrifices, and the Greeks in their wisdom. Therefore the flower of grass is the glory of the flesh, the righteousness of works, and the wisdom of the world. How then are righteousness and wisdom called by the diatribe corporal things? And after all, what have these to do with Isaiah, who interprets his own meaning in his own words, saying, Surely the people is grass? He does not say, Surely the infirm condition of man is grass, but the people, and affirms it with an asseveration. And what is the people? Is it the infirm condition of man only? But whether Jerome, by the infirm condition of man, means the whole creation together, or the miserable lot and state of man only, I am sure I know not. Be it however which it may, he certainly makes the divine indignation to gain a glorious renown and a noble spoil from withering a miserable creation, or a race of wretched men, and not rather from scattering the proud, pulling down the mighty from their seat, and sending the rich empty away, as Mary sings. Luke 1, 51-53 Section 118 But let us dispatch these hobgoblins of glosses, and take Isaiah's words as they are. The people, he saith, is grass. People does not signify flesh merely, or the infirm condition of human nature, but it comprehends everything that there is in people, the rich, the wise, the just, the saints. Unless you mean to say that the Pharisees, the elders, the princes, the nobles, and the rich men were not of the people of the Jews. The flower of grass is rightly called their glory, because it was in their kingdom, their government, and above all in the law, 
in God, in righteousness, and in wisdom, that they gloried, as Paul shows Romans 2, 3, and 9. When, therefore, Isaiah saith, All flesh, what else does he mean but all grass, or all people? For he does not say flesh only, but all flesh, and to people belong soul, body, mind, reason, judgment, and whatever is called or found to be most excellent in man. For when he says, All flesh is grass, he accepts nothing but the spirit which withereth it. Nor does he omit anything when he says, The people is grass. Speak, therefore, of free will. Speak of anything that can be called the highest or the lowest in the people. Isaiah calls the whole flesh and grass, because those three terms, flesh, grass, and people, according to his interpretation, who is himself the writer of the book, signify in that place the same thing. Moreover, you yourself affirm that the wisdom of the Greeks and the righteousness of the Jews, which were withered by the gospel, were grass, and the flower of grass. Do you then think that the wisdom which the Greeks had was not the most excellent, and that the righteousness which the Jews wrought was not the most excellent? If you do, show us what was more excellent. With what assurance, then, is it that you, Philip-like, flout and say, If any one shall contend that that which is most excellent in the nature of man is nothing else but flesh, that is, that it is impious, I will agree with him when he shall have proved his assertion by testimonies from the Holy Scripture. You have here Isaiah, who cries with a loud voice that the people, devoid of the Spirit of the Lord, is flesh, although you will not understand him thus. You have also your own confession, where you said, though unwittingly perhaps, that the wisdom of the Greeks was grass, or the glory of grass, which is the same thing as saying, it was flesh unless you mean to say that the wisdom of the Greeks did not pertain to reason, or to the hegemonicon, as you say, that is, the principal part of man. If, therefore, you will not deign to listen to me, listen to yourself, where, being caught in the powerful trap of truth, you speak the truth. You have, moreover, the testimony of John. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. John 3.6 you have, I say, this passage, which makes it evidently manifest that what is not born of the Spirit is flesh. For if it be not so, the distinction of Christ could not subsist, who divides all men into two distinct divisions, flesh and spirit. This passage you floutingly pass by, as if it did not give you the information you want, and betake yourself somewhere else, as usual just dropping as you go along an observation that John is here saying that those who believe are born of God and are made the sons of God, nay, that they are gods and new creatures. You pay no regard, therefore, to the conclusion that is to be drawn from this division, but merely tell us at your ease what persons are on one side of the division, thus confidently relying upon your rhetorical maneuver as though there were no one likely to discover an evasion and dissimulation so subtly managed. Section 119 It is difficult to refrain from concluding that you are in this passage crafty in double-dealing. For he who treats of the Scriptures with that prevarication and hypocrisy which you practice in treating of them may have face enough to pretend that he is not as yet fully acquainted with the Scriptures and is willing to be taught, when at the same time he wills nothing less, and merely prates thus in order to cast a reproach upon the all-clear light of the Scriptures, and to cover with the best cloak his determinate perseverance in his own opinions. Thus the Jews, even to this day, pretend that what Christ, the Apostles, and the whole Church have taught is not to be proved by the Scriptures. The Papists, too, pretend that they do not yet fully understand the Scriptures, although the very stones speak aloud the truth. But perhaps you are waiting for a passage to be produced from the Scriptures which shall contain these letters and syllables. The principal part of man is flesh, or that which is most excellent in man is flesh. Otherwise you will declare yourself an invincible victor, just as though the Jews should require that a portion be produced from the prophets which shall consist of these letters, 
Jesus, the son of the carpenter, who was born of the Virgin Mary in Bethlehem, is the Messiah, the Son of God. Here, where you are closely put to it by a plain sentence, you challenge us to produce letters and syllables. In another place, where you are overcome both by the sentence and by the letters, too, you have recurse to tropes, to difficulties, and to sound interpretations. And there is no place in which you do not invent something whereby to contradict the Scriptures. At one time you fly to the interpretations of the Fathers, at another to absurdities of reason. And when neither of these will serve your turn, you dwell on that which is irrelevant or contingent, yet with an especial care that you are not caught by the passage immediately in point. But what shall I call you? Proteus is not half a Proteus compared to you, yet after all you cannot get off. What victories did the Arians boast of, because these syllables and letters, homoousios, were not to be found in the Scriptures? Considering it nothing to the purpose, that the same thing could be most effectually proved in other words. But whether or not this be a sign of a good, not to say pious, mind, and a mind desiring to be taught, let impiety or iniquity itself be judge. Take your victory, then, while we as the vanquished confess that these characters and syllables, that which is most excellent in man is nothing but flesh, is not to be found in the Scriptures. But just behold what a victory you have gained, when we most abundantly prove that though it is not found in the Scriptures, that one detached portion, or that which is most excellent, or the principal part, of man is flesh, but that the whole of man is flesh, and not only so, but that the whole people is flesh, and further still, that the whole human race is flesh. For Christ saith, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Do you here set about your difficulty solving, your trope inventing, and searching for the interpretations of the fathers, or, turning quite another way, enter upon a dissertation on the Trojan War, in order to avoid seeing and hearing this passage now adduced? We do not believe only, but see and experience that the whole human race is born of the flesh, and therefore we are compelled to believe upon the word of Christ that which we do not see, that the whole human race is flesh. Do we now then give the sophists any room to doubt and dispute whether or not the principal, hegemonica part of a man be comprehended in the whole man, in the whole people, in the whole race of men? We know, however, that in the whole human race both the body and soul are comprehended, together with all their powers and works, with all their vices and virtues, with all their wisdom and folly, with all their righteousness and unrighteousness. All things are flesh, because all things savor of the flesh, that is, of their own, and are, as Paul saith, without the glory of God and the Spirit of God. Romans 3.23, 8, 5-9. through 9. Section 120. And as to your saying, yet every affection of man is not flesh, there is an affection called soul, there is an affection called spirit, by which we aspire to what is meritoriously good, as the philosophers aspired, who taught that we should rather die a thousand deaths than commit one base action, even though we were assured that men would never know it, and that God would pardon it. I answer, he who believes nothing certainly may easily believe and say anything. I will not ask you, but let your friend Lucian ask you whether you can bring forward any one out of the whole human race. Let him be twofold or sevenfold greater than Socrates himself, who ever performed this of which you speak, and which you say they taught. Why then do you thus babble in vanities of words? Could they ever aspire to that which is meritoriously good, who did not even know what good is? If I should ask you for some of the brightest examples of your meritorious good, you would say, perhaps, that it was meritoriously good when men died for their country, for their wives and children, and for their parents, or when they refrained from lying or from treachery, or when they endured exquisite torments, as did Q. Civola, M. Regulus, and others. But what can you point out in all those men but an external show of works? For did you ever see their hearts? Nay, it was manifest from the very appearance of their works that they did all these things for their own glory, 
so much so that they were not even ashamed to confess and to boast that they sought their own glory. For the Romans, according to their own testimonies, did whatever they did, of virtue or valor, from a thirst after glory. The same did the Greeks, the same did the Jews, and the same do all the race of men. But though this be meritoriously good before men, yet before God nothing is less meritoriously good than all this. Nay, it is most impious, and the greatest of sacrilege, because they did it not for the glory of God, nor that they might glorify God, but with the most impious of all robbery. For as they were robbing God of His glory and taking it to themselves, they never were farther from meritorious good, never more base, than when they were shining in their most exalted virtues. How could they do what they did for the glory of God, when they neither knew God nor His glory? Not, however, because it did not appear, but because the flesh did not permit them to see the glory of God, from their fury and madness after their own glory. This, therefore, is that right-ruling spirit, that principal part of man which aspires to what is meritoriously good. It is a plunderer of the divine glory, and an usurper of the divine majesty. And then the most so, when men are at the highest of their meritorious good, and the most glittering in their brightest virtues. Deny, therefore, if you can, that these are flesh, and carried away by an impious affection. But I do not believe that the diatribe can be so much offended at the expression where man is said to be either flesh or spirit, because a Latin would here say man is either carnal or spiritual. For this particularly, as well as many others, must be granted to the Hebrew tongue, that when it says man is flesh or spirit, its signification is the same as ours is when we say man is carnal or spiritual. The same signification which the Latins also convey when they say the wolf is destructive to the folds, moisture is favorable to the young corn, or when they say this fellow is iniquity and evil itself. So also the Holy Scripture, by a force of expression, calls man flesh, that is, carnality itself because it savors too much of, nay, of nothing but those things which are of the flesh. And spirit, because he savors of, seeks, does, and can endure nothing but those things which are of the spirit. Unless perhaps the diatribe should still make this remaining query. Supposing the whole of man to be flesh, and that which is most excellent in man to be called flesh, must therefore that which is called flesh be at once called ungodly? I call him ungodly who is without the Spirit of God. For the Scripture saith that the Spirit was therefore given, that he might justify the ungodly. And as Christ makes a distinction between the Spirit and the flesh, saying, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and adds that that which is born of the flesh cannot see the kingdom of God, John 3, 3-6, three it evidently follows that whatsoever is flesh is ungodly, under the wrath of God and a stranger to the kingdom of God. And if it be a stranger to the kingdom of God, it necessarily follows that it is under the kingdom and spirit of Satan. For there is no medium between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. They are mutually and eternally opposed to each other. These are the arguments that prove that the most exalted virtues among the nations, the highest perfections of the philosophers, and the greatest excellencies among men, appear indeed in the sight of men to be meritoriously virtuous and good, and are so called, but that, in the sight of God, they are in truth flesh, and subservient to the kingdom of Satan, that is, ungodly, sacrilegious, and in every respect evil. Section 121 But pray, let us suppose the sentiment of the diatribe to stand good, that every affection is not flesh, that is, ungodly, but is that which is called good and sound spirit. Only observe what absurdity must hence follow, not only with respect to human reason, but with respect to the Christian religion, and the most important articles of faith. For if that which is most excellent in man be not ungodly, nor utterly depraved, nor damnable, but that which is flesh only, that is, the grosser and viler affections, 
what sort of a redeemer shall we make christ shall we rate the price of his blood so low as to say that it redeemed that part of man only which is the most vile and that the most excellent part of man has power to work its own salvation and does not want christ henceforth then i must preach christ as the redeemer not of the whole man but of his vilest part that is of his flesh but that the man himself is his own redeemer in his better part have it therefore which way you will if the better part of man be sound it does not want christ as a redeemer and if it does not want christ it triumphs in a glory above that of christ for it takes care of the redemption of the better part itself whereas christ only takes care of that of the vilest part and then moreover the kingdom of satan will come to nothing at all for it will reign only in the viler part of man because the man himself will rule over the better part so that by this doctrine of yours concerning the principal part of man it will come to pass that man will be exalted above christ and the devil both that is he will be made god of gods and lord of lords and where is now that probable opinion which asserted that free will cannot will anything good it here contends that it is a principal part meritoriously good and sound and that it does not even want christ but can do more than god himself and the devil can do put together i say this that you may again see how eminently perilous a matter it is to attempt sacred and divine things without the spirit of god in the temerity of human reason if therefore christ be the lamb of god that taketh away the sins of the world it follows that the whole world is under sin damnation and the devil hence your distinction between the principal parts and the parts not principal profits you nothing for the world signifies men savouring of nothing but the things of the world throughout all their faculties section one hundred twenty two if the whole man says the diatribe even when regenerated by faith is nothing else but flesh where is the spirit born of the spirit where is the child of god where is the new creature i want information upon these points thus the diatribe where now where now my dear friend diatribe what dream now you demand to be informed how the spirit born of the spirit can be flesh oh how elated how secure of victory do you insultingly put this question to me as though it were impossible for me to stand my ground here all this while you are abusing the authority of the ancients for they say that there are certain seeds of good implanted in the minds of men but however whether you use or whether abuse the authority of the ancients it is all one to me you will see by and by what you believe when you believe men prating out of their own brain without the word of god though perhaps your care about religion does not give you much concern as to what any one believes since you so easily believe men without at all regarding whether or not that which they say be certain or uncertain in the sight of god and i also wish to be informed when i ever taught that with which you so freely and publicly charge me who would be so mad as to say that he who is born of the spirit is nothing but flesh i make a manifest distinction between flesh and spirit as things that directly militate against each other and i say according to the divine oracles that the man who is not regenerated by faith is flesh but i say that he who is thus regenerated is no longer flesh excepting as to the remnants of the flesh which war against the first fruits of the spirit received nor do i suppose you wish to attempt to charge me invidiously with anything wrong here if you do there is no charge that you could more iniquitously bring against me but you either understand nothing of my side of the subject or else you find yourself unequal to the magnitude of the cause by which you are perhaps so overwhelmed and confounded that you do not rightly know what you say against me or for yourself for where you declare it to be your belief upon the authority of the ancients that there are certain seeds of good implanted in the minds of men you must surely quite forget yourself because you before asserted that free will cannot will anything good and how cannot will anything good and certain seeds of good can stand in harmony together i know not 
Thus I am perpetually compelled to remind you of the subject design with which you set out, from which you with perpetual forgetfulness depart and take up something contrary to your professed purpose. Section 123 Another passage is that of Jeremiah 10.23. I know, O Lord, that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. This passage, says the diatribe, rather applies to the events of prosperity than to the power of free will. Here again the diatribe, with its usual audacity, introduces a gloss according to its own pleasure, as though the scripture were fully under its control. But in order to anyone's considering the sense and intent of the prophet, what need was there for the opinion of a man of so great authority? Erasmus says so. It is enough. It must be so. If this liberty of glossing as they lust be permitted the adversaries, what point is there which they might not carry? Let therefore Erasmus show us the validity of this gloss from the scope of the context, and we will believe him. I, however, will show from the scope of the context that the prophet, when he saw that he taught the ungodly with so much earnestness in vain, was at once convinced that his word could avail nothing unless God should teach them within, and that, therefore, it was not in man to hear the word of God and to will good. Seeing this judgment of God, he was alarmed and asked of God that he would correct him, but with judgment, if he had need to be corrected, and that he might not be given up to his divine wrath with the ungodly, whom he suffered to be hardened and to remain in unbelief. But let us suppose that the passage is to be understood concerning the events of adversity and prosperity. What will you say if this gloss should go most directly to overthrow free will? This new evasion is invented indeed, that ignorant and lazy deceivers may consider it satisfactory. The same which they also had in view, who invented that evasion, the necessity of the consequence. And so drawn away are they by these newly invented terms, that they do not see that they are, by these evasions, tenfold more effectually entangled and caught than they would have been without them. As in the present instance, if the event of these things which are temporal, and over which man, Genesis 1, 26-30, was constituted Lord, be not in our own power, how, I pray you, can that heavenly thing, the grace of God, which depends on the will of God alone, be in our own power? Can that endeavor of free will attain unto eternal salvation, which is not able to retain a farthing or a hair of the head? When we have no power to obtain the creature, shall it be said that we have power to obtain the Creator? What madness is this? The endeavoring of man, therefore, unto good or unto evil, when applied to events, is a thousandfold more enormous, because he is in both much more deceived and has much less liberty than he has in striving after money or glory or pleasure. What an excellent evasion is this gloss, then, which denies the liberty of man in trifling and created events, and preaches it up in the greatest and divine events. This is as if one should say, Codrus is not able to pay a groat, but he is able to pay thousands of thousands of pounds. I am astonished that the diatribe, having all along so inveighed against that tenet of Wycliffe, that all things take place of necessity, should now itself grant that events come upon us of necessity. And even if you do, says the diatribe, forcibly twist this to apply to free will, all confess that no one can hold on a right course of life without the grace of God. Nevertheless, we still strive ourselves with all our powers, for we pray daily, O Lord my God, direct my goings in thy sight. He, therefore, who implores aid, does not lay aside his own endeavors. The diatribe thinks that it matters not what it answers, so that it does not remain silent with nothing to say, and then it would have what it does say to appear satisfactory. Such a vain confidence has it in its own authority. It ought here to have proved whether or not we strive by our own powers, whereas it proved that he who prays attempts something. But, I pray, is it here laughing at us, or mocking the papists? For he who prays, prays by the Spirit. 
Nay, it is the Spirit Himself that prays in us. Romans 8, 26-27. How, then, is the power of free will proved by the strivings of the Holy Spirit? Are free will and the Holy Spirit with the diatribe one and the same thing? Or are we disputing now about what the Holy Spirit can do? The diatribe, therefore, leaves me this passage of Jeremiah uninjured and invincible, and only produces the gloss out of its own brain. I also can strive by my own powers, and Luther will be compelled to believe this gloss if he will. Section 124. There is that passage of Proverbs 16, 1 and 9 also. It is of man to prepare the heart, but of the Lord to govern the tongue which the diatribe says refers to events of things, as though this the diatribe's own saying would satisfy us without any further authority. But, however, it is quite sufficient that, allowing the sense of these passages to be concerning the events of things, we have evidently come off victorious by the arguments which we have just advanced, that, if we have no such thing as freedom of will in our own things and works, much less have we any such thing in divine things and works. But mark the great acuteness of the diatribe. How can it be of man to prepare the heart, when Luther affirms that all things are carried on by necessity? I answer, if the events of things be not in our power, as you say, how can it be in man to perform the causing acts? The same answer which you gave me, the same receive yourself. Nay, we are commanded to work the more for this very reason, because all things future are to us uncertain as saith Ecclesiastes, In the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening hold not thine hand. For thou knowest not which shall prosper, either this or that. Ecclesiastes 11.6 All things future, I say, are to us uncertain in knowledge, but necessary in event. The necessity strikes into us a fear of God, that we presume not or become secure, while the uncertainty works in us a trusting, that we sink not in despair. Section 125. But the diatribe returns to harping upon its old string, that in the book of Proverbs many things are said in confirmation of free will, as this, Commit thy works unto the Lord. Do thou hear this, says the diatribe, thy works. Many things in confirmation? What, because there are in that book many imperative and conditional verbs? and pronouns of the second person? For it is upon these foundations that you build your proof of the freedom of the will. Thus commit, therefore thou canst commit thy works, therefore thou doest them. So also this passage, I am thy God, Isaiah 41.10, you will understand thus, that is, thou makest me thy God. Thy faith hath saved thee, Luke 7.50. Do you hear this word thy? Therefore expound it thus. Thou makest thy faith, and then you have proved free will. Nor am I merely game-making, but I am showing the diatribe that there is nothing serious on its side of the subject. This passage also in the same chapter, The Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. Proverbs 16.4 It modifies by its own words, and excuses God as having never created a creature evil as though I had spoken concerning the creation, and not rather concerning that continual operation of God upon the things created, in which operation God acts upon the wicked, as we have before shown in the case of Pharaoh. But he creates the wicked not by creating wickedness, or a wicked creature, which is impossible, but from the operation of God a wicked man is made, or created, from a corrupt seed, not from the fault of the maker, but from that of the material. Nor does that of, The heart of the king is in the Lord's hand, he inclineth it whithersoever he will, Proverbs 21.1, seem to the diatribe to imply force. He who inclines, it observes, does not immediately compel. As though we were speaking of compulsion, and not rather concerning the necessity of immutability. And that is implied in the inclining of God, which inclining is not so snoring and lazy a thing as the diatribe imagines. But, is that most active operation of God which a man cannot avoid or alter, but under which he has of necessity such a will as God has given him, and such as he carries along by his motion, 
as I have before shown. Moreover, where Solomon is speaking of the king's heart, the diatribe thinks that the passage cannot rightly be strained to apply in a general sense, but that the meaning is the same as that of Job, where he says in another place, He maketh the hypocrite to reign, because of the sins of the people. At last, however, it concedes that the king is inclined unto evil by God, but so that he permits the king to be carried away by his inclination in order to chastise the people. I answer, whether God permit or whether he incline, that permitting or inclining does not take place without the will and operation of God, because the will of the king cannot avoid the action of the omnipotent God seeing that the will of all is carried along just as he wills and acts, whether that will be good or evil. And as to my having made out of the particular will of the king a general application, I did it, I presume, neither vainly nor unskillfully. For if the heart of the king, which seems to be of all the most free, and to rule over others, cannot will good but where God inclines it, how much less can any other among men will good? And this conclusion will stand valid, drawn not from the will of a king only, but from that of any other man. For if any one man, how private soever he be, cannot will before God but where God inclines, the same must be said of all men. Thus in the instance of Balaam, his not being able to speak what he wished is an evident argument from the scriptures that man is not in his own power, nor a free chooser and doer of what he does. Were it not so, no examples of it could subsist in the scriptures. End of section 125§ 126-134 through 134 of The Bondage of the Will by Martin Luther, translated by Henry Cole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Discussion second part concluded. § 126 The diatribe after this, having said that many such testimonies as Luther collects may be collected out of the book of Proverbs, but which, by a convenient interpretation, may stand both for and against free will, adduces at last that Achillean and invincible weapon of Luther, Without me ye can do nothing, and so forth. John 15.5 I, too, must laud that notable champion disputant for free will, who teaches us to modify the testimonies of Scripture just as it serves our turn by convenient interpretations, in order to make them appear to stand truly in confirmation of free will, that is, that they might be made to prove not what they ought, but what we please, and who merely pretends a fear of one Achillean scripture, that the silly reader, seeing this one overthrown, might hold all the rest in utter contempt. But I will just look on and see, by what force the full-mouthed and heroic diatribe will conquer my Achilles, which hitherto has never wounded a common soldier, nor even a Thersites, but has never miserably dispatched itself with its own weapons. Catching hold of this one word, nothing, it stabs it with many words and many examples, and by means of a convenient interpretation brings it to this, that nothing may signify that which is in degree and imperfect. That is, it means to say, in other words, that the sophists have hitherto explained this passage thus, Without me you can do nothing, that is, perfectly. This gloss, which has been long worn out and obsolete, the diatribe by its own power of rhetoric renders new, and so presses it forward as though it had first invented it, and it had never been heard before, thus making it appear to be a sort of miracle. In the meantime, however, it is quite self-secure, thinking nothing about the text itself, nor what precedes or follows it, whence alone the knowledge of the passage is to be obtained. But to say no more about its having attempted to prove by so many words and examples that the term nothing may in this passage be understood as meaning that which is in a certain degree, or imperfect, as though we were disputing whether or not it may be, 
whereas what was to be proved is whether or not it ought to be so understood. The whole of this grand interpretation affects nothing if it affects anything but this, the rendering of this passage of John uncertain and obscure. And no wonder, for all that the diatribe aims at is to make the scriptures of God in every place obscure, to the intent that it might not be compelled to use them, and the authorities of the ancients certain, to the intent that it might abuse them, a wonderful kind of religion truly, making the words of God to be useless, and the words of man useful. Section 127 But it is most excellent to observe how well this gloss nothing may be understood to signify that which is, in degree, consists with itself. Yet the diatribe says that in this sense of the passage it is most true that we can do nothing without Christ, because he is speaking of evangelical fruits, which cannot be produced but by those who remain in the vine, which is Christ. Here the diatribe itself confesses that fruit cannot be produced but by those who remain in the vine and it does the same in that convenient interpretation, by which it proves that nothing is the same as in degree and imperfect. But perhaps its own adverb, cannot, ought also to be conveniently interpreted, so as to signify that evangelical fruits can be produced without Christ in degree and imperfectly, so that we may preach that the ungodly who are without Christ can, while Satan reigns in them and wars against Christ, produce some of the fruits of life, that is, that the enemies of Christ may do something for the glory of Christ. But away with these things. Here, however, I should like to be taught, how are we to resist heretics, who, using this rule throughout the Scriptures, may contend that nothing and not are to be understood as signifying that which is imperfect. Thus, without him nothing can be done, that is, a little. The fool hath said in his heart there is not a God, that is, there is an imperfect God. He hath made us, and not we ourselves, that is, we did a little towards making ourselves. And who can number all the passages in the scripture where nothing and not are found? Shall we then here say that a convenient interpretation is to be attended to? And is this clearing up difficulties, to open such a door of liberty to corrupt minds and deceiving spirits? Such a license of interpretation is, I grant, convenient to you who care nothing whatsoever about the certainty of the Scripture. But as for me, who labor to establish consciences, this is an inconvenience than which nothing can be more inconvenient, nothing more injurious, nothing more pestilential. Hear me, therefore, thou great conqueress of the Lutheran Achilles. Unless you shall prove that nothing, not only may be, but ought to be understood as signifying a little, you have done nothing by all this profusion of words or examples but fight against fire with dry straw. What have I to do with your may be, which only demands of you to prove your ought to be? And if you do not prove that, I stand by the natural and grammatical signification of the term, laughing both at your armies and at your triumphs. Where is now that probable opinion, which determined that free will can will nothing good? But perhaps the convenient interpretation comes in here, to say that nothing good signifies something good, a kind of grammar and logic never before heard of, that nothing is the same as something which with logicians is an impossibility, because they are contradictions. Where now then remains that article of our faith, that Satan is the prince of the world, and, according to the testimonies of Christ and Paul, rules in the wills and minds of those men who are his captives and servants? Shall that roaring lion, that implacable and ever-restless enemy of the grace of God and the salvation of man, suffer it to be that man, his slave, and a part of his kingdom, should attempt good, by any motion, in any degree, whereby he might escape from his tyranny, and that he should not rather spur and urge him on to will and to do the contrary to grace with all his powers, especially when the just and those who are led by the Spirit of God and who will and do good can hardly resist him, so great is his rage against them. 
you who make it out that the human will is a something placed in a free medium and left to itself, certainly make it out at the same time that there is an endeavor which can exert itself either way, because you make both God and the devil to be at a distance, spectators only, as it were, of this mutable and free will, though you do not believe that they are impellers and agitators of that bondage will, the most hostily opposed to each other. Admitting, therefore, this part of your faith only, my sentiment stands firmly established, and free will lies prostrate, as I have shown already. For it must either be that the kingdom of Satan in man is nothing at all, and thus Christ will be made to lie, or, if his kingdom be such as Christ describes, free will must be nothing but a beast of burden, the captive of Satan, which cannot be liberated unless the devil be first cast out by the finger of God. From what has been advanced, I presume, friend Diatribe, thou fully understandest what that is, and what it amounts to, where thy author, detesting the obstinate way of assertion in Luther, is accustomed to say, Luther indeed pushes his cause with plenty of scriptures, but they may all by one word be brought to nothing. Who does not know that all scriptures may by one word be brought to nothing? I knew this full well before I ever heard the name of Erasmus. But the question is whether it be sufficient to bring a scripture by one word to nothing. The point in dispute is whether it be rightly brought to nothing, and whether it ought to be brought to nothing. Let a man consider these points, and he will then see whether or not it be easy to bring scriptures to nothing, and whether or not the obstinacy of Luther be detestable. He will then see that not one word only is ineffective, but all the gates of hell cannot bring them to nothing. Section 128 What, therefore, the diatribe cannot do in its affirmative, it will do in the negative, and though I am not called upon to prove the negative, yet I will do it here, and will make it by the force of argument undeniably appear that nothing in this passage not only may be but ought to be understood as meaning not a certain small degree, but that which the term naturally signifies. And this I will do in addition to that invincible argument by which I am already victorious, namely, that all terms are to be preserved in their natural signification and use, unless the contrary shall be proved, which the diatribe neither has done nor can do. First of all, then, I will make that evidently manifest, which is plainly proved by scriptures neither ambiguous nor obscure, that Satan is by far the most powerful and crafty prince of this world, as I said before, under the reigning power of whom the human will being no longer free nor in its own power, but the servant of sin and of Satan, can will nothing but that which its prince wills, and he will not permit it to will anything good. Though, even if Satan did not reign over it, sin itself, of which man is the slave, would sufficiently harden it to prevent it from willing good. Moreover, the following part of the context itself evidently proves the same, which the diatribe proudly sneers at, although I have commented upon it very copiously in my assertions. For Christ proceeds thus, John 15.6, Whoso abideth not in me is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. This, I say, the diatribe, in a most excellent rhetorical way, passed by, hoping that the intent of this evasion would not be comprehended by the shallow-brained Lutherans. But here you see that Christ, who is the interpreter of his own similitude of the vine and the branch, plainly declares what he would have understood by the term nothing, that man who is without Christ is cast forth and is withered. And what can the being cast forth and withered signify but the being delivered up to the devil, and becoming continually worse and worse, and surely becoming worse and worse is not doing or attempting anything good. The withering branch is more and more prepared for the fire the more it withers, and had not Christ himself thus amplified and applied this similitude, no one would have dared so to amplify and apply it. It stands manifest, therefore, that nothing ought, in this place, to be understood in its proper signification, according to the nature of the term. 
section 129. Let us now consider the examples also by which it proves that nothing signifies in some places a certain small degree, in order that we may make it evident that the diatribe is nothing, and affects nothing in this part of it, in which, though it should do much, yet it would affect nothing. Such a nothing is the diatribe in all things and in every way. It says, Generally, he is said to do nothing who does not achieve that at which he aims, and yet, for the most part, he who attempts it makes some certain degree of progress in the attempt. I answer, I never heard this general usage of the term. You have invented it by your own license. The words are to be considered according to the subject matter, as they say, and according to the intention of the speaker. No one calls that nothing, which he does in attempting, nor does he then speak of the attempt, but of the effect. It is to this the person refers when he says he does nothing, or he effects nothing, that is, achieves and accomplishes nothing. But supposing your example to stand good, which, however, it does not, it makes more for me than for yourself, for this is what I maintain and would invincibly establish, that free will does many things which nevertheless are nothing before God. What does it profit, therefore, to attempt, if it affect nothing at which it aims? So that, let the diatribe turn which way it will, it only runs against and confutes itself, which generally happens to those who undertake to support a bad cause. With the same unhappy effect does it adduce that example out of Paul, Neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God who giveth the increase. 1 Corinthians 3, 7. That, says the diatribe, which is of the least moment and useless of itself, he calls nothing. Who? Do you pretend to say that the ministry of the word is of itself useless and of the least moment? when Paul everywhere, and especially in Second Corinthians 3, 6-9, highly exalts it, and calls it the ministration of life and of glory? Here again you neither consider the subject matter nor the intention of the speaker. As to the gift of the increase, the planter and the waterer are certainly nothing, but as to the planting and sowing they are not nothing, seeing that to teach and to exhort are the greatest work of the Spirit in the Church of God. This is the intended meaning of Paul, and this his words convey with satisfactory plainness. But be it so that this ridiculous example stands good, again it stands in favor of me. For what I maintain is this, that free will is nothing, that is, is useless of itself as you expound it before God. And it is concerning its being nothing as to what it can do of itself that we are now speaking. For as to what it essentially is in itself, we know that an impious will must be a something, and cannot be a mere nothing. Section 130. There is also that of 1 Corinthians 13.2. If I have not charity, I am nothing. Why the diatribe adduces this as an example, I cannot see, unless it seeks only numbers and forces, or thinks that we have no arms at all by which we can effectually wound it. For he who is without charity is truly and properly nothing before God. The same also we say of free will. Wherefore, this example also stands for us against the diatribe. Or can it be that the diatribe does not yet know the argument ground upon which I am contending? I am not speaking about the essence of nature, but the essence of grace, as they term it. I know that free will can, by nature, do something. It can eat, drink, beget, rule, and so forth. Nor need the diatribe laugh at me as having prating frenzy enough to imply, when I press home so closely the term nothing, that free will cannot even sin without Christ. Whereas Luther nevertheless says that free will can do nothing but sin. But so it pleases the wise diatribe to play the fool in a matter so serious. For I say that man without the grace of God remains nevertheless under the general omnipotence of the acting God, who moves and carries along all things of necessity in the course of his infallible motion. But that the man's being thus carried along is nothing, that is, avails nothing in the sight of God, nor is considered anything else but sin. Thus in grace 
he that is without love, is nothing. Why then does the diatribe, when it confesses itself that we are here speaking of evangelical fruits, as that which cannot be produced without Christ, turn aside immediately from the subject point, harp upon another string, and cavil about nothing but natural works and human fruits? except it be to evince that he who is devoid of the truth is never consistent with himself. So also that of John 3.27, a man can receive nothing except it were given him from above. John is here speaking of man who is now a something, and denies that this man can receive anything, that is, the spirit with his gifts, for it is in reference to that he is speaking, not in reference to nature. For he did not want the diatribe as an instructor to teach him that man has already eyes, nose, ears, mouth, hands, mind, will, reason, and all things that belong to man. Unless the diatribe believes that the Baptist, when he made mention of man, was thinking of the chaos of Plato, the vacuum of Leucippus, or the infinity of Aristotle, or some other nothing which, by a gift from heaven, should at least be made a something. Is this producing examples out of the scripture, thus to trifle designedly in a matter so important? And to what purpose is all that profusion of words, where it teaches us that fire, the escape from evil, the endeavor after good, and other things are from heaven, as though there were any one who did not know, or who denied those things? We are now talking about grace, and, as the diatribe itself said, concerning Christ and evangelical fruits, whereas it is itself making out its time in fabling about nature, thus dragging out the cause and covering the witless reader with a cloud. In the meantime, it does not produce one single example as it professed to do, wherein nothing is to be understood as signifying some small degree. Nay, it openly exposes itself as neither understanding nor caring what Christ or grace is, nor how it is that grace is one thing and nature another, when even the sophists of the meanest rank know, and have continually taught this difference in their schools in the most common way. Nor does it all the while see that every one of its examples make for me and against itself, for the word of the Baptist goes to establish this, that man can receive nothing unless it be given him from above, and that therefore free will is nothing at all. Thus it is then that my Achilles is conquered. The diatribe puts weapons into his hand by which it is itself dispatched, naked and weaponless. And thus it is also that the scriptures by which that obstinate asserter Luther urges his cause are by one word brought to nothing. Section 131 after this, it enumerates a multitude of similitudes, by which it affects nothing but the drawing aside the witless reader to irrelevant things, according to its custom, and at the same time leaves the subject point entirely out of the question. Thus, God indeed preserves the ship, but the mariner conducts it into harbor. Wherefore the mariner does not do nothing. This similitude makes a difference of work, that is, it attributed that of preserving to God and that of conducting to the mariner. And thus, if it prove anything, it proves this, that the whole work of preserving is of God, and the whole work of conducting of the mariner. And yet, it is a beautiful and apt similitude. Thus again, the husbandman gathers in the increase, but it was God that gave it. Here again, it attributes different operations to God and to man, unless it mean to make the husbandman the creator also, who gave the increase. But even supposing the same works be attributed to God and to man, what do these similitudes prove? Nothing more than that the creature co-operates with the operating God. But are we now disputing about co-operation, and not rather concerning the power and operation of free will, as of itself? Whither, therefore, has the renowned rhetorician betaken himself? He set out with a professed design to dispute concerning a palm, whereas all his discourses have been about a gourd. A noble vase was designed by the potter. Why, then, is a pitcher produced at last? I also know very well that Paul co-operates with God in teaching the Corinthians, 
while he preaches without and God teaches within, and that where their works are different, and that in like manner he co-operates with God while he speaks by the Spirit of God, and that where the work is the same. For what I assert and contend for is this, that God, where he operates without the grace of his Spirit, works all in all, even in the ungodly, while he alone moves, acts on, and carries along by the motion of his omnipotence all those things which he alone has created, which motion those things can neither avoid nor change, but of necessity follow and obey, each one according to the measure of power given of God. Thus all things, even the ungodly, cooperate with God. On the other hand, when he acts by the Spirit of his grace on those whom he has justified, that is, in his own kingdom, he moves and carries them along in the same manner, and they, as they are the new creatures, follow and cooperate with him, or rather, as Paul saith, are led by him. Romans 8, 14, and 30. But the present is not the place for discussing these points. We are not now considering what we can do in cooperation with God, but what we can do of ourselves, that is, whether, created as we are out of nothing, we can do or attempt anything of ourselves under the general motion of God's omnipotence, whereby to prepare ourselves unto the new creation of the Spirit. This is the point to which Erasmus ought to have answered, and not to have turned aside to something else. What I have to say upon this point is this. As man, before he is created man, does nothing and endeavors nothing toward his being made a creature, and as, after he is made and created, he does nothing and endeavors nothing toward his preservation, or towards his continuing in his creature existence, but each takes place alone by the will of the omnipotent power and goodness of God, creating us and preserving us without ourselves, but as God nevertheless does not work in us without us, seeing we are for that purpose created and preserved, that he might work in us, and that we might cooperate with him, whether it be out of his kingdom under his general omnipotence, or in his kingdom under the peculiar power of his spirit. So man, before he is regenerated into the new creation of the kingdom of the spirit, does nothing and endeavors nothing towards his new creation into that kingdom and after he is recreated, does nothing and endeavors nothing towards his perseverance in that kingdom. But the Spirit alone affects both in us, regenerating us and preserving us when regenerated without ourselves. As James saith, Of his own will begat he us by the word of his power, that we should be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. James 1.18, where he speaks of the renewed creation. Nevertheless, he does not work in us without us, seeing that he has for this purpose created and preserved us, that he might operate in us, and that we might cooperate with him. Thus by us he preaches, shows mercy to the poor, and comforts the afflicted. But what is hereby attributed to free will? Nay, what is there left of it but nothing at all? And in truth it is nothing at all. Section 132. Read, therefore, the diatribe in this part through five or six times, and you will find that, by similitudes of this kind, and by some of the most beautiful passages and parables selected from the Gospel and from Paul, it does nothing else but show us that innumerable passages, as it observes, are to be found in the Scriptures which speak of the cooperation and assistance of God, from which, if I should draw this conclusion, Man can do nothing without the assisting grace of God, therefore no works of man are good. It would, on the contrary, conclude, as it has done by a rhetorical inversion, Nay, there is nothing that man cannot do by the assisting grace of God, therefore all the works of man can be good. For as many passages as there are in the Holy Scriptures which make mention of assistance, so many are there which confirm free will, and they are innumerable. Therefore, if we go by the number of testimonies, the victory is mine. Do you think the diatribe could be sober, or in its right senses, when it wrote this? For I cannot attribute it to malice or iniquity, unless it be that it designed to effectually wear me out by perpetually wearying me, 
while thus ever like itself it is continually turning aside to something contrary to its professed design but if it is pleased thus to play the fool in a matter so important then i will be pleased to expose its voluntary fooleries publicly in the first place i do not dispute nor am i ignorant that all the works of man may be good if they be done by the assisting grace of god and moreover that there is nothing which a man might not do by the assisting grace of god but i cannot feel enough surprise at your negligence who having set out with the professed design to write upon the power of free will go on writing about the power of grace and moreover dare to assert publicly as if all men were posts or stones that free will is established by those passages of scripture which exalt the grace of god and not only dare to do that but even to sound forth encomiums on yourself as a victor most gloriously triumphant from this very word and act of yours i truly perceive what free will is and what the effect of it is it makes men mad for what i ask can it be in you that talks at this rate but free will but just listen to your own conclusions the scripture commends the grace of god therefore it proves free will it exalts the assistance of the grace of god therefore it establishes free will by what kind of logic did you learn such conclusions as these on the contrary why not conclude thus grace is preached therefore free will has no existence the assistance of grace is exalted therefore free will is abolished for to what extent is grace given is it for this that free will as being of sufficient power itself might proudly display and sport grace on fair days as a superfluous ornament wherefore i will invert your order of reasoning and though no rhetorician will establish a conclusion more firm than yours as many places as there are in the holy scriptures which make mention of assistance so many are there which abolish free will and they are innumerable therefore if we are to go by the number of testimonies the victory is mine for grace is therefore needed and the assistance of grace is therefore given because free will can of itself do nothing as erasmus himself has asserted according to that probable opinion that free will cannot will anything good therefore when grace is commended and the assurance of grace declared the impotency of free will is declared at the same time this is a sound inference a firm conclusion against which not even the gates of hell will ever prevail section 133 here i bring to a conclusion the defense of my scriptures which the diatribe attempted to refute lest my book should be swelled to too great a bulk and if there be anything yet remaining that is worthy of notice it shall be taken into the following part wherein i make my assertions for as to what erasmus says in his conclusion that if my sentiments stand good the numberless precepts the numberless threatenings the numberless promises are all in vain and no place is left for merit or demerit for rewards or punishments that moreover it is difficult to defend the mercy nay even the justice of god if god damn sinners of necessity and that many other difficulties follow which have so troubled some of the greatest men as even to utterly overthrow them to all these things i have fully replied already nor will i receive or bear with that moderate medium which erasmus would with a good intention i believe recommend to me that we should grant some certain little to free will in order that the contradictions of the scripture and the difficulties before mentioned might be the more easily remedied for by this moderate medium the matter is not bettered nor is any advantage gained whatever because unless you ascribe the whole and all things to free will as the pelagians do the contradictions in the scriptures are not altered merit and reward are taken entirely away the mercy and justice of god are abolished and all the difficulties which we try to avoid by allowing this certain little ineffective power to free will remains just as they were before as i have already fully shown therefore we must come to the plain extreme deny free will altogether and ascribe all unto god thus there will be in the scriptures no contradictions 
and if there be any difficulties they will be borne with, where they cannot be remedied. Section 134. This one thing, however, my friend Erasmus, I entreat of you. Do not consider that I conduct this cause more according to my temper than according to my principles. I will not suffer it to be insinuated that I am hypocrite enough to write one thing and believe another. I have not, as you say of me, been carried so far by the heat of defensive argument as to deny here free will altogether for the first time, having conceded something to it before. Confident I am that you can find no such concession anywhere in my works. There are questions and discussions of mine extant, in which I have continued to assert, down to this hour, that there is no such thing as free will, that it is a thing formed out of an empty term, which are the words I have there used. And I then thus believed and thus wrote as overpowered by the force of truth, when called and compelled to the discussion. And as to my always conducting discussions with ardor, I acknowledge my fault, if it be my fault. Nay, I greatly glory in this testimony which the world bears of me in the cause of God, and may God himself confirm the same testimony in the last day. Then, who more happy than Luther to be honored with the universal testimony of his age that he did not maintain the cause of truth lazily nor deceitfully, but with a real, if not too great, ardor? Then shall I be blessedly clear from that word of Jeremiah, Cursed be he that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully. Jeremiah 48.10 But if I seem to be somewhat more severe than usual upon your diatribe, pardon me. I do it not from a malignant heart, but from concern, because I know that by the weight of your name you greatly endanger this cause of Christ, though by your learning, as to real effect, you can do nothing at all. And who can always so temper his pen as never to grow warm? For even you, who from a show of moderation grow almost cold in this book of yours, not unfrequently hurl a fiery and gall-dipped dart, so much so that if the reader were not very liberal and kind, he could not but consider you virulent. But, however, this is nothing to the subject point. We must mutually pardon each other in these things for we are but men, and there is nothing in us that is not touched with human infirmity. End of section 134 Sections 135 through 145 of The Bondage of the Will by Martin Luther Translated by Henry Cole This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Discussion, third part. We are now arrived at the last part of this discussion, wherein I am, as I propose, to bring forward my forces against free will. But I shall not produce them all, for who could do that within the limits of this small book, when the whole scripture in every letter and iota stands on my side? Nor is there any necessity for so doing, seeing that free will already lies vanquished and prostrate under a twofold overthrow, the one where I have proved that all those things which it imagined made for itself made directly against itself, the other where I have made it manifest that those scriptures which it attempted to refute still remain invincible. If, therefore, it had not been vanquished by the former, it is enough if it be laid prostrate by the one weapon or the other. And now, what need is there that the enemy, already dispatched by the one weapon or the other, should have his dead body stabbed with a number of weapons more? In this part, therefore, I shall be as brief as the subject will allow, and from such numerous armies I shall produce only two champion generals with a few of their legions, Paul and John the Evangelist. Section 135. Paul writing to the Romans, thus enters upon his argument against free will and for the grace of God. The wrath of God, saith he, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Romans 1.18 Dost thou hear this general sentence, against all men? That they are all under the wrath of God. And what is this but declaring that they all merit wrath and punishment? 
for he assigns the cause of the wrath against them. They do nothing but that which merits wrath, because they are all ungodly and unrighteous, and hold the truth in unrighteousness. Where is now the power of free will, which can endeavor anything good? Paul makes it to merit the wrath of God, and pronounces it ungodly and unrighteous. That, therefore, which merits wrath and is ungodly, only endeavors and avails against grace, not for grace. But someone will here laugh at the yawning inconsiderateness of Luther, for not looking fully into the intention of Paul. Someone will say that Paul does not here speak of all men, nor of all their doings, but of those only who are ungodly and unrighteous, and who, as the words themselves describe them, hold the truth in unrighteousness, but that it does not hence follow that all men are the same. Here I observe that in this passage of Paul the words against all ungodliness of men are of the same import as if you should say against the ungodliness of all men. For Paul, in almost all these instances, uses a Hebraism, so that the sense is, all men are ungodly and unrighteous, and hold the truth in unrighteousness, and therefore all merit wrath. Hence, in the Greek there is no relative which might be rendered, of those who, but an article, causing the sense to run thus, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, holding the truth in unrighteousness, so that this may be taken as an epithet, as it were, applicable to all men as holding the truth in unrighteousness, even as it is an epithet where it is said, Our Father which art in heaven, which might in other words be expressed thus, Our Heavenly Father, or Our Father in heaven for it is so expressed to distinguish those who believe and fear God. But these things might appear frivolous and vain. Did not the very train of Paul's argument require them to be so understood, and prove them to be true? For he had said just before, The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Romans 1.16 These words are surely neither obscure or ambiguous, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That is, the gospel of the power of God is necessary unto all men, that believing in it they might be saved from the wrath of God revealed. Does he not, then, I pray you, who declares that the Jews who excelled in righteousness in the law of God and in the power of free will are without difference, destitute and in need of the power of God, by which they might be saved, and who makes that power necessary unto them, consider that they are all under wrath? What men, then, will you pretend to say are not under the wrath of God, when you are thus compelled to believe that the most excellent men in the world, the Jews and Greeks, were so? And further, whom among the Jews and Greeks themselves will you accept, when Paul subjects all of them, included in the same word, without difference, to the same sentence? And are we to suppose that there were no men out of these two most exalted nations who aspired to what was meritoriously good? Were there none among them who thus aspired with all the powers of their free will? Yet Paul makes no distinction on this account. He includes them all under wrath, and declares them all to be ungodly and unrighteous. And are we not to believe that all the other apostles, each one according to the work he had to do, included all other nations under this wrath, in the same way of declaration? Section 136. This passage of Paul, therefore, stands firmly and forcibly, urging that free will, even in its most exalted state, in the most exalted men, who were endowed with the law, righteousness, wisdom, and all the virtues, was ungodly and unrighteous, and merited the wrath of God or the argument of Paul amounts to nothing. And if it stand good, his division leaves no medium, for he makes those who believe the gospel to be under the salvation, and all the rest to be under the wrath of God. He makes the believing to be righteous, and the unbelieving to be ungodly, unrighteous, and under wrath. For the whole that he means to say is this, the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel, that it might be by faith. But God would be wanting in wisdom if he should reveal righteousness unto men when they either knew it already 
or had some seeds of it in themselves. Since, however, he is not wanting in wisdom, and yet reveals unto men the righteousness of salvation, it is manifest that free will, even in the most exalted of men, not only has wrought and can work no righteousness, but does not even know what is righteousness before God, unless you mean to say that the righteousness of God is not revealed unto these most exalted of men, but to the most vile. But the boasting of Paul is quite the contrary, that he is a debtor both to the Jews and to the Greeks, to the wise and to the unwise, to the Greeks and to the barbarians. Wherefore Paul, comprehending in this passage all men together in one mass, concludes that they are all ungodly, unrighteous, and ignorant of the righteousness of faith. So far is it from possibility that they can will or do anything good. And this conclusion is moreover confirmed from this, that God reveals the righteousness of faith to them as being ignorant and sitting in darkness. Therefore of themselves they know it not. And if they be ignorant of the righteousness of salvation, they are certainly under wrath and damnation. Nor can they extricate themselves therefrom, nor endeavor to extricate themselves. For how can you endeavor, if you know neither what you are to endeavor after, nor in what way, nor to what extent you are to endeavor? Section 137. With this conclusion, both the thing itself and experience agree. For show me one of the whole race of mankind, be he the most holy and most just of all men, unto whose mind it ever came that the way unto righteousness and salvation was to believe in him who is both God and man, who died for the sins of men and rose again, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father, that he might still the wrath of God the Father, which Paul here says is revealed from heaven. Look at the most eminent philosophers, what ideas had they of God? What have they left behind them in their writings concerning the wrath to come? Look at the Jews instructed by so many wonders and so many successive prophets. What did they think of this way of righteousness? They not only did not receive it, but so hated it that no nation under heaven has more atrociously persecuted Christ unto this day. And who would dare to say that in so great a people there was not one who cultivated free will, and endeavored with all its powers. How comes it to pass, then, that they all endeavor in the directly opposite, and that that which was the most excellent and the most excellent of men not only did not follow this way of righteousness, not only did not know it, but even thrust it from them with the greatest hatred, and wished to away with it when it was published and revealed? So much so, that Paul saith, this way was to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Gentiles foolishness. 1 Corinthians 1.23 Since, therefore, Paul speaks of the Jews and Gentiles without difference, and since it is certain that the Jews and Gentiles comprehend the principal nations under heaven, it is hence certain that free will is nothing else than the greatest enemy to righteousness and the salvation of man. For it is impossible but that there must have been some among the Jews and Gentile Greeks who wrought and endeavored with all the powers of free will, and yet by all that endeavoring did nothing but carry on a war against grace. Do you therefore now come forward and say what free will can endeavor towards good, when goodness and righteousness themselves are a stumbling block unto it, and foolishness? Nor can you say that this applies to some and not all. Paul speaks of all without difference, where he says, To the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Gentiles foolishness. Nor does he accept any but believers. To us, saith he, who are called, and saints, it is the power of God and the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 1.24 He does not say to some Gentiles, to some Jews, but plainly to the Gentiles and to the Jews who are not of us. Thus, by a manifest division, separating the believing from the unbelieving, and leaving no medium whatever. And we are now speaking of Gentiles as working without grace, to whom Paul saith, The righteousness of God is foolishness, and they abhor it. This is that meritorious endeavor of free will towards good. Section 138 See, moreover, 
whether Paul himself does not particularize the most exalted among the Greeks, where he saith that the wisest among them became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, that they became wise in their own conceits, that is, by their subtle disputations. Romans 1, 21. Does he not here, I pray you, touch that which was the most exalted and most excellent in the Greeks, when he touches their imaginations? For these comprehend their most sublime and exalted thoughts and opinions, which they considered as solid wisdom. But he calls that their wisdom, as well in other places, foolishness, as here vain imagination, which by its endeavouring only became worse, till at last they worshipped an idol in their own darkened hearts, and proceeded to the other enormities which he afterwards enumerates. If, therefore, the most exalted and devoted endeavours and works in the most exalted of the nations be evil and ungodly, what shall we think of the rest, who are, as it were, the commonalty and the vilest of the nations? Nor does Paul here make any difference between those who are the most exalted, for he condemns all the devotedness of their wisdom without any respect of persons. And if he condemn their very works and devoted endeavours, he condemns those who exert them, even though they strive with all the powers of free will. Their most exalted endeavour, I say, is declared to be evil. How much more, then, the persons themselves who exert it? So also, just afterwards, he rejects the Jews without any difference, who are Jews in the letter and not in the spirit. Thou, saith he, honourest God in the letter and in the circumcision. Again, he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. Romans 1, 27-29 What can be more manifest than the division here made? The Jew outwardly is a transgressor of the law. And how many Jews must we suppose there were without the faith, who were men the most wise, the most religious, the most honourable, who aspired unto righteousness and truth with all the devotion of endeavour? Of these the Apostle continually bears testimony, that they had a zeal of God, that they followed after righteousness, that they strove day and night to attain unto salvation, that they lived blameless, and yet they are transgressors of the law, because they are not Jews in the Spirit, nay, they determinately resist the righteousness of faith. What conclusion then remains to be drawn but that free will is then the worst when it is the best, and that the more it endeavours, the worse it becomes, and the worse it is. The words are plain. The division is certain. Nothing can be said against it. Section 139 But let us hear Paul, who is his own interpreter. In the third chapter, drawing up, as it were, a conclusion, he saith, What, then, are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. Romans 3, nine. Where is now free will? All, saith he, both Jews and Greeks are under sin. Are there any tropes or difficulties here? What would the invented interpretations of the whole world do against this all-clear sentence? He who says all accepts none. And he who describes them all as being under sin that is, the servants of sin, leaves them no degree of good whatever. But where has he given this proof, that they are all, both Jews and Gentiles, under sin? Nowhere but where I have already shown, namely, where he saith, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. This he proves to them afterwards from experience, showing them, that being hated of God, they were given up to so many vices, in order that they might be convinced from the fruits of their ungodliness, that they willed and did nothing but evil. And then he judges the Jews also separately, where he saith that the Jew in the letter is a transgressor of the law, which he proves in like manner from the fruits, and from experience, saying, Thou who declarest that a man should not steal, stealest thyself and thou who abhorrest idols, committest sacrilege, thus accepting none whatever but those who are Jews in the Spirit. Section 140 
But let us see how Paul proves his sentiments out of the Holy Scriptures, and whether the passages which he adduces are made to have more force in Paul than they have in their own places. As it is written, saith he, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are altogether become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one, and so forth. Romans 3, 10-23 through 23. Here, let him that can produce his convenient interpretation, invent tropes, and pretend that the words are ambiguous and obscure. Let him that dares defend free will against these damnable doctrines. Then I will at once give up all and recant, and will myself become a confessor and asserter of free will. It is certain that these words apply to all men, for the prophet introduces God as looking down from heaven upon men, and pronouncing this sentence upon them. So also Psalm 14, 2 through 3. God looked down from heaven upon the children of men, to see if there were any that did understand and seek after God. But they are all gone out of the way, and so forth. And that the Jews might not imagine that this did not apply to them, by anticipation, and asserts that it applied to them most particularly, saying, We know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law. Romans 3.19 and his intention is the same where he saith, To the Jew first, and also to the Greek. You hence hear that all the sons of men, all that are under the law, that is, the Gentiles as well as the Jews, are accounted before God ungodly, not understanding, not seeking after God, no, not even one of them, being all gone out of the way and become unprofitable, and surely among all the children of men, and those who are under the law, those must also be numbered who are the best and most laudable, who aspire after that which is meritorious and good with all the powers of free will, and those also of whom the diatribe boasts as having the sense and certain seeds of good implanted in them, unless it means to contend that they are the children of angels. How then can they endeavor toward good, who are all, without exception, ignorant of God, and neither regard nor seek after God? How can they have a power able to attain unto good, who all, without exception, decline from good, and become utterly unprofitable? Are not the words most clear? And do they not declare this, that all men are ignorant of God and despise God, and then turn unto evil and become unprofitable unto good? For Paul is not here speaking of the ignorance of seeking food, or the contempt of money, but of the ignorance and contempt of religion and of godliness. And that ignorance and contempt most undoubtedly are not in the flesh, that is, as you interpret it, the inferior and grosser affections, but in the most exalted and most noble powers of men, in which righteousness, godliness, the knowledge and reverence of God ought to reign, that is, in the reason and in the will, and thus in the very power of free will, in the very seed of good, in that which is the most excellent in man. Where are you now, friend Erasmus, you who promised that you would freely acknowledge that the most excellent faculty in man is flesh, that is, ungodly, if it should be proved from the Scriptures? Acknowledge now, then, when you hear that the most excellent faculty in man is not only ungodly, but ignorant of God, existing in the contempt of God, turned to evil, and unable to turn towards good. For what is it to be unrighteous but for the will, which is one of the most noble faculties in man, to be unrighteous? What is it to understand nothing either of God or good, but for the reason, which is another of the most noble faculties in man? to be ignorant of God and good, that is, to be blind to the knowledge of godliness. What is it to be gone out of the way, and to have become unprofitable, but for men to have no power in one single faculty, and the least power in their most noble faculties, to turn unto good, but only to turn unto evil? What is it not to fear God, but for men to be in all their faculties, and most of all in their noblest faculties, contemners of all the things of God, of his words, 
his works, his laws, his precepts, and his will. What then can reason propose that is right, who is thus blind and ignorant? What can the will choose that is good, which is thus evil and impotent? Nay, what can the will pursue, where the reason can propose nothing but the darkness of its own blindness and ignorance? And where the reason is thus erroneous, and the will averse, what can the man either do or attempt that is good? Section 151 But perhaps someone may here sophistically observe, Though the will be gone out of the way, and the reason be ignorant as to the perfection of the act, yet the will can make some attempt, and the reason can attain to some knowledge by its own powers, seeing that we can attempt many things which we cannot perfect. And we are here speaking of the existence of a power, not of the perfection of the act. I answer. The words of the prophet comprehend both the act and the power. For his saying, Man seeks not God, is the same as if he had said, Man cannot seek God, which you may collect from this. If there were a power or ability in man to will good, it could not be but that, as the motion of the divine omnipotence could not suffer it to remain actionless, or to keep holiday, as I before observed, it must be moved forth into act, in some man at least, in some one man or another, and must be made manifest so as to afford an example. But this is not the case, for God looks down from heaven and does not see even one who seeks after him or attempts it. Wherefore it follows that that power is nowhere to be found which attempts, or wills to attempt, to seek after him, and that all men are gone out of the way. Moreover, if Paul be not understood to speak at the same time of impotency, his disputation will amount to nothing, for Paul's whole design is to make grace necessary unto all men, whereas if they could make some sort of beginning themselves, grace would not be necessary. But now, since they cannot make that beginning, grace is necessary. Hence you see that free will is by this passage utterly abolished, and nothing meritorious or good whatever left in man, seeing that he is declared to be unrighteous, ignorant of God, a contemner of God, averse to God, and unprofitable in the sight of God. And the words of the prophet are sufficiently forcible, both in their own place and in Paul who adduces them. Nor is it an inconsiderable assertion when men are said to be ignorant of and to despise God. For these are the fountain springs of all iniquities, the sink of all sins, and the hell of all evils. What evil is there not where there are ignorance and contempt of God? In a word, the whole kingdom of Satan in men could not be defined in fewer or more expressive words than by saying, They are ignorant of and despise God. For there is unbelief, there is disobedience, there is sacrilege, there is blasphemy against God, there is cruelty and a want of mercy towards our neighbor, there is the love of self in all the things of God and man. Here you have a description of the glory and power of free will. Section 142 Paul, however, proceeds and testifies that he now expressly speaks with reference to all men, and to those more especially who are the greatest and most exalted, saying that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world become guilty before God, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Romans 3, 19-20 How, I pray you, shall every mouth be stopped, if there be still a power remaining by which we can do something? For one might then say to God, that which is here in the world is not altogether nothing. There is that here which you cannot damn, even that to which you yourself gave the power of doing something. The mouth of this at least will not be stopped, for it cannot be obnoxious to you. For if there be any sound power in free will, and it be able to do something, to say that the whole world is obnoxious to or guilty before God is false. For that power whose mouth is not to be stopped cannot be an inconsiderable thing, or a something in one small part of the world only, but a thing most conspicuous and most general throughout the whole world. 
or if its mouth be to be stopped, then it must be obnoxious to and guilty before God, together with the whole world. But how can it rightly be called guilty, if it be not unrighteous and ungodly, that is, meriting punishment and vengeance? Let your friends, I pray you, find out by what convenient interpretation that power of man is to be cleared from this charge of guilt, by which the whole world is declared guilty before God, or by what contrivance it is to be accepted from being comprehended in the expression, all the world. These words, they are all gone out of the way. There is none righteous, no, not one, are mighty thunderclaps and riving thunderbolts. They are in reality that hammer breaking the rock in pieces mentioned by Jeremiah, by which is broken in pieces everything that is not in one man only, nor in some men, nor in a part of men, but in the whole world, no one man being accepted, so that the whole world ought at those words to tremble, to fear, and to flee away. For what words more awful or fearful could be uttered than these? The whole world is guilty. All the sons of men are turned out of the way, and become unprofitable. There is no one that fears God. There is no one that is not unrighteous. There is no one that understandeth. There is no one that seeketh after God. Nevertheless, such ever has been, and still is, the hardness and insensible obstinacy of our hearts, that we never should of ourselves hear or feel the force of these thunderclaps or thunderbolts, but should, even while they were sounding in our ears, exalt and establish free will with all its powers in defiance of them, and thus in reality fulfill that of Malachi 1.4, They build, but I will throw down. With the same power of words also is this said, By the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. By the deeds of the law is a forcible expression, as is also this, the whole world, and this, all the children of men. For it is to be observed that Paul abstains from the mention of persons, and mentions their ways only, that is, that he might comprehend all persons, and whatever in them is most excellent. Whereas if he had said, the commonalty of the Jews, or the Pharisees, or certain of the ungodly are not justified, he might have seemed to leave some accepted, who from the power of free will in them, and by a certain aid from the law, were not altogether unprofitable. But now, when he condemns the works of the law themselves, and makes them unrighteous in the sight of God, it becomes manifest that he condemns all who were mighty in a devoted observance of the law and of works. And none devotedly observe the law and the works, but the best and most excellent among them. Nor did they thus observe them, but with their best and most exalted faculties, that is, their reason and their will. If, therefore, those who exercise themselves in the observance of the law and of works, with all the devoted strivings and endeavorings, both of reason and of will, that is, with all the power of free will, and who were assisted by the law as a divine aid, and were instructed out of it, and roused to exertion by it, if, I say, these are condemned of impiety, because they are not justified, and are declared to be flesh in the sight of God, what then will there be left in the whole race of mankind which is not flesh, and which is not ungodly? For all are condemned alike who are of the works of the law, and whether they exercise themselves in the law with the utmost devotion, or moderate devotion, or with no devotion at all, it matters nothing. None of them could do anything but work the works of the law, and the works of the law do not justify. And if they do not justify, they prove their workmen to be ungodly, and leave them so. And if they be ungodly, they are guilty, and merit the wrath of God. These things are so clear, that no one can open his mouth against them. Section 143 But many elude and evade Paul by saying that he here calls the ceremonial works works of the law, which works after the death of Christ were dead. I answer, this is that notable error and ignorance of Jerome, which, although Augustine strenuously resisted it, yet by the withdrawing of God and the prevailing of Satan, has found its way throughout the world, and has continued down to this day. 
by means of which it has come to pass that it has been impossible to understand Paul, and the knowledge of Christ has consequently been obscured. Therefore, if there had been no other error in the church, this one might have been sufficiently pestilent and powerful to destroy the gospel. For which Jerome, if peculiar grace did not interpose, has deserved hell rather than heaven. So far am I from daring to canonize him, or call him a saint. But, however, it is not truth that Paul is here speaking of the ceremonial works only. For if that be the case, how will his argument stand good, whereby he concludes that all are unrighteous and need grace? But perhaps you will say, Be it so that we are not justified by the ceremonial works, yet one might be justified by the moral works of the Decalogue. By this syllogism of yours, then, you have proved that to such grace is not necessary. If this be the case, how very useful must that grace be, which delivers us from the ceremonial works only, the easiest of all works which may be extorted from us through mere fear or self-love. And this, moreover, is erroneous, that ceremonial works are dead and unlawful since the death of Christ. Paul never said any such thing. He says that they do not justify, and that they profit the man nothing in the sight of God, so as to make him free from unrighteousness. Holding this truth any one may do them, and yet do nothing that is unlawful. Thus, to eat and to drink are works which do not justify or recommend us to God, and yet he who eats and drinks does not therefore do that which is unlawful. These men err also in this. The ceremonial works were as much commanded and exacted in the old law and in the Decalogue as the moral works, and therefore the latter had neither more nor less force than the former. For Paul is here speaking principally to the Jews, as he saith Romans 1. Wherefore, let no one doubt that by the works of the law here all the works of the whole law are to be understood. For if the law be abrogated and dead, they cannot be called the works of the law, for an abrogated or dead law is no longer a law, and that Paul knew full well. Therefore he does not speak of the law abrogated when he speaks of the works of the law, but of the law in force and authority. Otherwise, how easy would it have been for him to say, The law is now abrogated, and then he would have spoken openly and clearly. But let us bring forward Paul himself who is the best interpreter of himself. He saith, Galatians 3.10, As many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law, to do them. You see that Paul here, where he is urging the same point as he is in his epistle to the Romans, and in the same words, speaks, wherever he makes mention of the works of the law, of all the laws that are written in the book of the law. And what is still more worthy of remark, Paul himself cites Moses, who curses those that continue not in the law, whereas he himself curses those who are of the works of the law, thus adducing a testimony of a different scope from that of his own sentiment, the former being in the negative, the latter in the affirmative. But this he does because the real state of the case is such in the sight of God that those who are the most devoted to the works of the law are the farthest from fulfilling the law, as being without the Spirit, who only is the fulfiller of the law, which such may attempt to fulfill by their own powers, but they will effect nothing after all. Wherefore both declarations are true, that of Moses, that they are accursed who continue not in the works of the law, and that of Paul, that they are accursed who are of the works of the law. For both characters of persons require the Spirit, without which the works of the law, how many and excellent soever they may be, justify not, as Paul saith. Wherefore, neither character of persons continue in all things that are written, as Moses saith. Section 144. In a word, Paul, by this division of his, fully confirms that which I maintain. For he divides law-working men into two classes, those who work after the Spirit and those who work after the flesh, leaving no medium whatever. He speaks thus, By the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. 
Romans 3.20. What is this but saying, that those whose works profit them not, work the works of the law without the Spirit, as being themselves flesh, that is, unrighteousness and ignorant of God? So Galatians 3.2, making the same division, he saith, Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Again, Romans 3.21. But now the righteousness of God is manifest without the law. And again, Romans 3.28, We conclude, therefore, that a man is justified by faith without the works of the law. From all which it is manifest and clear that in Paul the Spirit is set in opposition to the works of the law, as well as to all other things which are not spiritual, including all the powers of and everything pertaining to the flesh so that the meaning of Paul is evidently the same as that of Christ, John 3, 6, that everything which is not of the Spirit is flesh, be it ever so precious, holy, and great. Nay, be they works of the divine law the most excellent, and wrought by all the powers imaginable. For the Spirit of Christ is wanting, without which all things are nothing short of being damnable. Let it then be a settled point, that Paul, by the works of the law, means not the ceremonial works, but the works of the whole law. Then this will be a settled point also, that in the works of the law everything is condemned that is without the Spirit. And without the Spirit is that power of free will. For that is the point in dispute, that most exalted faculty in man. For to be of the works of the law is the most exalted state in which man can be. The Apostle, therefore, does not say who are of sins and of ungodliness against the law, but who are of the works of the law, that is, who are the best of men and the most devoted to the law, and who are, in addition to the power of free will, even assisted, that is, instructed and roused into action by the law itself. If, therefore, free will, assisted by the law and exercising all its powers in the law, profit nothing and justify not, but be left in sin and in the flesh, what must we suppose it able to do when left to itself without the law? By the law, saith Paul, is the knowledge of sin, Romans 3.20. Here he shows how much and how far the law profits, that free will is of itself so blind that it does not even know what is sin, but has need of the law for its teacher. And what can that man do towards taking away sin, who does not even know what is sin? All that he can do is to mistake that which is sin for that which is no sin, and that which is no sin for that which is sin. And this experience sufficiently proves. How does the world, by the medium of those whom it accounts the most excellent and the most devoted to righteousness and piety, hate and persecute the righteousness of God preached in the gospel, and brand it with the name of heresy, error, and every opprobrious appellation, while it boasts of and sets forth its own works and devices, which are really sin and error, as righteousness and wisdom. By this scripture, therefore, Paul stops the mouth of free will, where he teaches that by the law its sin is discovered unto it, of which sin it was before ignorant. So far is he from conceding to it any power whatever to attempt that which is good. Section 145 And here is solved that question of the diatribe so often repeated throughout its book. If we can do nothing, to what purpose are so many laws, so many precepts, so many threatenings, and so many promises? Paul here gives an answer. By the law is the knowledge of sin. His answer is far different from that which would enter the thoughts of man or of free will. He does not say, By the law is proved free will, because it cooperates with it unto righteousness. For righteousness is not by the law, but by the law is the knowledge of sin. Seeing that the effect, the work, in the office of the law is to be a light to the ignorant and the blind, such a light as discovers to them disease, sin, evil, death, hell, and the wrath of God, though it does not deliver from these but shows them only. And when a man is thus brought to a knowledge of the disease of sin, he is cast down, is afflicted, nay, despairs. The law does not help him, much less can he help himself. 
another light is necessary, which might discover to him the remedy. This is the voice of the gospel, revealing Christ as the deliverer from all these evils. Neither free will nor reason can discover him. And how should it discover him, when it is itself dark and devoid even in the light of the law, which might discover to it its disease, which disease in its own light it seeth not, but believes it to be sound health? So also in Galatians 3, treating on the same point, he saith, Wherefore then serveth the law? To which he answers, not as the diatribe does, in a way that proves the existence of free will, but he saith, it was added because of transgressions, until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Galatians 3.19 He saith, because of transgressions, not, however, to restrain them as Jerome dreams, for Paul shows that to take away and to restrain sins by the gift of righteousness was that which was promised to the seed to come, but to cause transgressions to abound, as he saith Romans 5.20. The law entered that sin might abound. Not that sins were not committed and did not abound without the law, but they were not known to be transgressions and sins of such magnitude. For the most and greatest of them were considered to be righteousnesses. And while sins are thus unknown, there is no place for remedy or for hope, because they will not submit to the hand of the healer, considering themselves to be whole, and not to want a physician. Therefore the law is necessary, which might give the knowledge of sin, in order that he who is proud and whole in his own eyes, being humbled down into the knowledge of the iniquity and greatness of his sin, might groan and breathe after the grace that is laid up in Christ. Only observe, therefore, the simplicity of the words, By the law is the knowledge of sin. And yet, these alone are of force sufficient to confound and overthrow free will altogether. For if it be true that, of itself, it knows not what is sin and what is evil, as the Apostle saith here, and Romans 7, 7-8, I should not have known that concupiscence was sin, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. How can it ever know what is righteousness and good? And if it know not what righteousness is, how can it endeavor to attain unto it? We know not the sin in which we were born, in which we live, in which we move and exist, and which lives, moves, and reigns in us. How then should we know that righteousness which is without us, and which reigns in heaven? These works bring that miserable thing, free will, to nothing, nothing at all. End of section 145§ 146-155 through 155 of The Bondage of the Will by Martin Luther Translated by Henry Cole This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Discussion, third part, continued. § 146 The state of the case, therefore, being thus, Paul speaks openly with full confidence and authority, saying, But now the righteousness of God is manifest without the law, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe in him. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and are without the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation for sin, through faith in his blood, and so forth. Romans 3, 22-26 here Paul speaks forth very thunderbolts against free will. First, he saith, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Here he marks the distinction between the righteousness of God and the righteousness of the law, because the righteousness of faith comes by grace without the law. His saying without the law can mean nothing else but that Christian righteousness exists without the works of the law inasmuch as the works of the law avail nothing and can do nothing towards the attainment unto it. As he afterwards saith, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Romans 3.28 The same also he had said before, By the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. 
Romans 3.20. From all which it is most clearly manifest that the endeavor and desire of free will are a nothing at all. For if the righteousness of God exist without the law, and without the works of the law, how shall it not much rather exist without free will? especially since the most devoted effort of free will is to exercise itself in moral righteousness, or the works of that law from which its blindness and impotency derive their assistance. This word without, therefore, abolishes all moral works, abolishes all moral righteousness, abolishes all preparations unto grace. In a word, scrape together everything you can as that which pertains to the ability of free will, and Paul will stand invincibly, saying, The righteousness of God is without it. But to grant that free will can, by its endeavor, move itself in some direction, we will say, unto good works, or unto the righteousness of the civil or moral law. Yet it is not moved toward the righteousness of God. Nor does God in any respect allow its devoted efforts to be worthy unto the attainment of this righteousness. For he saith that his righteousness availeth without the works of the law. If, therefore, it cannot move itself unto the attainment of the righteousness of God, what will it be profited if it move itself by its own works and endeavors unto the attainment of, if it were possible, the righteousness of angels? Here, I presume, the words are not obscure or ambiguous, nor is any place left for tropes of any kind. Here. Paul distinguishes most manifestly the two righteousnesses, assigning the one to the law, the other to grace, and declares that the latter is given without the former, and without its works, and that the former justifies not nor avails anything without the latter. I should like to see, therefore, how free will can stand or be defended against these scriptures. Section 147. Another thunderbolt is this. The Apostle saith that the righteousness of God is manifested and avails unto all and upon all them that believe in Christ, and that there is no difference. Romans 3, 21-22 Here again he divides in the clearest words the whole race of men into two distinct divisions. To the believing he gives the righteousness of God, but takes it from the unbelieving. Now, no one, I suppose, will be madman enough to doubt whether or not the power or endeavor of free will be a something that is not faith in Christ Jesus. Paul then denies that anything which is not this faith is righteousness before God. And if it be not righteousness before God, it must be sin. For there is with God no medium between righteousness and sin, which can be, as it were, a neuter, neither righteousness nor sin. Otherwise the whole argument of Paul would amount to nothing, for it proceeds wholly upon this distinct division, that whatever is done and carried on by men must be in the sight of God either righteousness or sin, righteousness if done in faith, sin if faith be wanting. With men indeed things pass thus. All cases in which men in their intercourse with each other neither owe anything as a due, nor do anything as a free benefit, are called medium and neuter. But here the ungodly man sins against God, whether he eat or whether he drink, or whatever he do, because he abuses the creature of God by his ungodliness and perpetual ingratitude, and does not at any one moment give glory to God from his heart. Section 148. This also is no powerless thunderbolt, where the Apostle says, All have sinned and are without the glory of God, for there is no difference. Romans 3.23 What, I pray you, could be spoken more clearly? Produce one of your free-will workmen and say to me, Does this man sin in his endeavor? If he does not sin, why does not Paul accept him? Why does he include him also without difference? Surely he that saith all accepts no one in any place at any time, in any work or endeavor. If, therefore, you accept any man for any kind of devoted desire or work, you make Paul a liar, because he includes that free will workman or striver among all the rest, and in all that he saith concerning them. Whereas Paul should have had some respect for this person, and not have numbered him among the general herd of sinners. There is also that part where he saith, that they are without the glory of God. 
You may understand the glory of God here two ways, actively and passively. For Paul writes thus from his frequent use of Hebraisms, The glory of God, understood actively, is the glory by which God glories in us. Understood passively, it is that glory by which we glory in God. But it seems to me proper to understand it now passively. So the faith of Christ is, according to the Latin, the faith which Christ has. But according to the Hebrew, the faith of Christ is the faith which we have in Christ. So also the righteousness of God signifies, according to the Latin, the righteousness which God has. But according to the Hebrews, it signifies the righteousness which we have from God and before God. Thus also the glory of God we understand according to the Latin, not according to the Hebrew, and receive it as signifying the glory which we have from God and before God, which may be called our glory in God. And that man glories in God who knows to a certainty that God has a favor unto him, and deigns to look upon him with kind regard, and that whatever he does pleases God, and what does not please him is borne with by him and pardoned. If, therefore, the endeavor or desire of free will be not sin, but good before God, it can certainly glory. And in that glorying say with confidence, This pleases God, God favors this, God looks upon and accepts this, or at least bears with it and pardons it. For this is the glorying of the faithful in God, and they that have not this are rather confounded before God. But Paul here denies that these men have this, saying that they are all entirely without this glory. This also experience itself proves. Put the question to all the exercises of free will to a man, and see if you can show me one who can honestly, and from his heart, say of any one of his devoted efforts and endeavors, This pleases God. If you can bring forward a single one, I am ready to acknowledge myself overthrown, and to cede to you the palm. But I know there is not one to be found. And if this glory be wanting, so that the conscience dares not say to a certainty and with confidence, This pleases God, it is certain that it does not please God. For as a man believes, so it is unto him, because he does not to a certainty believe that he pleases God which nevertheless it is necessary to believe. For to doubt of the favor of God is the very sin itself of unbelief, because he will have it believed with the most assuring faith that he is favorable. Therefore I have convinced them upon the testimony of their own conscience, that free will, being without the glory of God, is, with all its powers, its devoted strivings and endeavors, perpetually under the guilt of the sin of unbelief. And what will the advocates of free will say to that which follows, being justified freely by his grace? Romans 3.24 What is the meaning of the word freely? What is the meaning of by his grace? How will merit and endeavor accord with freely given righteousness? But perhaps they will say here that they attribute to free will a very little indeed, and that which is by no means the merit of worthiness meritum condignum. These, however, are mere empty words, for all that is sought for in the defense of free will is to make place for merit. This is manifest, for the diatribe has throughout argued and expostulated thus, If there be no freedom of will, how can there be place for merit? And if there be no place for merit, how can there be place for reward? To whom will a reward be assigned if justification be without merit? Paul here gives you an answer, that there is no such thing as merit at all, but that all who are justified are justified freely, that is, that this is ascribed to no one but to the grace of God. And when this righteousness is given, the kingdom and life eternal are given with it. Where is your endeavoring now? Where is your devoted effort? Where are your works? Where are your merits of free will? Where is the profit of them all put together? You cannot here make, as a pretense, obscurity and ambiguity. The facts and the works are most clear and most plain. But be it so that they attribute to free will a very little indeed, yet they teach us that by that very little we can attain unto righteousness and grace. 
nor do they solve that question, Why does God justify one and leave another, in any other way than by asserting the freedom of the will, and saying, Because the one endeavors and the other does not, and God rewards the one for his endeavoring, and despises the other for his not endeavoring, lest if he did otherwise he should appear to be unjust. And notwithstanding all their pretense, both by their tongue and pen, that they do not profess to attain unto grace by the merit of worthiness, meritum condignum, nor call it the merit of worthiness, yet they only mock us with a term, and hold fast their tenet all the while. For what is the amount of their pretense that they do not call it the merit of worthiness, if nevertheless they assign unto it all that belongs to the merit of worthiness, saying that he in the sight of God attains unto grace who endeavours, and he who does not endeavour does not attain unto it? Is this not plainly making it to be the merit of worthiness? Is it not making God a respecter of works, of merits, and of persons, to say that one is devoid of grace from his own fault because he did not endeavour after it, but that another, because he did endeavour after it, has attained unto grace, unto which he would not have attained if he had not endeavoured after it? If this be not the merit of worthiness, then I should like to be informed what it is that is called the merit of worthiness. In this way you may play a game of mockery upon all words, and say, It is not indeed the merit of worthiness, but is in effect the same as the merit of worthiness. The thorn is not a bad tree, but is in effect the same as a bad tree. The fig is not a good tree, but is in effect the same as a good tree. The diatribe is not indeed impious, but says and does nothing but what is impious. Section 149. It has happened to these asserters of free will, according to the old proverb, Striving dire Scylla's rock to shun, they gainst Charybdis headlong run. For, devotedly striving to dissent from the Pelagians, they begin to deny the merit of worthiness whereas by the very way in which they deny it, they establish it more firmly than ever. They deny it by their word and pen, but establish it in reality, and in heart sentiment. And thus they are worse than the Pelagians themselves, and that on two accounts. First, the Pelagians plainly, candidly, and ingenuously asserted the merit of worthiness, thus calling a boat a boat, and a fig a fig and teaching what they really think. Whereas our free-will friends, while they think and teach the same thing, yet mock us with lying words and false appearances, as though they dissented from the Pelagians, when the fact is quite the contrary. So that, with respect to their hypocrisy, they seem to be the Pelagians' strongest opposers, but with respect to the reality of the matter, and their heart tenet, they are twice-dipped Pelagians. And next, under this hypocrisy, they estimate and purchase the grace of God at a much lower rate than the Pelagians themselves. For these assert that it is not a certain little something in us by which we attain unto grace, but whole, full, perfect, great, and many devoted efforts and works. Whereas our friends declare that it is a certain little something, almost a nothing, by which we deserve grace. If, therefore, there must be error, they err with more honesty and less pride, who say that the grace of God is purchased at a great price, and who account it dear and precious, than those who teach that it may be purchased at that which is very little and inconsiderable, and who account it cheap and contemptible. But, however, Paul pounds both in pieces in one mortar, by one word, where he saith that all are justified freely, and again that they are justified without the law, and without the works of the law. And he who asserts that the justification must be free in all who are justified, leaves none excepted who work, deserve, or prepare themselves. He leaves no work which can be called merit of congruity or merit of worthiness. And by the one hurling of this thunderbolt, he dashes in pieces both the Pelagians with their whole merit and the sophists with their very little merit for a free justification allows of no workman, because a free gift and a work preparation are manifestly in opposition to each other. Moreover, the being justified through grace will not allow of respect unto the worthiness of any person, 
as the Apostle saith also afterwards, chapter 11, if by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. Romans 11.6. He saith the same also. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Romans 4.4. 4. Wherefore my Paul stands an invincible destroyer of free will, and lays prostrate two armies by one word. For if we be justified without works, all works are condemned, whether they be very little or very great. He accepts none, but thunders alike against all. Section 150. Here you may see the yawning inconsiderateness of all our friends, and what it profits a man to rely upon the ancient fathers, who have been approved through the series of so many ages. Were they not also all alike, blind to, nay, rather, did they not disregard the most clear and most manifest words of Paul? Pray, what is there that can be spoken clearly and plainly in defense of grace against free will, if the argument of Paul be not clear and plain? He proceeds with a glow of argument, and exalts grace against works, and that in words the most clear and most plain, saying that we are justified freely, and that grace is no more grace if it be sought by works, thus most manifestly excluding all works in the matter of justification, to the intent that he might establish grace only and free justification. And yet we in all this light still seek after darkness, and when we cannot ascribe unto ourselves great things and all things, we endeavor to ascribe unto ourselves a something in degree, a very little, merely that we might maintain our tenet that justification through the grace of God is not free and without works. As though he who declares that greater things and all things profit us nothing unto justification, does not much more deny that things in degree and things very little profit us nothing also, particularly when he has settled the point that we are justified by grace alone, without any works whatever, and therefore without the law itself, in which are comprehended all works, great and little, works of congruity and works of worthiness. Go now then and boast of the authorities of the ancients, and depend on what they say, all of whom you see to a man disregarded Paul, that most plain and most clear teacher, and as it were purposely shunned this morning star, yea, this sun rather, because being wrapped up in their own carnal reason, they thought it absurd that no place should be left to merit. Section 151. Let us now bring forward that example of Abraham, which Paul afterwards adduces. If, saith he, Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Romans 4, 2-3. Mark here again, I pray you, the distinction of Paul, where he is showing the twofold righteousness of Abraham. The one is of works, that is, moral and civil. But he denies that he was justified by this before God, even though he were justified by it before men. Moreover, by that righteousness he hath whereof to glory before men, but is all the while himself without the glory of God nor can any one here say that they are the works of the law or of ceremonies which are here condemned, seeing that Abraham existed so many years before the law. Paul plainly speaks of the works of Abraham, and those his best works, for it would be ridiculous to dispute whether or not any one were justified by evil works. If, therefore, Abraham be righteous by no works whatever, and if both he himself and all his works be left under sin, unless he be clothed with another righteousness, even with the righteousness of faith, it is quite manifest that no man can do anything by works toward his becoming righteous. And moreover, that no works, no devoted efforts, no endeavors of free will avail anything in the sight of God, but are all judged to be ungodly, unrighteous, and evil. For if the man himself be not righteous, neither will his works or endeavors be righteous. And if they be not righteous, they are damnable, and merit wrath. The other righteousness is that of faith, 
which consists not in any works, but in the favor and imputation of God through grace. And mark how Paul dwells upon the word imputed, how he urges it, repeats it, and inculcates it. Now, saith he, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth in him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Romans 4, 4-5 four according to the purpose of the gift of God. Then he adduces David, saying the same thing concerning the imputation through grace. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin, and so forth. Romans 4, 6-8. In this chapter he repeats the word impute above ten times. In a word he distinctly sets forth him that worketh and him that worketh not, leaving no medium between them. He declares that righteousness is not imputed to him that worketh, but asserts that righteousness is imputed to him that worketh not, if he believe. Here is no way by which free will, with its devoted efforts and endeavors, can escape or get off. It must be numbered with him that worketh, or with him that worketh not. If it be numbered with him that worketh, you hear that righteousness is not imputed unto it. If it be numbered with him that worketh not, but believeth in God, righteousness is imputed unto it. And then it will not be the power of free will, but the new creature by faith. But if righteousness be not imputed unto it, being him that worketh, then it becomes manifest that all its works are nothing but sin, evils, and impieties before God. Nor can any sophist here snarl and say that although man be evil, yet his work may not be evil. For Paul speaks not of the man simply, but of him that worketh, to the very intent that he might declare in the plainest words that the works and devoted efforts themselves of man are condemned, whatever they may be, by what name soever they may be called, or under what form soever they may be done. He here also speaks of good works, because the points of his argument are justification and merits. And when he speaks of him that worketh, he speaks of all workers and of all their works, but more especially of their good and meritorious works. Otherwise his distinction between him that worketh and him that worketh not will amount to nothing. Section 152. I here omit to bring forward those all-powerful arguments drawn from the purpose of grace, from the promise, from the force of the law, from original sin, and from the election of God of which there is no one that would not of itself utterly overthrow free will. For if grace come by the purpose of God, or by election, it comes of necessity, and not by any devoted efforts or endeavor of our own, as I have already shown. Moreover, if God promised grace before the law, as Paul argues here, and in his epistle to the Galatians also, then it does not come by works or by the law. Otherwise it would be no longer a promise. And so also faith, if works were of any avail, would come to nothing, by which nevertheless Abraham was justified before the law was given. Again, as the law is the strength of sin, and only discovers sin, but does not take it away, it brings the conscience in guilty before God. This is what Paul means when he saith, The law worketh wrath. Romans 4.15 how then can it be possible that righteousness should be obtained by the law? And if we derive no help from the law, how can we derive any help from the power of free will alone? Moreover, since we all lie under the same sin and damnation of the one man Adam, how can we attempt anything which is not sin and damnable? For when he saith all, he accepts no one, neither the power of free will nor any workman, whether he work or work not, attempt or attempt not, he must of necessity be included among the rest in the all. Nor should we sin or be damned by that one sin of Adam, if the sin were not our own. For who could be damned for the sin of another, especially in the sight of God? Nor is the sin ours by imitation, or by working. For this would not be the one sin of Adam, because then it would not be the sin which he committed but which we committed ourselves. It becomes our sin by generation, but of this in some other place, 
Original sin itself, therefore, will not allow of any other power in free will, but that of sinning and going on unto damnation. These arguments, I say, I omit to bring forward, both because they are most manifest and most forcible, and because I have touched upon them already. For if I wished to produce all those parts of Paul which overthrow free will, I could not do better than go through it with a continued commentary on the whole of his epistle, as I have done on the third and fourth chapters, on which I have dwelt thus particularly, that I might show all our free will friends their yawning inconsiderateness, who so read Paul in these all clear parts, as to see anything in them but these most powerful arguments against free will, and that I might expose the folly of that confidence which they place in the authority and writings of the ancient teachers, and leave them to consider with what force the remaining most clear arguments must make against them if they should be handled with care and judgment. Section 153. As to myself, I must confess, I am more than astonished, that when Paul so often uses those universally applying words, all, none, not, not one, without, thus they are all gone out of the way, there is none that doeth good, no, not one, all are sinners and condemned by the one sin of Adam, we are justified by faith without the law, without the works of the law, so that if any one wished to speak otherwise so as to be more intelligible, he could not speak in words more clear and more plain. I am more than astonished, I say, how it is that words and sentences contrary and contradictory to these universally applying words and sentences have gained so much ground, which say, Some are not gone out of the way, are not unrighteous, are not evil, are not sinners, are not condemned. There is something in man which is good, and which endeavors after good, as though that man, whoever he be, who endeavors after good, were not comprehended in this one word, all, or none, or not. I could find nothing, even if I wished it, to advance against Paul, or to reply in contradiction to him, but should be compelled to acknowledge that the power of my free will, together with its endeavors, is comprehended in those alls and nuns, of whom Paul here speaks. If, that is, no new kind of grammar or new manner of speech were introduced. Moreover, if Paul had used this mode of expression once, or in one place only, there might have been room for imagining a trope, or for taking hold of and twisting some detached terms, whereas he uses it perpetually, both in the affirmative and in the negative and so expresses his sentiments by his argument and by his distinctive division in every place and in all parts, that not the nature of his words only and the current of his language, but that which follows and that which precedes, the circumstances, the scope, and the very body of the whole disputation, all compel us to conclude according to common sense that the meaning of Paul is that out of the faith of Christ there is nothing but sin and damnation. It was thus that we promised we would refute free will, so that all our adversaries should not be able to resist, which, I presume, I have effected, even though they shall not so far acknowledge themselves vanquished, as to come over to my opinion, or to be silent. For that is not in my power. That is the gift of the Spirit of God. Section 154 But, however, before we hear the evangelist John, I will just add the crowning testimony from Paul, and I am prepared, if this be not sufficient, to oppose Paul to free will by commenting upon him throughout. Where he divides the human race into two distinctive divisions, flesh and spirit, he speaks thus, They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit do mind the things of the spirit. Romans 8, 5. As Christ also does, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. John 3, 6. That Paul here calls all carnal, who are not spiritual, is manifest, both from the division itself and the opposition of spirit to flesh, and from the very words of Paul himself, where he adds, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. 
Romans 8, 9. What else is the meaning of, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of Christ dwell in you, but that those who have not the Spirit are necessarily in the flesh? And if any man be not of Christ, what else is he but of Satan? It is manifest, therefore, that those who are devoid of the Spirit are in the flesh, and under Satan. Now let us see what his opinion is concerning the endeavor and the power of free will in the carnal, who are in the flesh. They cannot please God. Again, the carnal mind is death. Again, the carnal mind is enmity against God. And again, it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Romans 8, 5 through 8. Here, let the advocate for free will answer me. How can that endeavor towards good, which is death, which cannot please God, which is enmity against God, which is not subject to God, and cannot be subject to Him? Nor does Paul mean to say that the carnal mind is dead and inimical to God, but that it is death itself, enmity itself, which cannot possibly be subject to the law of God or please Him, as he had said just before. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did, and so forth. Romans 8.3 But I am very well acquainted with that fable of origin concerning the threefold affection, the one of which he calls flesh, the other soul, and the other spirit, making the soul that medium affection vertible either way towards the flesh or towards the spirit. But these are merely his own dreams. He speaks them forth only, but does not prove them. Paul here calls everything flesh that is without the Spirit, as I have already shown. Therefore, those most exalted virtues of the best men are in the flesh. That is, they are dead, and at enmity against God. They are not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be, and they please not God. For Paul does not only say that such men are not subject, but that they cannot be subject. So also Christ saith, An evil tree cannot bring forth good fruit. Matthew 7.17 7, And again, How can ye, being evil, speak that which is good? Matthew 12.34 Here you see, we not only speak that which is evil, but cannot speak that which is good. And though he saith in another place, that we who are evil know how to give good gifts unto our children, Matthew 6.11, Yet he denies that we do good, even when we give good gifts, because those good gifts which we give are the creatures of God. But we ourselves, not being good, cannot give those good gifts well. For he is speaking unto all men, nay, even unto his own disciples, so that these two sentiments of Paul, that the just man liveth by faith, Romans one seventeen, and that whatsoever is not of faith is sin, Romans 14.23, stand confirmed, the latter of which follows from the former. For if there be nothing by which we are justified but faith only, it is evident that those who are not of faith are not justified, and if they be not justified, they are sinners. And if they be sinners, they are evil trees, and can do nothing but sin, and bring forth evil fruit. Wherefore free will is nothing but the servant of sin, of death, and of Satan, doing nothing, and being able to do or attempt nothing but evil. Section 155 Add to this that example, Romans 10.24, taken out of Isaiah. I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not for me. He speaks this with reference to the Gentiles, that it was given unto them to hear and know Christ, when before they could not even think of him much less seek him, or prepare themselves for him by the power of free will. From this example it is sufficiently evident that grace comes so free that no thought concerning it, or attempt, or desire after it, precedes. So also Paul. When he was Saul, what did he do by that exalted power of free will? Certainly, in respect of reason, he intended that which was best and most meritoriously good. But by what endeavors did he come unto grace? He did not only not seek after it, but received it, 
even when he was furiously maddened against it. On the other hand, he saith of the Jews, The Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained unto the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained unto the law of righteousness. Romans 9, 30-31 what has any advocate for free will to mutter against this? The Gentiles, when filled with ungodliness and every vice, received righteousness freely, from a mercy showing God. While the Jews, who followed after righteousness with all their devoted effort and endeavor, are frustrated. Is this not plainly saying that the endeavor of free will is all in vain, even when it strives to do the best? and that free will of itself can only fall back and grow worse and worse? Nor can any one say that the Jews did not follow after righteousness with all the power of free will. For Paul himself bears this testimony of them, that they had a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Romans 10.2 Therefore, nothing which is attributed to free will was wanting to the Jews, and yet it attained unto nothing, nay, unto the contrary of that after which they strove. Whereas there is nothing in the Gentiles which is attributed to free will, and they attained unto the righteousness of God. And what is this but a most manifest example from each nation, and a most clear testimony of Paul, proving that grace is given freely to the most undeserving and unworthy, and is not attained unto by any devoted efforts, endeavors, or works, either small or great, of any men, be they the best and most meritorious, or even of those who have sought and followed after righteousness with all the ardor of zeal. End of section 155。Sections 156 to 168 of the Bondage of the Will by Martin Luther. Translated by Henry Cole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Discussion. Third part concluded. Section 156. Now let us come to John, who is also a most copious and powerful subverter of free will. He, at the very outset, attributes to free will such blindness that it cannot even see the light of the truth. So far is it from possibility that it should endeavor after it. He speaks thus. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. John 1, 5. And directly afterwards, He was in the world, and the world knew Him not. He came unto His own, and His own knew Him not. Verses 10-11. through 11. What do you imagine He means by world? Will you attempt to separate any man from being included in this term, but him who is born again of the Holy Spirit? The term world is very particularly used by this apostle, by which he means the whole race of men. Whatever, therefore, he says of the world is to be understood of the whole race of men. And hence, whatever he says of the world is to be understood also of free will, as that which is most excellent in man. According to this apostle, then, the world does not know the light of truth. The world hates Christ and His. The world neither knows nor sees the Holy Spirit. The whole world is settled in enmity. All that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Love not the world. Ye, saith he, are not of the world. The world cannot hate you, but it hateth me, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. All these, and many other like passages, are proclamations of what free will is, the principal part of the world, ruling the empire of Satan. For John also himself speaks of the world by antithesis, making the world to be everything in the world which is not translated into the kingdom of the Spirit. So also Christ saith to the apostles, I have chosen you out of the world and ordained you, and so forth. John fifteen sixteen. If, therefore, there were any in the world who, by the powers of free will, endeavored so as to attain unto good, which would be the case if free will could do anything, John certainly ought in reverence for these persons to have softened down the term, lest, 
by a word of such general application he should involve them in all the evils of which he condemns the world. But as he does not this, it is evident that he makes free will guilty of all that is laid to the charge of the world. Because whatever the world does, it does by the power of free will, that is, by its will and by its reason, which are its most exalted faculties. He then goes on, But as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. John 1, 12-13 Having finished this distinctive division, he rejects from the kingdom of Christ all that is of blood, of the will of the flesh, and of the will of man. By blood, I believe, he means the Jews, that is, those who wished to be the children of the kingdom, because they were the children of Abraham and of the fathers, and hence gloried in their blood. By the will of the flesh, I understand the devoted efforts of the people, which they exercised in the law and in works. For flesh here signifies the carnal without the spirit, who had indeed a will and endeavor, but who, because the spirit was not in them, were carnal. By the will of man, I understand the devoted efforts of all generally, that is, of the nations, or of any men whatever, whether exercised by the law or without the law, so that the sense is, they become the sons of God neither by the birth of the flesh, nor by a devoted observance of the law, nor by any devoted human effort whatever, but by a divine birth only. If, therefore, they be neither born of the flesh, nor brought up by the law, nor prepared by any human discipline, but are born again of God, it is manifest that free will here profits nothing. For I understand man, to signify here, according to the Hebrew manner of speech, any man, or all men, even as flesh is understood to signify, by antithesis, the people without the spirit, and the will of man I understand to signify the greatest power in men, that is, that principal part, free will. But be it so that we do not dwell thus upon the signification of the words singly, Yet the sum and substance of the meaning is most clear, that John, by this distinctive division, rejects everything that is not of divine generation, since he says that men are made the sons of God none otherwise than by being born of God, which takes place, according to his own interpretation, by believing on his name. In this rejection, therefore, the will of man, or free will, as it is not of divine generation nor faith, is necessarily included. But if free will avail anything, the will of man ought not to be rejected by John, nor ought men to be drawn away from it, and sent to faith and to the new birth only, lest that of Isaiah should be pronounced against him, Woe unto you that call good evil! Whereas now, since he rejects alike all blood, the will of the flesh, and the will of man, it is evident that the will of man avails nothing more towards making men the sons of God than blood does, or the carnal birth. And no one doubts whether or not the carnal birth makes men the sons of God, for as Paul saith, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. Romans 9, 8, which he proves by the examples of Ishmael and Esau. Section 157 the same John introduces the Baptist, speaking thus of Christ, And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. John 1.16 He says that grace is received by us out of the fullness of Christ. But for what merit or devoted effort? For grace, saith he, that is, of Christ. As Paul also saith, the grace of God, and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Romans 5.15 Where is now the endeavor of free will, by which grace is obtained? John and Paul here saith, that grace is not only not received for any devoted effort of our own, but even for the grace of another, or the merit of another, that is, of one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore it is either false that we receive our grace for the grace of another, 
or else it is evident that free will is nothing at all. For both cannot consist, that the grace of God is both so cheap that it may be obtained in common and everywhere by the little endeavor of any man, and at the same time so dear that it is given unto us only in and through the grace of one man, and he so great. And I would also that the advocates for free will be admonished in this place that when they assert free will they are deniers of Christ. For if I obtain grace by my own endeavors, what need have I of the grace of Christ for the receiving of my grace? Or what do I want when I have gotten the grace of God? For the diatribe has said, and all the sophists say, that we obtain grace and are prepared for the reception of it by our own endeavors, not, however, according to worthiness, but according to congruity. This is plainly denying Christ for whose grace the Baptist here testifies that we receive grace. For as to that fetch about worthiness and congruity, I have refuted that already, and proved it to be a mere play upon empty words, while the merit of worthiness is really intended, and that to a more impious length than ever the Pelagians themselves went, as I have already shown. And hence the ungodly sophists, together with the diatribe, have more awfully denied the Lord Christ who bought us than ever the Pelagians or any heretics have denied him. So far is it from possibility that grace should allow of any particle or power of free will. But, however, that the advocates for free will deny Christ is proved not by this scripture only, but by their own very way of life. For by their free will they have made Christ to be unto them no longer a sweet mediator, but a dreaded judge, whom they strive to please by the intercessions of the Virgin Mother, and of the saints, and also by variously invented works, by rites, ordinances, and vows, by all which they aim at appeasing Christ, in order that he might give them grace. But they do not believe that he intercedes before God and obtains grace for them by his blood and grace, as it is here said, for grace. And as they believe, so it is unto them. For Christ is in truth an inexorable judge to them, and justly so. For they leave him who is a mediator and most merciful Saviour, and account his blood and grace of less value than the devoted efforts and endeavours of their free will. Section 158. Now let us hear an example of free will. Nicodemus is a man in whom there is everything that you can desire, which free will is able to do. For what does that man omit, either of devoted effort or endeavor? He confesses Christ to be true, and to have come from God. He declares his miracles. He comes by night to hear him, and to converse with him. Does he not appear to have sought after, by the power of free will, those things which pertain unto piety and salvation? But mark what shipwreck he makes, when he hears the true way of salvation by a new birth to be taught by Christ. Does he acknowledge it, or confess that he ever sought after it? Nay, he revolts from it, and is confounded. So much so, that he does not only say he does not understand it, but heaves against it as impossible. How, says he, can these things be true? John 3, 9. And no wonder. For who ever heard that man must be born again unto salvation of water and of the Spirit? Verse 5. Who ever thought that the Son of God must be exalted, that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life? Verse 15. Did the greatest and most acute philosophers ever make mention of this? Did the princes of this world ever possess this knowledge? Did the free will of any man ever attain unto this by endeavors? Does not Paul confess it to be wisdom hidden in a mystery, foretold indeed by the prophets, but revealed by the gospel, so that it was secret and hidden from the world? In a word, ask experience, and the whole world, human reason itself, and in consequence free will itself, is compelled to confess that it never knew Christ nor heard of him before the gospel came into the world. And if it did not know him, much less could it seek after him, search for him, or endeavor to come unto him. But Christ is the way of truth, life, and salvation. It must confess, therefore, whether it will or no, 
that of its own powers it neither knew nor could seek after those things which pertain unto the way of truth and salvation. And yet, contrary to this, our own very confession and experience, like madmen, we dispute in empty words that there is in us that power remaining which can both know and apply itself unto those things which pertain unto salvation. This is nothing more or less than saying that Christ the Son of God was exalted for us when no one could ever have known it or thought of it, but that nevertheless this very ignorance is not an ignorance, but a knowledge of Christ, that is, of those things which pertain unto salvation. Do you not yet, then, see and palpably feel out that the asserters of free will are plainly mad, while they call that knowledge, which they themselves confess to be ignorance? Is this not to put darkness for light? Isaiah 5.20 But so it is, though God so powerfully stopped the mouth of free will by its own confession and experience, yet even then it cannot keep silence and give God the glory. Section 159 And now, farther, as Christ is said to be the way, the truth, and the life, John 14.6, and that by positive assertion, so that whatever is not Christ is not the way, but error, is not the truth, but a lie, is not the life, but death, it of necessity follows that free will, as it is neither Christ nor in Christ, must be bound in error, in a lie, and in death. Where now will be found that medium and neuter, that the power of free will which is not in Christ, that is, in the way, the truth, and the life, is yet not of necessity either error, or a lie, or death. For if all things which are said concerning Christ and grace were not said by positive assertion, that they might be opposed to their contraries, that is, that out of Christ there is nothing but Satan, out of grace nothing but wrath, out of the light nothing but darkness, out of the life nothing but death, what, I ask you, would be the use of all the writings of the apostles, nay, of the whole scripture. The whole would be written in vain, because they would not fix the point that Christ is necessary, which nevertheless is their especial design. And for this reason, because a medium would be found out, which of itself would be neither evil nor good, neither of Christ nor of Satan, neither true nor false, neither alive nor dead, and perhaps neither anything nor nothing and that would be called that which is most excellent and most exalted in the whole race of men. Take it, therefore, which way you will. If you grant that the Scriptures speak in positive assertion, you can say nothing for free will but that which is contrary to Christ. That is, you will say that error, death, Satan, and all evils reign in Him. If you do not grant that they speak in positive assertion, you weaken the Scriptures make them to establish nothing, not even to prove that Christ is necessary. And thus, while you establish free will, you make Christ void, and bring the whole Scripture to destruction. And though you may pretend verbally that you confess Christ, yet in reality and in heart you deny Him. For if the power of free will be not a thing erroneous altogether and damnable, but sees and wills those things which are good and meritorious, and which pertain unto salvation, it is whole, it wants not the physician Christ, nor does Christ redeem that part of man. For what need is there for light and life, when there is light and life already? Moreover, if that power be not redeemed, the best part in man is not redeemed, but is of itself good and whole. And then also God is unjust, if he damn any man, because he damns that which is the most excellent in man, and whole, that is, he damns him when innocent. For there is no man who has not free will, and although the evil man abuse this, yet this power itself, according to what you teach, is not so destroyed, but that it can and does endeavor towards good. And if it be such, it is without doubt good, holy, and just. Wherefore it ought not to be damned, but to be distinctly separated from the man who is to be damned. 
but this cannot be done, and even if it could be done, man would then be without free will, nay, he would not be man at all, he would neither have merit nor demerit, he could neither be damned nor saved, but would be completely a brute, and no longer immortal. It follows, therefore, that God is unjust, who damns that good, just, and holy power, which, though it be in an evil man, does not need Christ, as the evil man does. Section 160. But let us proceed with John. He that believeth on him, saith he, is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. John 3.18. Tell me, is free will included in the number of those that believe, or not? If it be, then again it has no need of grace, because of itself it believes on Christ, whom of itself it never knew nor thought of. If it be not, then it is judged already. And what is this but saying that it is damned in the sight of God? But God damns none but the ungodly. Therefore it is ungodly. And what godliness can that which is ungodly endeavor after? For I do not think that the power of free will can be accepted, seeing that he speaks of the whole man as being condemned. Moreover, unbelief is not one of the grosser affections, but is that chief affection, seated and ruling on the throne of the will and reason, just the same as its contrary, faith. For to be unbelieving is to deny God and to make him a liar. If we believe not, we make God a liar. 1 John 5.10 how then can that power which is contrary to God, and which makes him a liar, endeavor after that which is good? And if that power be not unbelieving and ungodly, John ought not to say of the whole man that he is condemned already, but to speak thus, Man, according to his grosser affections, is condemned already. But according to that which is best and most excellent, he is not condemned, because that endeavors after faith, or rather, is already believing. Hence, where the Scripture so often saith, All men are liars, we must, upon the authority of free will, on the contrary, say, The Scripture, rather, lies, because man is not a liar as to his best part, that is, his reason and will, but as to his flesh only, that is, his blood and his grosser part, so that that whole, according to which he is called man, that is, his reason and his will, is sound and holy. Again there is that of the Baptist, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. John 3.36 We must understand upon him thus, that is, the wrath of God abideth upon the grosser affections of the man. But upon that power of free will, that is, upon his will and his reason, abide grace and everlasting life. Hence, according to this, in order that free will might stand, whatever is in the scriptures said against the ungodly, you are, by the figure synecdoche, to twist round to apply to that brutal part of man, that the truly rational and human part might remain safe. I have, therefore, to render thanks to the assertors of free will, because I may sin with all confidence, knowing that my reason and will, or my free will, cannot be damned, because it cannot be destroyed by my sinning but forever remains sound, righteous, and holy. And thus, happy in my will and reason, I shall rejoice that my filthy and brutal flesh is distinctly separated from me and damned. So far shall I be from wishing Christ to become its Redeemer. You see here to what the doctrine of free will brings us. It denies all things, divine and human, temporal and eternal, and with all these enormities makes a laughing stock of itself. Section 161. Again the Baptist saith, A man can receive nothing, except it were given him from above. John 3.27. Let not the diatribe here produce its forces, where it enumerates all those things which we have from heaven. We are now disputing not about nature, but about grace. We are inquiring not what we are upon earth, but what we are in heaven before God. We know that man was constituted Lord over all things which are beneath himself, over which he has a right and a free will, that those things might do and obey as he wills and thinks. But
but we are now inquiring whether he has a free will over God, that he should do and obey in those things which man wills, or rather, whether God has not a free will over man, that he should will and do what God wills, and should be able to do nothing but what he wills and does. The Baptist here says that he can receive nothing except it be given him from above. Wherefore, free will must be a nothing at all. Again, he that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. John 3.31 Here again he makes all those earthly who are not of Christ, and says that they savor and speak of earthly things only. Nor does he leave any medium characters. But surely free will is not he that cometh from heaven. Wherefore it must of necessity be he that is of the earth, and that speaks of the earth, and savors of the earth. But if there were any power in man, which at any time, in any place, or by any work, did not savor of the earth, the Baptist ought to have accepted this person, and not to have said in a general way concerning all those who are out of Christ, that they are of the earth, and speak of the earth. So also afterwards Christ saith, Ye are of the world, I am not of the world. Ye are from beneath, I am from above. John 8.23 And yet, those to whom he spoke had free will, that is, reason and will. But still, he says, that they are of the world. But what news would he have told if he had merely said that they were of the world as to their grosser affections? Did not the whole world know this before? Moreover, what need was there for his saying that men were of the world as to that part in which they are brutal? For according to that, beasts are also of the world. Section 162 And now, what do those words of Christ, where he saith, No one can come unto me except my Father which hath sent me draw him, John 6.44, leave to free will? For he says it is necessary that every one should hear and learn of the Father himself, and that all must be taught of God. Here, indeed, he not only declares that the works and devoted efforts of free will are of no avail, but that even the word of the gospel itself, of which he is here speaking, is heard in vain, unless the Father himself speak within, and teach, and draw. No one can, no one can, saith he, come, by which that power whereby men can endeavor something towards Christ, that is, towards those things which pertain unto salvation, is declared to be a nothing at all. Nor does that at all profit free will, which the diatribe brings forward out of Augustine, by way of casting a slur upon this all-clear and all-powerful scripture, that God draws us in the same way as we draw a sheep, by holding out to it a green bough. By this similitude he would prove that there is in us a power to follow the drawing of God. But this similitude avails nothing in the present passage. For God holds out not one of his good things only, but many, nay, even his Son, Christ himself, and yet no man follows him, unless the Father hold him forth otherwise within, and draw otherwise. Nay, the whole world follows the Son whom he holds forth. But this similitude harmonizes sweetly with the experience of the godly, who are now made sheep, and know God their shepherd. These living in and being moved by the Spirit follow wherever God wills, and whatever he holds out to them. But the ungodly man comes not unto him, even when he hears the word, unless the Father draw and teach within, which he does by shedding abroad his Spirit. And where that is done, there is a different kind of drawing from that which is without. There Christ is held forth in the illumination of the Spirit, whereby the man is drawn unto Christ with the sweetest of all drawing, under which he is passive while God speaks, teaches, and draws, rather than seeks or runs of himself. Section 163 I will produce yet one more passage from John, where he saith, The Spirit shall reprove the world of sin, because they believe not in me. John 16.9 you here see that it is sin not to believe in Christ. And this sin is seated not in the skin, nor in the hairs of the head, 
but in the very reason and will. Moreover, as Christ makes the whole world guilty from this sin, and as it is known by experience that the world is ignorant of this sin, as much so as it is ignorant of Christ, seeing that it must be revealed by the reproof of the Spirit, it is manifest that free will, together with its will and reason, is accounted a captive of this sin, and condemned before God. Wherefore, as long as it is ignorant of Christ and believes not in Him, it can will or attempt nothing good, but necessarily serves that sin of which it is ignorant. In a word, since the Scripture declares Christ everywhere by positive assertion and by antithesis, as I said before, in order that it might subject everything that is without the Spirit of Christ to Satan, to ungodliness, to error, to darkness, to sin, to death, and to the wrath of God, all the testimonies concerning Christ must make directly against free will, and they are innumerable, yea, the whole of the Scripture. If, therefore, our subject of discussion is to be decided by the judgment of the Scripture, the victory in every respect is mine, for there is not one jot or tittle of the Scripture remaining which does not condemn the doctrine of free will altogether. But if the great theologians and defenders of free will know not or pretend not to know that the Scripture everywhere declares Christ by positive assertion and by antithesis, yet all Christians know it, and in common confess it. They know, I say, that there are two kingdoms in the world mutually militating against each other that Satan reigns in the one who on that account is by Christ called the prince of this world, John 12.31, and by Paul, the god of this world, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, who, according to the testimony of the same Paul, holds all captive according to his will, who are not rescued from him by the Spirit of Christ, nor does he suffer any to be rescued by any other power but that of the Spirit of God, as Christ testifies in the parable of the strong man armed, keeping his palace in peace. In the other kingdom Christ reigns, which kingdom continually resists and wars against that of Satan, into which we are translated not by any power of our own, but by the grace of God, whereby we are delivered from this present evil world and are snatched from the power of darkness. The knowledge and confession of these two kingdoms, which thus ever mutually war against each other with so much power and force, would alone be sufficient to confute the doctrine of free will, seeing that we are compelled to serve in the kingdom of Satan until we be liberated by a divine power. All this, I say, is known in common among Christians, and fully confessed in their proverbs, by their prayers, by their pursuits, and by their whole lives. Section 164 I omit to bring forward that truly Achillean scripture of mine, which the diatribe proudly passes by untouched. I mean that which Paul teaches, Romans 7 and Galatians 5, that there is in the saints and in the godly so powerful a warfare between the spirit and the flesh that they cannot do what they would. From this warfare I argue thus. If the nature of man be so evil, even in those who are born again of the spirit, that it does not only endeavor after good, but is even averse to it, and militates against good. How should it endeavor after good in those who are not born again of the Spirit, and who are still in the old man, and serve under Satan? Nor does Paul there speak of the grosser affections only, by means of which, as a common scapegap, the diatribe is accustomed to get out of the way of all the Scriptures. But he enumerates among the works of the flesh heresy, idolatry, contentions, divisions, and so forth, which he describes as reigning in those most exalted faculties, that is, in the reason and the will. If, therefore, flesh with these affections war against the spirit in the saints, much more will it war against God in the ungodly, and in free will. Hence Romans 8, 7, he calls it enmity against God. I should like, I say, to see this argument of mine overturned, and free will defended against it. As to myself, I openly confess that I should not wish free will to be granted me, even if it could be so, nor anything else to be left in my own hands whereby I might endeavor something toward my own salvation. 
and that not merely because in so many opposing dangers and so many assaulting devils I could not stand and hold it fast, in which state no man could be saved, seeing that one devil is stronger than all men, but because, even though there were no dangers, no conflicts, no devils, I should be compelled to labor under a continual uncertainty, and to beat the air only. Nor would my conscience, even if I should live and work to all eternity, ever come to a settled certainty, how much it ought to do in order to satisfy God. For whatever work should be done, there would still remain a scrupling, whether or not it pleased God, or whether he required anything more, as is proved in the experience of all justiciaries and as I myself learned to my bitter cost through so many years of my own experience. But now, since God has put my salvation out of the way of my will, and has taken it under his own, and has promised to save me not according to my working or manner of life, but according to his own grace and mercy, I rest fully assured and persuaded that he is faithful, and will not lie, and, moreover, great and powerful, so that no devils, no adversities can destroy him or pluck me out of his hand. No one, saith he, shall pluck them out of my hand, because my Father which gave them me is greater than all. John 10, 27-28 Hence it is certain that in this way, if all are not saved, yet some, yea, many shall be saved, whereas by the power of free will no one whatever could be saved, but all must perish together. And, moreover, we are certain and persuaded that in this way we please God, not from the merit of our own works, but from the favor of His mercy promised unto us, and that if we work less or work badly, He does not impute it unto us, but, as a Father, pardons us and makes us better. This is the glory in which all the saints have in their God. Section 165. And, if you are concerned about this, that it is difficult to defend the mercy and justice of God, seeing that He damns the undeserving, that is, those who are for that reason ungodly, because being born in iniquity they cannot by any means prevent themselves from being ungodly, and from remaining so, and being damned, but are compelled from the necessity of nature to sin and perish, as Paul saith, we all were the children of wrath, even as others, Ephesians 2, 3, when at the same time they were created such by God himself from a corrupt seed by means of the sin of Adam. Here God is to be honored and revered as being most merciful towards those whom he justifies and saves under all their unworthiness, and it is to be in no small degree ascribed unto his wisdom that he causes us to believe him to be just, even where he appears to be unjust. For if his righteousness were such that it was considered to be righteousness according to human judgment, it would be no longer divine, nor would it in anything differ from human righteousness. But as he is the one and true God, and moreover incomprehensible and inaccessible by human reason, it is right, nay, it is necessary, that his righteousness should be incomprehensible, even as Paul exclaims, saying, O oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments, and his ways past finding out! Romans 11.33 But they would be no longer past finding out, if we were in all things able to see how they were righteous. What is man compared with God? What can our power do when compared with his power? What is our strength compared with his strength? What is our knowledge compared with his wisdom? What is our substance compared with his substance? In a word, what is all that we are compared with all that he is? If then we confess, according to the teaching of nature, that human power, strength, wisdom, knowledge, substance, and all human things together are nothing when compared with the divine power, strength, wisdom, knowledge, and substance? What perverseness must it be in us to attack the righteousness and judgments of God only, and to arrogate so much to our own judgment as to wish to comprehend, judge, and rate the divine judgments? Why do we not here in like manner say at once, What, 
Is our judgment nothing when compared with the divine judgments? But ask reason herself if she is not from conviction compelled to confess that she is foolish and rash for not allowing the judgments of God to be incomprehensible, when she confesses that all the other divine things are incomprehensible. In everything else we concede to God a divine majesty, and yet are ready to deny it to his judgments. Nor can we for a little while believe that he is just, even when he promises that it shall come to pass that when he shall reveal his glory, we shall all see and palpably feel that he ever was and is just. Section 166 But I will produce an example that may go to confirm this faith, and to console that evil eye which suspects God of injustice. Behold, God so governs this corporal world in external things, that, according to human reason and judgment, you must be compelled to say, either that there is no God, or that God is unjust. As a certain one saith, I am often tempted to think that there is no God. For see the great prosperity of the wicked, and on the contrary the great adversity of the good. According to the testimony of the Proverbs, and of experience, the parent of all Proverbs, the more abandoned men are, the more successful. The tabernacles of robbers, saith Job, prosper. And Psalm 73 complains that the sinners of the world abound in riches. Is it not, I pray you, in the judgment of all, most unjust, that the evil should be prosperous and the good afflicted? Yet so it is in the events of the world. And here it is that the most exalted minds have so fallen as to deny that there is any God at all, and to fable that fortune disposes all things at random. Such were Epicurus and Pliny. And Aristotle, in order that he might make his first cause being free from every kind of misery, is of opinion that he thinks of nothing whatever but himself because he considers that it must be most irksome to him to see so many evils and so many injuries. But the prophets themselves, who believed there is a God, were tempted still more concerning the injustice of God, as Jeremiah, Job, David, Asaph, and others. And what do you suppose Demosthenes and Cicero thought, who, after they had done all they could, received no other reward than a miserable death? And yet all this which is so very much like injustice in God, when set forth in those arguments which no reason or light of nature can resist, is most easily cleared up by the light of the gospel and the knowledge of grace, by which we are taught that the wicked flourish in their bodies but lose their souls. And the whole of this insolvable question is solved in one word. There is a life after this life in which will be punished and repaid everything that is not punished and repaid here. For this life is nothing more than an entrance on and a beginning of that life which is to come. If, then, even the light of the gospel, which stands in the word and in the faith only, is able to effect so much as with ease to do away with and settle this question which has been agitated through so many ages and never solved, how do you suppose matters will appear when the light of the word and of faith shall cease, and the essential truth itself shall be revealed in the divine majesty? Do you not suppose that the light of glory will then most easily solve that question which is now insolvable by the light of the word and of grace, even as the light of grace now easily solves that question which is insolvable by the light of nature? Let us therefore hold in consideration the three lights, the light of nature, the light of grace, and the light of glory, which is the common and very good distinction. By the light of nature it is insolvable how it can be just that a good man should be afflicted and the wicked should prosper. But this is solved by the light of grace. By the light of grace it is insolvable how God can damn him who by his own powers can do nothing but sin and become guilty. Both the light of nature and the light of grace here say that the fault is not in the miserable man, but in the unjust God. Nor can they judge otherwise of that God who crowns the wicked man freely without any merit, and yet crowns not, but damns another, who is perhaps less, or at least not more, wicked. But the light of glory speaks otherwise. That will show 
that God, to whom alone belongeth the judgment of incomprehensible righteousness, is of righteousness most perfect and most manifest, in order that we may in the meantime believe it, being admonished and confirmed by that example of the light of grace, which solves that which is as great a miracle to the light of nature. Conclusion Section 167 I shall here draw this book to a conclusion, prepared, if it were necessary, to pursue this discussion still farther, though I consider that I have now abundantly satisfied the godly man who wishes to believe the truth without making resistance. For if we believe it to be true, that God foreknows and foreordains all things, that he can be neither deceived nor hindered in his prescience and predestination, and that nothing can take place but according to his will, which reason herself is compelled to confess, then, according to the testimony of reason herself, there can be no free will, in man, in angel, or in any creature. Hence, if we believe that Satan is the prince of this world, ever ensnaring and fighting against the kingdom of Christ, with all his powers, and that he does not let go his captives without being forced by the divine power of the Spirit, it is manifest that there can be no such thing as free will. Again, if we believe that original sin has so destroyed us, that even in the godly who are led by the Spirit, it causes the utmost molestation by striving against that which is good, it is manifest that there can be nothing left in a man devoid of the Spirit which can turn itself towards good, but which must turn itself towards evil. Again, if the Jews, who followed after righteousness with all their powers, ran rather into unrighteousness, while the Gentiles, who followed after unrighteousness, attained unto a free righteousness which they never hoped for, it is equally manifest from their very works and from experience that man without grace can do nothing but will evil. Finally, if we believe that Christ redeemed men by his blood, we are compelled to confess that the whole man was lost. Otherwise, we shall make Christ superfluous, or a redeemer of the grossest part of man only, which is blasphemy and sacrilege. Section 168 And now, my friend Erasmus, I entreat you, for Christ's sake, to perform what you promised. You promised that you would willingly yield to him who should teach you better than you knew. Lay aside all respect of persons. You, I confess, are great and adorned with many, and those the most noble gifts of God, to say nothing of the rest, with talent, with erudition, and with eloquence to a miracle. Whereas I have nothing and am nothing, excepting that I glory in being almost a Christian. In this, moreover, I give you great praise and proclaim it. You alone, in preeminent distinction from all others, have entered upon the thing itself, that is, the grand turning point of the cause, and have not wearied me with those irrelevant points about popery, purgatory, indulgences, and other like baubles, rather than causes with which all have hitherto tried to hunt me down, though in vain. You, and you alone, saw what was the grand hinge upon which the whole turned, and therefore you attacked the vital part at once for which from my heart I thank you. For in this kind of discussion I willingly engage, as far as time and leisure permit me. Had those who have heretofore attacked me done the same, and would those still do the same who are now boasting of new spirits and new revelations, we should have less sedition and sectarianism, and more peace and concord. But thus has God, by the instrumentality of Satan, avenged our ingratitude. But, however, if you cannot manage this cause otherwise than you have managed it in this diatribe, do, I pray you, remain content with your own proper gift. Study, adorn, and promote literature and languages, as you have hitherto done, to great advantage and with much credit, in which capacity you have rendered me also a certain service, so much so that I confess myself to be much indebted to you, and in that character I certainly venerate and honestly respect you. But as to this our cause, to this God has neither willed nor given it you to be equal, though I entreat you not to consider this as spoken in arrogance. 
No, I pray that the Lord may day by day make you as much superior to me in these matters as you are superior to me in all others. And it is no new thing for God to instruct a Moses by a Jethro, or to teach a Paul by an Ananias. And as to what you say, you have greatly missed the mark after all if you are ignorant of Christ. You yourself, if I mistake not, know what that is. But all will not therefore err, because you or I may err. God is glorified in his saints in a wonderful way, so that we may consider those saints who are the farthest from sanctity. Nor is it an unlikely thing that you, as being man, should not rightly understand, nor with sufficient diligence weigh the scriptures or the sayings of the fathers under which guides you imagine you cannot miss the mark. And that such is the case is quite manifest from this. You are saying that you do not assert, but collect. No man would write thus who was fully acquainted with and well understood his subject. On the contrary, I in this book of mine have collected things, but have asserted, and still do assert. And I wish none to become judges, but all to yield assent. And may the Lord, whose cause this is, illuminate you, and make you a vessel to honor and to glory. Amen. Finis. 1525. End of section 168. Appendices to the Bondage of the Will by Martin Luther. Translated by Henry Cole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Martin Luther's Judgment of Erasmus of Rotterdam to a Certain Friend Grace and Peace in Christ I received your last letter gladly, my excellent friend, because I believe you wish well to, and are concerned for, the state of the Christian cause. And I wish and pray that the Lord would perfect that which he hath begun in you. I am grievous at hearing that among you also this cruel persecution is carried on against Christ. But it will come to this, either that cruel tyrant will change his fury of his own accord, or you will change it for him, and that shortly. Concerning predestination, I knew long ago that Mosellanus agrees with Erasmus, for he is an Erasmian altogether. My fixed opinion is, however, that Erasmus knows less about predestination or rather pretends to know, than even the schools of the sophists have known. Nor have I any need to fear a fall, while I maintain my sentiments unchanged. Erasmus is not to be dreaded on this point, nor indeed on any essential point of Christianity. Truth is more powerful than eloquence. The spirit is far above human talent. Faith is beyond all erudition, and, as Paul saith, the foolishness of God is wiser than men. 1 Corinthians 1.25 The eloquence of Cicero was often overthrown by inferior eloquence in the discussion of public causes. Julian was more eloquent than Augustine. In a word, the victory is in the hands of lying eloquence. As it is written, Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. Psalm 8.2 Matthew 21.16 I will not provoke Erasmus, nor will I even when provoked once or twice return the blow. And yet I do not think he shows his wisdom in directing the powers of his eloquence against me. For I fear he will not find in Luther a favor of Picardy, nor be able to exult over me as he does over him, where he says, All congratulate me upon my victory over the Gaul. But, however, if he will enter the lists with me, he shall find that Christ fears neither the powers of the air nor the gates of hell. And I, a most weak-tongued babe, will meet the all-eloquent Erasmus with confidence, caring nothing for his authority, his name, or his reputation. I know well what is in the man, seeing that I am well acquainted with the thoughts of Satan, though I expect he will daily manifest more and more that disposition towards me which he fosters in his heart. I express myself thus plainly, that you might have no fear or concern on my account, nor be frightened at the great and swelling words of others. I wish you to salute Mosellanus in my name, for
for I am not therefore ill affected towards him, because he leans to the side of Erasmus rather than to mine. Nay, tell him to stand by Erasmus firmly, for the time will come when he will think otherwise. In the meantime, the weakness of an excellent heart is to be borne with. And may you also prosper in the Lord. Wirtenburg, 1522 Martin Luther to Nicholas Amstorf Concerning Erasmus of Rotterdam Grace and Peace in Christ I thank you, my excellent friend, that you give me so candidly your opinion on my book. I care not at all that the papists are offended. I did not write on their account, for they are not worth my writing or speaking in consideration of them any more. God has given them up to a reprobate mind, so that they even fight against that which they know to be the truth. My cause was heard at Augsburg before the Emperor Charles and the whole world, and found to be irreprehensible, and to contain sound doctrine. Moreover, my confession and apology are made public, and set in the open light throughout the world. By these I have answered an infinity of my adversaries' books, and all the lies of the papists, past, present, and to come. I have confessed Christ before this wicked and adulterous generation, and I doubt not but that he will also confess me before his Father and the holy angels. My light is set on a candlestick. Let him that seeth it see it more clearly still. Let him that is blind be blinder still. Let him that is just be juster still. Let him that is filthy be filthier still. Their blood be upon themselves. I am clean from their blood. I have declared to the unrighteous his unrighteousness, and he will not be converted. Let him therefore die in his sins. I have saved my own soul. There is no need, therefore, that I should write or care to write on their account any farther. And as to your advice that that grammarian or vocabularian whom you call the Erasmian plagiary should be held in contempt, and that Erasmus himself should rather be answered, know that I have held him in sufficient contempt already for I have not read one page of his writings. Jonas answered him once, although I was much against his doing it, and advised him, according to your opinion, to hold him in contempt. For I know the man well, from his skin to his heart, that he is not worthy of being spoken to or dealt with by any good man. Such a hypocrite is he, and so full of reprobate envy and malevolence. Moreover, you know my usual way of overthrowing writers of this stamp, by holding them in silent contempt. For how many books of Echius, Faber, Emser, Cocles, and many others, who seem to be as mountains in labor, and about to bring forth I know not what wonders, have I myself by my silence only so utterly brought to nothing that no memory of them is left. Cato calls such pettifoggers, and allows all their pratings to pass by unnoticed. Whereas, if he had at all considered them worthy of being noticed and answered, they might have procured to themselves a lasting fame. And there is a trite but true proverb. Full well I know, that if with dung embroiled, conqueror or conquered, still I am besoiled. But here is my glory. Whatever could be brought against me from the Scriptures and from the Fathers has been produced and published. And now all the glory they have left is in slanders, lies, and calumnies. And why should I envy them that, when they have no power or desire whatever to be renowned for any other virtues? Your judgment of Erasmus I much admire, wherein you say plainly that he has no other basis wherein to build his doctrine but the favor of men, and attribute to him, moreover, ignorance and malice. And if you could but convey this judgment of yours with conviction to the minds of men in general, you would, in truth, like another stripling David, by this one blow lay our boasting Goliath prostrate, and at the same time eradicate the world of his sect. For what is more vain, more fallacious in all things, than the applause of men, especially in things spiritual? For, as the Psalms testify, there is no help in them. Again, all men are liars. If, therefore, Erasmus be nothing but vanity, and rest alone on vanity and a lie, 
what need is there to reply to him at all? He himself, together with all his vanity, will at length vanish like smoke, if we but treat him as I have treated those former scarecrows and pettifoggers, whom, by my silence only, I have committed to utter oblivion. I at one time attributed to him a singular kind of inconsistency and vain talking, for he seemed to treat on sacred and serious things with the greatest unconcern, and, on the contrary, to pursue baubles, vanities, and things laughable and ridiculous with the utmost avidity. Though an old man and a theologian, and at that in an age the most industrious and laborious. So that I really thought that what I had heard many men of wisdom and gravity say was true, that Erasmus was actually mad. When I first wrote against his diatribe, and was compelled to weigh his words, as John says, try the spirits, being disgusted at his inconsiderateness in a subject of so much importance. In order that I might rouse up the cold and doltish disputer, I goaded him as if in a snoring sleep, calling him a disciple at one time of Epicurus, at another of Lucian, and then again declaring him to be of the opinion of the skeptics, supposing that by these means he might perhaps be roused up to enter upon the subject with more feeling. But all was in vain. I only irritated the viper, so as to cause him at last to give birth to his viper espis, an offspring worthy of, and exactly like, its parent. But, however, he proudly omitted to say one single word to the subject point, so that from that time I have despaired of his theology altogether. Now, however, I am quite of your opinion that it was not inconsiderateness in him, but, as you say, real ignorance and malice. For he was unacquainted with our doctrines, or the doctrines of Christianity. He knew them, but from policy would not know them. And though he may not understand, nor indeed can understand, those doctrines which are peculiar to our fraternity, and which we maintain against the synagogue of the Pope, yet he cannot be ignorant of those which are held in common by us and the Church under the Pope, because he writes on these very largely, or rather laughs at them, such as the trinity of the divine persons, the divinity and humanity of Christ, sin, the redemption of the human race, the resurrection of the dead, eternal life, and the like. He knows, I say, that these things are taught and believed even by many ungodly and false Christians. But the truth is, he hates all the doctrines together. Nay, there can be no doubt in the mind of a true believer, who has the Spirit in his nostrils, that his mind is alienated from and utterly hates all religion together, and especially the religion of Christ. Many proofs of this are scattered here and there, and it will come to pass by and by that alike the mole he will throw up some dirt that will show where and what he is and prove his own destruction. He published lately, among his other works, his Catechism, a production evidently of satanic subtlety, for with a purpose full of craft he designs to take children and youths at the outset and to infect them with his poisons, that they might not afterwards be eradicated from them, just as he himself in Italy and at Rome so sucked in his doctrine of sorcerers and of devils that now all remedy is too late. But who would bear with this method of bringing up children or the weak in faith which Erasmus proposes to us? The tender and unexperienced mind is to be formed at first by certain, plain, and necessary principles which it may firmly believe, because it is necessary that every one who would learn should believe. For what will he ever learn who either doubts himself or is taught to doubt? But this new catechist of ours aims only at rendering his catechumens and the doctrines of faith suspicious. For at the very outset, laying aside all solid foundation, he does nothing but set before them those heresies and offenses of opinions, by which the Church has been troubled from the beginning, so that, in fact, he would make it appear that there has been nothing certain in the Christian religion. And if an unexperienced mind be from the beginning poisoned by principles and questions of this kind, what else can it be expected to think of or do, but either to withdraw itself secretly from, or, if it dare, to hold the Christian religion in utter detestation, as a pest to mankind? He imagines, however, all the while, 
that no one will discover the craft of his design, as though we had not in the scriptures numberless examples of these bugbears of the devil. It was thus the serpent dealt with Eve. He first entangled her in doubts, and brought her to suspect the reality of the precept of God concerning the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And when he had brought her to a standstill of doubt, overthrew and destroyed her. Unless Erasmus considers this to be a mere fable also. It is with the same serpent-like attack that he creeps upon and deceives simple souls, saying, How is it that there have been so many sects and errors in this one true religion? As it is believed to be. How is it that there have been so many creeds? Why in the Apostles' Creed is the Father called God, the Son not God but Lord, and the Spirit neither God nor Lord, but Holy, and so on? Who, I would ask, troubles unexperienced souls, whom he undertakes to instruct with questions like these, but the devil himself? Who would dare to speak thus upon a creed of faith, but the very mouth and instrument of the devil? Here you have the plot, the execution, and the catastrophic end of a soul-murdering tragedy. But behold, I am here almost carried into a refutation of his catechism, whereas I merely intended to show you why I thought it better not to answer this viber at all, because he will most effectually refute himself in the minds of all godly and good men. The like game also he played on the Apostle Paul, in his preface to the Romans to say nothing about his paraphrases, or his mad vagaries, paraphrases, to use his own term, where he speaks of the praises of Paul in that way that no simple reader whatever who is unacquainted with rhetoric could be more effectually drawn away and beaten off from reading and studying Paul, so confused, intricate, self-contradictory, diverse, and disgusting does he represent him to be, so that the reader must of necessity believe the epistle to be the production of some madman. So far is it from possibility that he should consider it to be profitable. And among the rest of his razor-sharp cuts, he could not receive without venting his spleen even this, that Peter should call Christ man and say nothing of his Godhead. A notable annotation truly, and most appropriately applicable to the passage. And then, as to his method, with all its twistings and windings, what is it but a holding up of Christ and everything done by him to derision? Who could gather anything from this method but a disgust at, nay, a hatred of, attending to a religion so confused and perplexed, and perhaps, after all, merely fabulous? Who, moreover, ever spoke in so much disdain and contempt, not to say enmity, of the apostle and evangelist John? who among Christians is held to be of the highest authority after Christ. He merely scolds little children, except it be when he considers a man to be adult or a loggerhead. Christians ever speak of the apostles with reverence and fear, whereas this fellow would teach us to speak of them with profane pride and contempt. And this is the first step towards speaking profanely of God himself, whose the apostles are. Nay, it is the same as saying in contempt of the Holy Spirit, whose the words of the apostles are, that he merely scolds little children. Numberless things of this kind are to be found in Erasmus, or rather, this is his whole character in theology. And this many others have observed before me, and still do observe daily more and more. Nor does he cease to go on and to publish daily his annotations more and more grossly, for his judgment now for a long time lingereth not, and his damnation slumbereth not. This is also a notable instance of the piety of Erasmus. In his letter upon Christian philosophy, which is published with his New Testament and used in common throughout all the churches, when he had propounded the question, Why Christ, so great a teacher, descended from heaven? when there are many things taught, even among the heathens, which are precisely the same, if not more perfect. He answers, Christ came, which I doubt not but he believed most Erasmianly, from heaven, that he might exemplify those things more perfectly and more fully than any of the saints before him. Thus this miserable renewer of all things, Christ, for so he reproaches the Lord of glory, has lost the glory of a Redeemer, 
and becomes only one more holy than others. This sentiment could not be expressed in ignorance, but must have been designed and willful, because even those who do not truly believe know and everywhere confess that Christ descended from heaven to redeem us men from sin and death. This was the sentiment that first alienated my mind from Erasmus. From that moment I began to suspect him of being a plain Democritus, or Epicurus, and a crafty derider of Christ, for he everywhere intimates to his fellow Epicureans his hatred against Christ, though he does it in words so figurative and insidious that he leaves himself a clue for raging most furiously against those Christians, who, from being offended at his suspicious and double-meaning words, will not interpret them as standing in favor of their Christ, as though Erasmus himself had an all-free prerogative throughout the world of speaking on divine things with obliquity and craft, and had all men so under his thumb that they must interpret all his obliquities and crafty maneuvers as having an upright and honest intent. Why does he not rather speak openly and plainly? Why does he always deal in these crafty and ensnaring figures of speech? So great a rhetorician and theologian ought not only to know, but to act according to that which Fabius says, an ambiguous word should be avoided as a rock. Where it happens now and then inadvertently, it may be pardoned, but where it is sought for designedly and purposely, it deserves no pardon whatever, but justly merits the abhorrence of every one. For to what does this hateful double-tongued way of speaking tend? It only furnishes an opportunity of disseminating and fostering in safety the seeds of every heresy under the cover of words and letters that have a show of Christian faith. And thus, while religion is believed to be taught and defended, it is in reality utterly destroyed, and subverted from its foundation before it is understood. Wherefore all are perfectly in the right who interpret his suspicious and insidious words against himself, nor is any notice to be taken of him when he cries out, Calumny, calumny, because his words are not fairly and candidly interpreted. Why does he himself ever avoid fair words? and designedly express himself in those which are unfair. For it is an unheard of kind of tyranny to wish to have the whole human race so under his thumb that they should be compelled to understand fairly what he says insidiously and dangerously, and thus cede to him the prerogative of expressing himself insidiously. No, let him rather be reduced to order and commanded to bow to the whole human race, that is, by abstaining from that profane and double-tongued vertibility of speech and vain talking, and by avoiding, as Paul saith, profane and vain babblings. For this it was, that even the public laws of the Roman Empire condemned this manner of speaking, and punished it thus. They commanded that the words of him who should speak obscurely, when he could speak more plainly, should be interpreted against himself. And Christ also condemned that wicked servant who excused himself by an evasion, and, interpreting his own words against himself, said, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. For if in religion, in laws, and in all weighty matters we should be allowed to express ourselves ambiguously and insidiously, what could follow but that utter confusion of Babel, where no one could understand another? This would be to learn the language of eloquence, and in so doing, to lose the language of nature. Moreover, if this license should prevail, I might conveniently interpret all that the whole herd of heretics ever said, nay, all that the devil himself ever did or said, or could say or do, to all eternity. Where, then, would be the power of refuting the heretics and the devil? Where would be that wisdom of the Lord Christ, which all the adversaries shall not be able to resist? What would become of logic, the instructor of teaching rightly? What would become of rhetoric, the faculty of persuading? Nothing would be taught, nothing would be learned, no persuasion could be carried home, no consolation could be given, no fear would be wrought, because nothing would be spoken or heard that was certain. When, therefore, Erasmus lightly and ridiculously says of John the Evangelist that he merely scolds babes, he is to be adjudged immediately a disciple of Epicurus or Democritus, and to be addressed thus, Learn to speak of majesty with more reverence. 
Some noted jesters have indeed sometimes spoken of princes thus irreverently and fool-like, but not always with impunity. But if any one else of a sound mind and judgment had done the same, he might perhaps have lost his head for the crime of insulted majesty. Thus, when Erasmus says, Peter addressed Christ as man, and says nothing of his divinity, he is to be condemned of Arianism and heresy, because he could have omitted this insidious observation altogether in a matter where the divine majesty is eminently concerned, or have spoken more reverently. For the words plainly imply that the Arians do not like that Christ should be called God, but consider it better that he should be called man only. And how conveniently soever they may be interpreted in favor of the divinity of Christ, yet as they stand and are read according to their plain meaning, especially since their author is suspicious, they offend Christian minds, because they have not one plain meaning, and may be more easily understood to favor the Arians than the Orthodox. Hence Jerome, writing of the Arians of his time who taught in the same artful way, says, Their priests say one thing, and their people understand another. In like manner there was no necessity for observing to Christians on that passage that Peter did not call Christ God, though in truth he did not omit to call Christ God. Nor is it enough to pretend that he called him man only on account of the common multitude. For though he did call him man, yet he did not therefore omit to call him God, except that he did not pronounce these three letters, God. But this Erasmus rigidly deems was necessary. By so doing, however, he does nothing here, as well as every other place, but lays snares, without any cause whatever, to entrap the inexperienced, and to render our religion suspicious. That Carpician, whoever he was, justly condemns him as a favorer of the Arians in his preface to Hilary, where he has said, We dare to call the Holy Spirit God, which the ancients did not dare to do. And when, having been faithfully admonished, he ought to have acknowledged his high-flown figures of speech and his Arianisms, and to have corrected them, he not only did not do that, but even inveighed against the admonition as a calumny proceeding from Satan, and laughed at the divinity twofold more than ever. Such a confidence has he in his pliability of speech and his circumlocutive evasions. Nevertheless, he very seriously confesses the Trinity, and would not by any means whatever be thought to deny the Trinity of the Godhead, but only wishes to say that the curiosity, which he afterwards requests will be conveniently interpreted diligence, of the moderns, has received and dared many things from the scriptures which the ancients dared not, as though the Christian religion rested on the authority of men, for this is what he would persuade us to. And what is this but considering all religion together to be a mere fable? Here, although the Carpician may be many things of no weight whatever, and ever an enemy to Luther, yet Erasmus, from an unheard of pride, thinks all men together to be mere stocks and stones, who neither understand any subject nor see through the meaning of any words. Read that observation of his, and say, if you do not discover the incarnate devil. This observation fixes in me a determination, let others do as they please, not to believe Erasmus, even if he should openly confess in plain words that Christ is God. But I would address to him that sophistical saying of Chrysippus, If you lie, you lie even when you speak the truth. For what need was there, if he in verity believed that the Holy Spirit is God, to say, We dare to call the Holy Spirit God, which the ancients did not dare to do? What need was there to use this vertible word, dare, that it might apply both to the praise and dispraise of these same moderns, when we received this doctrine from the ancients, and did not dare to receive it first? But, however, it is a stark lie to say that the ancients did not first dare to call the Holy Spirit God, unless by ancients, according to one of his very beautiful figures of speech, he means Democritus and Epicurus, or unless he means God materially, that is, these three letters, God. But to what purpose is all this hateful maneuvering, but to make of a gnat an elephant, as a stumbling block to the unexperienced, and to intimate that the Christian religion is a nothing at all, and that, 
for no other reason than because these three letters, God, are not written in every place where he considers they ought to have been written. In the same manner his fathers, the Arians, made numberless quibbles because these letters homoousios, and in Nascobelis were not found in the sacred writings, considering it nothing to the purpose that the same thing could be solidly proved in substance. And where the name God was written, they were ready with their gloss to elude the truth, by contending that it did not mean God in reality, but God by appellation. So that you can do nothing with these vipers, whether you speak to them by the Scriptures or without the Scriptures. This is the way of the malice of Satan. When he cannot deny the fact, he turns to demanding certain particular terms, which he himself prescribes. And thus the devil himself may say, even to Christ, Although thou speakest the truth, yet since thou dost not speak it in the terms which I think requisite, thou sayest nothing at all. And I wish the truth to be spoken in no words whatever. This is like Marcolphus, who wished to be hung upon a tree chosen by himself and yet wished to choose no tree at all. But of this elsewhere, if the Lord shall give me leisure and length of life, for it is my determination to leave behind me my true and faithful testimony concerning Erasmus, and thus to expose Luther to be bitten and stung by these vipers, but not to be utterly torn in pieces and destroyed. And I'll return to my observations upon my liberty which I have asserted, giving it as my sentiments that the tyranny of Erasmus which he would exercise by means of circumlocutive evasions, is not to be borne, but that he is to be judged openly out of his own mouth. Where he speaks as an Arian, let him be judged as an Arian. Where he speaks as a Lucian, let him be judged a Lucian. Where he speaks as a Gentile, let him be judged a Gentile, unless he repent and cease to defend such ways of expressing himself. For instance, in one of his epistles on the incarnation of the Son of God, he uses a most abominable term, calling it the intercourse of God with the Virgin. Here he is to be judged a horrible blasphemer of God and the Virgin, nor does it make him at all better his afterwards expounding intercourse as applying to the form of the Christian doctrine. Why did he not speak of the form of the Christian doctrine? For he well knew that by this word intercourse Christians could not but be greatly offended. And let him be judged ungodly who would not be offended at a term so abominably obscene in a matter so sacred, knowing that an ambiguous expression of such a nature is always taken in its worst sense, even though we be not ignorant that the term may have another meaning. If it take place from inadvertency, it may be pardoned. If from design and willfulness it is to be condemned, as I said, without mercy. For to hold the doctrine of faith is arduous, and a divine work, even when delivered in proper, evident, and certain words. How then shall it be held if it be delivered in ambiguous, doubtful, and oblique words? St. Augustine says, Philosophers ought to speak freely on difficult points, fearing no offense. But we, says he, must speak to a certain rule. And therefore he blames the use of the term fortune, or fate, both in himself and others. For even though the person may by fortune mean the divine mind, the agent of all things, from which nature is known to be distinctly different, and thus may not think impiously, yet, says he, let him hold his sentiment, but correct his expression. And even to suppose that Augustine did not say this, and never had any certain rule according to which he expressed himself, yet nature will tell us that every profession, sacred as well as profane, uses certain terms of its own, and avoids all ambiguities. For even common tradesmen either reprove or condemn or hold up to ridicule the man who speaks of his own trade in the technical terms, as they are called, peculiar to the trade of another. With how much greater force will this apply to things sacred, where certain salvation or eternal perdition is the consequence, and where all must be taught in certain and proper terms? Let us, if we must do it, trifle with ambiguities in other things that are of no moment, as nuts, apples, pence, 
and other things which are the toys of children and of fools. But in religion and weighty matters of state, let us shun with all possible care and ambiguity as we would shun death or the devil. Our king of ambiguity, however, sits upon his ambiguous throne in security, and destroys us stupid Christians with a double destruction. First, it is his will, and it is a great pleasure to him, to offend us by his ambiguous words. And indeed he would not like it if we stupid blocks were not offended. And next, when he sees that we are offended, and have run against his insidious figures of speech, and begin to exclaim against him, he then begins to triumph and rejoice that the desired prey has been caught in his snares. For now, having found an opportunity of displaying his rhetoric, he rushes upon us with all his powers and all his noise, tearing us, flogging us, crucifying us, and sending us farther than hell itself, saying that we have understood his words calumniously, virulently, satanically, using the worst terms he can find, whereas he never meant them to be so understood. In the exercise of this wonderful tyranny, and who would think that this madam ambiguity could make so much ado, or who could suppose that any one would be so great a madman as to have so much confidence in a vain figure of speech? He not only compels us to put up with his all-free prerogative of using ambiguities, but binds us down to the necessity of keeping silence. He plainly designs all the while and wishes us to be offended, that he and his herd of Epicureans with him may have a laugh at us as fools. But, on the other hand, he does not like to hear that we are offended, lest it should appear that we are true Christians. Thus must we suffer wounds without number, and yet not utter a groan or a sigh. We Christians, however, who are to judge not meats and drinks only, but angels in the whole world, and who actually judge, even now, not only do not bear with this tyranny of ambiguities, but, on the contrary, oppose to it our liberty of pronouncing a twofold condemnation. The first is, as I have already observed, we condemn all the ambiguous expressions of Erasmus, and interpret them against himself, as Christ saith, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Again, by thine own words shalt thou be condemned, for wherefore hast thou spoken against thine own soul? Thy blood be upon thine own head. The second condemnation is, we condemn and curse again and again his glosses and convenient interpretations, by which he not only does not correct his ungodly expressions, but even defends them. That is, he laughs at us twice as much in his after-interpretations as he does in his first expressions. For example, he says that by the intercourse of God with the Virgin, he does not mean a common intercourse, but another kind of marriage between God and the Virgin, where the angel Gabriel is the bridegroom, and the Holy Spirit performs the act of consummation. Only observe what this fellow, by his interpretation, would have us to hear and understand Christ to be. And he says these things, that he might defend the filthiness and obscenity of his expression in the face of offended Christians, and laugh at them all the while. And thus he forces upon us this offensive term, when he knows very well that this mystery of the most holy incarnation cannot be explained to the mind of man by all the obscene and ambiguous words of the whole world. But how it is understood by the Epicureans I dare not for horror imagine. Why do we not call the conversation of God with Moses and the other prophets intercourse also, and make the angels bridegrooms, and the Holy Spirit the consummator of the act, or make of it something still more obscene? Moreover, here is the impious idea of sex introduced, to perfect this monstrous derision of saying that God had intercourse with the Virgin, in order that the whole might be made a fable, like that wherein Mars is said to have had intercourse with Rhea, and Jupiter with Semele, and that Christianity might be reduced to a level with one of the fabulous stories of old, and men represented as fools and pitiable madmen for believing such a story to be serious and true, not considering what turpitudes and obscenities were the objects of their faith and worship. And therefore Christians, that stupid set of creatures, were to be admonished by means of figures like these to begin to doubt, 
and then from doubting to depart from the faith, that thus religion might be utterly destroyed before any one could be aware of it. This is the verification of that parable, Matthew 13, where the enemy is represented as sowing tares in the night and going his way. Thus we Christians are sleeping in security, and even if we were not sleeping, those bewitching sirens, by their honey of speech, would soon lull us to sleep, and bring a cloud of night over our eyes. In the meantime are sown those tares of figurative and insidious words, and yet when sacramentarians, donatists, arians, anabaptists, epicureans, and so forth are sprung up, we ask, how is it that our Lord's field hath tares? They, however, who have sown them are gone away. That is, they so paint and set themselves off by their convenient interpretations, and withdraw themselves from sight, that they seem as if they had sown nothing but wheat. Thus the enemy slides away, and is off in safety, and crowned with honor and applause, and appears to be a friend, when he is in truth the greatest of enemies. This is the way with the strange woman, Proverbs 30, who, when she has eaten, wipeth her mouth, and saith, I have done no wickedness. Thus have I replied to your letter, my friend Armsdorf, though perhaps I have been too long and tedious. But I wished to show you why I judged it best not to answer Erasmus any farther. I am, moreover, abundantly engaged in teaching, confirming, correcting, and governing my flock. And my work of translating the Bible alone requires the devotion of my whole time from which work Satan with all his might endeavors to withdraw me, as he has done upon former occasions, that he might get me to leave the best things to follow after those which are nothing but vain and empty vapors. For my bondage of the will proves to you how difficult a task it is to cope with that Proteus Erasmus, on account of his vertibility and slipperiness of speech, in which alone is all his confidence. He never remains in one position, but with the deepest craft evades every blow and is like an irritated hornet. Whereas miserable I am compelled to stand my ground in one position, and that upon unequal ground, as a sign to be spoken against. For whatever Luther writes is condemned before ten years are at an end. Luther is the only one who writes from envy, from pride, from bitterness, and, in a word, at the instigation of Satan himself, but all who write against him write under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Before my time it required a great to-do, and an enormous expense to canonize a dead monk, but now there is no easier way for canonizing even living Nero's and Caligula's than the declaration of hatred against Luther. Only let a man hate and bravely curse Luther, and that immediately makes him a saint, almost equal to our holy Lord, the servant of the servants of God. But who could ever believe that hatred against Luther would be attended with so much power and advantage? It fills the coffers of very beggars, nay, it introduces obscure moles and bats to the favor of princes and of kings. It procures prebendaries and dignities. It procures bishoprics. It procures the reputation of wisdom and of learning to the most consummate asses. It procures to petty teachers of grammar the authority of writing books. Nay, it procures the crown of victory and of glory, eternal in the heavens. Nay, happy are all who hate Luther, for they obtain by that one vile and easy service those great and mighty things which none of the most excellent of men could ever obtain with all their wisdom and their virtues. No, not even Christ himself, with all his own miracles, and the miracles of his apostles and all his saints. Thus are the scriptures fulfilled. Blessed are ye who persecute Luther, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye who curse and say all manner of evil against Luther. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad in that day, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the apostles, the holy bishops, John Huss, and others who were before Luther. Wherefore I feel more and more persuaded that I shall act rightly by answering Erasmus no farther. But I will leave my testimony concerning him, even for his own sake, that he might hereafter be unburdened from that concern which, as he complains, 
is completely death to him, namely, that he is commonly called a Lutheran. But as Christ liveth, they do him a great injury who call him a Lutheran, and I will defend him against his enemies, for I can bear a true and faithful testimony that he is no Lutheran, but Erasmus himself. And if I could have my will, Erasmus should be exploded from our schools altogether. For if he be not pernicious, he is certainly useless, because he in truth discusses and teaches nothing. Nor is it at all advisable to accustom Christian youth to the diction of Erasmus, for they will learn to speak and think of nothing with gravity and seriousness, but only to laugh at all men as babblers and vain talkers. In a word, they will learn nothing but to play the fool, and from this levity and vanity they will by degrees grow tired of religion, till at last they will abhor and profane it. Let him be left to the papists only, who are worthy of such an apostle, and whose lips relish his dainties. May our Lord Jesus Christ, whom, according to my faith, Peter did not omit to call God, by whose power I know and am persuaded that I have often been delivered from death, and by faith in whom I have undertaken and hitherto accomplished all these things which excite the wonder even of my enemies. May this same Jesus guard and deliver us unto the end, for he is the Lord our God, to whom alone, with the Father and the Holy Spirit, be glory for ever and ever. Amen. End of the Appendices Recording